Professor, when's the lecture starting? Oh, oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> we we hid our presence from you. We disguised our, our malicious intent. We used our stands. Hey, H. Oh fuck, I'm sorry. <laughs> the mayor, Jackson. God damn it, every goddamn time. Alright, so. Wait, no cussing. This is a kid show. That, that's funny. That's fucking hilarious, <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> Okay, so, as you can see, I brought you all here to discuss uh, JoJo, as there's some people who attend our fine university who have no idea what JoJo is, or like, the or anything. Hey, wait, wait, Mark, do you JoJo? I'm not caught up, but I'm watching part four right now. Okay, you're good. <laughs> you know about JoJo? Um, it's an anime, and they have classic rock songs in it. That's it. Just yeah, rappers. Okay. Hey, Roland, Roland, what, I mean, not Roland, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know about JoJo? We What's talked your... about it in my gender and sexuality class. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so much about, sense which, uh, It represents ideal male bodies, which you don't see a lot in animation anymore. This is I true. guess, but then they all turn into like twinks. This is true. <laughs> no, wait. I think I think twinks are ideal male bodies. What are you talking about? <laughs> you're, you know, you're right. Ideal male bodies. Hell yeah. Obviously. Am I right? Can I get yeah. an amen? Yeah. All right. All right. So I got my notes. All right. So uh, basically, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's an action adventure, supernatural shonen battle manga published Fun. on. I mean, it was published in Weekly Shonen Jump for a bit. Uh, it started publication, actually, on January 1st of 1987. So a few days ago, JoJo, the series, turned 35 years old. Woo! Ooh, to the end. What a time to record this lecture. It's one year older than Red Dwarf. Almost, it's one year older than Red Dwarf and better. So. Yes. <laughs> And uh, the series throughout these past 35 years has been written and illustrated by one man who goes by the name of Hirohiko Araki. Araki's pretty based. Wait, it's been written and illustrated by one person? Yeah. Yes, for 35 years. For 35 years. Like Hunter Hunter! We all know how that went. <laughs> and like, despite being as popular as it is, it wasn't really until recently, like 2012, when the anime started airing, that the series finally like properly blew up in the U.S. Because for like before that, we were just getting like bits and pieces, like scraps. Like the most official shit we got was like the fighting game Capcom yeah. made in the 90s, and then oh, like yeah. no one really understood what the fuck was going on because it was like the third part. <laughs> And then we also, oh, Roland? And then the part three OVA. Yeah, I was about to get to that. Mm, the, part the part three, three OVA. OVA. Mm. That, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so I'm mentioning parts a lot. Let me get into that. So uh, the big, the main thing about the series, the main thing the series is known for is how like it's split into parts. So like each major like story arc is referred to as like parts, like by the creator and by the fandom, you know. Oh. And each part is like a different generation, right? This yes, is a multi-year yes, epic. Yeah, the story of JoJo, it's like a multi-generational epic. And each part focuses on a specific member of the Joestar family. And it ranges all the way from like the early, I mean like, not early, like eight, late 1800s all the way to like 2011. And then like shit happens in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> Does it take place in like the real world with our basic yeah, right. continuity? Yeah, it takes place in like the real oh, okay. world. Like a lot of the supernatural elements you see are like kept secrets, I guess. It's like a rule of thumb. People don't really like talk about it or just keep it on the hush hush. Got it. Uh, and yeah, and then also, uh, who is JoJo? Since there's multiple characters, well, they're all JoJo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is because uh, the name JoJo comes from the first name and last name of the characters, starting with Joe. So they often shorten it, and you get JoJo. So you got, like, Joseph, Joestar. You have Jotaro, Kujo. You have, like, uh, 
Jonathan, Joe Star, jo- you know, Joe Giorno Giovanna. Yeah, they, they really push that at one point. You get Giorno Giovanna. Yeah. G- <laughs> Gio Gio. And the game for that was called Gio Gio. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was sure. Gio yeah. Gio. On the PS2. Weird, weird yeah. time. And uh, as you can see from. As you can see from. <laughs> is, this on, is this on camera? This is on camera, yes. <laughs> okay, but yeah, as you can see, there are currently so, the way, eight so. parts. Uh, that are recently finished. Uh, part eight, Jojolian, recently wrapped up like a few months ago. Or yeah, yeah, like, like four months. Like, yeah, a few months ago. No one really understood what the fuck happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. What I don't even know. What I, I thought I thought that was why. I, that's why I came here was to learn what happens. <laughs> I mean, guardrail. guardrail <laughs> I know that, but yeah, I don't, I don't even know. I haven't <laughs> fucking read. You're it. about to learn today. <laughs> So yeah, eight parts currently finished, and a part nine on the way, supposedly. Tentatively called Jojo Land. Jojo Land. Jojo Land. So. Eight part. As long as why, the, the, why the fucking doesn't break his hand beforehand. <laughs> fucking so fuck That's why he's taking a break. Good on a Rocky, am I right? <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's start. <laughs> so let's start really from the really beginning. Good old man noise. Oops. So let's start from the beginning with uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part One. Phantom. Phantom Blood. Blood. So sometime, so so the story it doesn't start like the anime does this weird thing where it like skips the entire first chapter for some fucking reason. So really, the story starts like in like in between Wait, the really? twelfth. Yeah. Oh. The story really starts in between like the twelfth and sixteenth centuries, and it's like. Take, it's like in Mexico, just like this Aztec chieftain going around. They're like doing this human sacrifice ritual. Nice. So he like takes this girl, kills her with a knife. Then he Ooh. takes her blood and puts on like this weird stone mask. Right. Oh, as someone who's watched the anime but hasn't read the manga, that that's in the manga. This is like yes. the first. But they don't. The first, the first couple of the manga. But yeah. they don't show that in the anime. No, they don't. Doesn't they show that in season two? No. It, I mean, they like refer. They find. They bring it up in part that two. That makes but it, so like, much more happens. sense. What the fuck? I never. Go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, this He's guy, close. this Aztec chieftain, he kills this girl, takes her blood, then he pulls out this weird, wacky little stone mask, right? <laughs> <laughs> this funny stone mask. He puts it on his face. He takes the girl's blood. It smears it. And then this causes the mask to like violently react as it like shoots spikes out of it and into his skull. <laughs> and then what happens? Fucking <laughs> metal. So uh, he like spasms. He like he like geeks out for a bit. <laughs> he geeks out for a bit. And then he takes he takes the mask off. Surprisingly, he isn't dead, but he claims to now possess eternal life and the power to match it. And he demonstrates Ooh. this by like sticking his fingers into like some dude's throat and he starts like draining the blood from that guy as a flex. That's Weird so flex, but okay. <laughs> oh my god. He does an evil little laugh and it cuts to black and like we get some captions talking about how this tribe tried to use the power of this mask to take over the world, but they they uh disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Ooh. Ooh. Spooky. Okay, so That's now the actual we'll use story. Later. It's okay, Toast. <laughs> That's a special mouse tool we'll use for later. <laughs> so yeah, we now cut to Liverpool, England. It's like the 1870s, and we see a young beggar couple. They're like walking through the rain and shit, and they come across the wreckage of like this horse carriage, and it's like fucked up. There's like bodies everywhere. The horses are fucked. The carriage. <laughs> the carriage. Oh, the no, the no, horses are damn. The horses have been obliterated. There are no more horses. There's just glue there. (laughs) (laughs) There's just glue in place of the horses. And a young beggar couple comes across this. And being like poor and dirty, the guy... Uh, the guy, his name, by the way, is Dario Brando. Ooh. This man, he sees, like, this corpse of, like, this rich family, and he's like, oh, shit, it's free real estate. <laughs> so he jumps down, he, he, he leaves his wife at the top of this cliff, climbs down, and starts, like, looting the body so he can sell all the jewelry and make a quick buck, right? Smart. So he's, he's doing this, Dicky and he goes. gets to, like, the man, the dead man, and as he's, like, trying to wiggle off the dude's, like, wedding ring, the dude wakes up, and he looks around, and like him being like a dumbass. Uh, this man, by the way, his name is George Joestar. Ooh. 
George with a G O, like G O R G. Huh? You good? Oh yeah, sorry, I was a friend. This man, George Joestar, notices, he wakes up, looks around, notices the wreckage, and he sees like Dario like caressing his hand. So he comes to the conclusion that Dario is actually saving him from this terrible accident. And he already realizes that his wife is dead, but miraculously, his son, his infant son, has survived the crash. So, uh, because of uh, Dario's good deed, George promises that, like, uh, when the time comes, feel free to send your own next of kin, and I'll personally take care of them in your state when, when the time comes. So Dario's like, okay, this is, this works. I see this as a win. So he goes, he disappears for a bit, and then we jump forward about 10 or so years, Liverpool, England again, but it's 1880, and now we see like this young kid, he's running around, playing in his front yard, waiting for his new adopted brother to show up. Who is that, Ed? Oh yeah, this young boy is named Jonathan Joestar. <laughs> And he's like, he's like this really prim, proper, prissy little rich kid. He's kind Fuck of, him. He's kind of. <laughs> Tyler's a fucking antagonist. <laughs> he's kind of annoying. And kind of he's a bottom. <laughs> what? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Jonathan Joestar, he's playing around with his beloved dog, Danny. And he's just Damn. waiting for his new adopted brother to arrive, as Dario recently passed away. Damn. And he decides to take George up on his offer and sends his son over to be raised in the Joe Star household and have all that good shit he couldn't have growing up. So, uh, upon arrival, the carriage pulls up, and this and this little boy just. <laughs> This, this wicked little boy, he jumps out the carriage, strikes like a big fat pose, and introduces himself as Dio Brandon. Boss music plays. <laughs> no, this clip is so insane. This clip changed my life for a while. <laughs> like, I seen, I seen the clip and I was instantly sold. I was like, okay. This yeah. is sexy. Are you looking it up? Uh, I don't know if I can look it up. We'll show, no, just look up, we'll show you. Just look up Dio introduction. Yeah. Okay. And it has like them as kids. What does he do next, Ed? So, Dio, uh, he no. immediately chooses violence and decides to kick the shit out of Danny to assert himself. <laughs> <laughs> naturally. Oh, are you guys watching? No, keep going. Okay. Okay. okay, so naturally, Jonathan's pretty pissed off how his beloved. His beloved Eleven. pet dog Danny has been kicked in the face, and he goes to like beat up Dio naturally. But then George steps in, and he's like, "Now, now, Jonathan, this young man is our guest. He's family now, and you'll treat him as such." And then Jonathan's like, "Oh shoot, I guess so." <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, gosh, dude, darn. And Dio's like, "I'm terribly sorry. I'm just, I'm kind of scared of dogs. Ooh, ooh I'm baby." <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm baby. <laughs> so meanwhile, while he's like saying I'm baby and shit, he's like internally monologuing to himself. We see this, how he can't wait to dethrone Jonathan and claim the Joe Star at fortune for his own. So yeah, Oops. bad vibes. So here's in this section I have yeah, I, uh, I have titled What the fuck is up with Dio? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is up with Dio? Ed? So what's up with Dio is that uh, as we can infer Dio grew up poor and in squalor and pretty much had to like squalor. scrap and fight to like survive on a day-to-day -day basis and because of this he's grown to like resent the world because he feels like he was deprived of the stuff he deserves and like what he wants is like he wants like power like power to like fulfill all his urges power urges. to like make the strongest <laughs> men what a whiny baby he got to live with the one percent at ten like he like like deals the kind of guy that would like want time itself to stop at his command, like that kind of shit. Uh, is that the kind of guy he is? That's the kind of guy he is. He just wants to rule the world. <laughs> I love generic villain. It's Bowser. So the Dio agenda. Dio sets his plan, his master plan in motion. Dio's like twelve, by the way. Dio sets his master plan. <laughs> He also has his master plan in mo motion by like just making Jonathan's life as miserable as possible. And he does this by like starting rumors among Jonathan's friends group about how Jonathan's actually mid. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a bully with grand illusions of power. Yeah. Yes. So that is the character we're talking about, Tyler. A god complex, if you will. Yeah. 
So yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah, guys, Jonathan's mid, actually. He's going around, like, getting him in trouble with his dad at the dinner table. John, Jonathan's dad yells at him, and he feels kind of bad. Oh, man. So, and then, like, a big example of this, there's, like, a big boxing match going on. So Jonathan decides, he's like, you know what, deal? I had enough of your games. I'll prove myself here and now. So all of Jonathan's friends have been like Dio pilled and they're like, whatever, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, whatever, Jonathan, you ain't shit. <laughs> they're like, whatever, Jonathan, you ain't shit. Dio's gonna beat your ass. So they start fighting, and Jonathan actually manages to like Jonathan has hands. <laughs> he manages to like hold his own, but then Dio like channels his like inner street rat and just starts cheating low-key. Like, like, he t like, I think he takes some dirt and, like, kicks it in Jonathan's yeah. face. And then he, like, throws a punch and then, like, put the, digs his thumb in his eye to, like, temporarily blind him and shit. And then just dogs the shit out of him. And naturally, Jonathan loses. So, yeah, uh, so all of Jonathan's friends are, like, further deal pilled And they're like, wow, <laughs> you suck, Jonathan. We're... Friendship ended with Jonathan Joestar. Now Dio Brando is our best friend type <laughs> So everyone's laughing at Jonathan, he's mid. Everyone except for this one girl by the name of Arena Pendleton. Ooh. Ooh. What was that? that? That's my indication of an important character. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, after a while, like a few months go by of this, and like Dio has effectively destroyed Jonathan's life, right? But despite this, uh, he finds that Jonathan's spirit isn't broken. Like, he's still able to get up in the morning and, like, go about. So he's wondering why the fuck this is. So he does a little snooping around, and he finds that uh, Jonathan keeps meeting up with Arena, and they just hang out and chill for a bit. So he realizes that it's his love for Arena is what's giving him strength to get up in the morning. So he goes out and put an end to all that, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so one day, Arena's hey, out. Ed, did, is Danny still, what happened to Danny? Is Danny's he fine. Like, he's, he's perfectly fine. fine. He's fine. Room okay. temperature right now. <laughs> 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 Wait, who's Danny? The dog. Uh, the dog. The dog. The dog. Jo Johnny's, Jonathan's pet dog. Jonathan's perfectly safe dog. and healthy. He's perfectly <laughs> safe and healthy. He's room temperature. <laughs> he's, he's thriving. <laughs> Wait, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> just fucking die at room temperature. <laughs> that okay, so, going. so anyway, anyway. Uh, so one day, uh, Dio and his goons corner Erina outside. And nice. they like hold her down while Dio swoops in and like steals her first kiss. So he's like, ha ha, you thought you were you thought you was oh, gonna you thought you were, you were gonna kiss Jonathan, but it was me, Dio. That's where that meme came from. Oh, and like and like and he's like, oh man, you're you've been sullied and now you're not even good enough for Jonathan. You you can't see him anymore. Your honor is ruined. And then Arena like kicks him in the shins and runs off. And she disappears. Wait, no, she drinks like mud too. Oh to, like, shit! Clean right. out her mouth. Fuck. Arena. Okay, yeah, I forgot to mention this. Arena's like raw as hell. <laughs> so, so after being kissed, after being like forcefully kissed by Dio, she proceeds to wash it off with muddy water that was just lying around. Is that she saw that as the better alternative to having Dio and Dio's like pissed and he like kicks her and shit. Like, but yeah, Arena's base. Don't forget. <laughs> Based in Jojo Pill. Based in John Pill. Let's go. So yeah, anyway, eventually word of this reaches Jonathan because his friends were talking about it. Like, ooh man, Dio kissed your girlfriend. Ooh. So this final bit is enough to finally put Jonathan. I'm just gonna call him Jojo from this point on. Yeah, Jojo. Because, yeah. because so this this finally pushes Jojo over the edge. So when Jojo gets home that night, he runs up on Dio and just starts beating the ever-loving shit out of him in like the, like the main foyer of their mansion. So like in the fight, uh, D Jojo lands like a really good uppercut on Dio and it like sends blood flying everywhere. Blood that splashes on this weird mask that got hanging on the wall, right? And like the mask reacts to the blood and like shoots out spikes from the back that like make that like launch it off the wall and they like stop fighting and look at it for a bit. Damn. The fuck? <laughs> They're like, what the, like the fuck is this shit? 
So yeah, it's revealed that uh, before her death, Jojo's mother was actually researching the mask because it had like weird properties that she wanted to like research or whatever. I don't know. Fuck, she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna talk about like what? Forgot how about George that. walks in on this scene. Did he walk in on it? Yeah, he yeah. walks. No, he walks downstairs and he looks around and is like, "Okay, I expected you guys to fight, but you, could you have not left such oh. a mess?" As he looks around yeah. and all the blind. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but yeah, so uh, Dio sees the mask fly off with all the spikes, and he thinks it's just like a tacky torture weapon or whatever. Jonathan sees it, and he starts like getting intrigued, and he decides to dedicate the rest of his life to researching archaeology and ethnology Nerd. to find out why the mask just did whatever the fuck it just did. Well, he's the one that's going to achieve world power, and that's the... <laughs> or is he? <laughs> so, I'll find uh, out. So yeah, after getting clapped, Dio uh, pretends to turn over a new leaf, and he like begs Jojo for forgiveness, as he's now seen the errors of his ways, and he'll do everything he can to be a proper brother. And they bury the hatchet, everything's fine, uh, Dio locks Danny in the furnace and incinerates him as the bag. <laughs> the fucking, the transition! <laughs> Let's fucking lock him! Fuck Danny. <laughs> He is no longer room temperature. <laughs> this is going to be a common theme in this, this show. This is a running theme. Fuck the dogs. Yeah, fuck, fuck dogs. Oh, oh my homie hate dogs. Toast to the end of this He's lecture. He's asleep, it's okay. 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 So it's because the author, Hirohiko Araki, said, was like, oh, well, if villains fuck dogs up, then that makes them seem more evil. Yeah. So yeah, that's like, the best way to make someone look bad is to make them kill a dog. Yeah. But as a result, there are millions of dead dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo. <laughs> How many live dogs are there? That's a good no, uh, question. There's, there's one dog that you think would get out okay, but then he like has a run-in with a villain. <laughs> <laughs> there, I can think of a, a couple dogs that make it out okay, but they're like minor. They're do no one even cares about All them. the main dogs. All the main, All the main dogs <laughs> die. The if, main. The, if there's a dog that's focused on their dead. <laughs> if they have a name, they're yeah. If the dog is named, it dies. I got it. Okay, so anyway. Uh, so, Jojo and Dio bury the hatchet, uh, da Danny gets flamed, and about seven years later, uh, Dio and Jojo are now the best of friends. Uh, uh, they've long since buried the hatchet, and they decided to, like, put their respective talents together and became top students in whatever, high school, college, rolling? I don't fucking know either. Uh, they're, they're like, like a high school football team, yeah. They're like 17. <clears throat> Right, yeah, because they were 12. No, seven years, they'd be like 19 then. Okay, I don't know. They, whatever, they're, it's, they're, it's old, so, it's they're so. old and football players. They're yeah. old, they're graduating from somewhere, and that's... Sorry, they're playing thing. rugby, my bad. They're playing <laughs> rugby because they're British, unfortunately. <laughs> they live in Liverpool. Do they have British accents? Yeah, and yeah. the dub yeah. yeah. is yeah. great. Yeah. It's fantastic. And it's so great. We got it. Oh my god, it's amazing. Oh, but anyway... And so everything's fine. They just won the big rugby game. Everyone's happy. They, they go visit uh, George Joestar to celebrate with them. And they find that George has fallen mysteriously ill. Ooh. <laughs> Fuck. So after visiting their ailing father, Jojo seems how it's a little odd how Dio suddenly wants to just be there for George every step of the way and make sure he gets back on his feet. So he does a little snooping around and he actually finds the letter that Dario sent to George way back when, when Dio first arrived. And in this letter, Dario, reveal, Dario talks about how he's fallen with some mysterious illness also. Mm -hmm. And like Jojo, as he reads the letter, finds out that the symptoms Dario mentions are the same symptoms that George is feeling now. So this oh. makes him put two and two together and realize that Dio had something to do. He probably like poisoned his father and killed him to make him send him over to the thing. And now he's doing the same thing to George so he could get that sweet inheritance money. So learning this, uh, uh, Jojo, he, he confronts Dio about this. He calls him out on his bullshit. And then he steals a dose of like George's medicine to take it in for testing. Meanwhile, Dio, he's been figured out and he makes a plan to like, he tries to come up with a plan to like quickly kill Jojo and like get the money, kill George, get the money, you know. Get the bag. Sigma <laughs> Sigma. 
So Dio, he recalls back to that one day seven years ago with the mask and the spikes flying out. And he decides he can maybe use that mask to kill Jojo and like make it seem like some kind of research accident gone horribly wrong. Because everyone at this point knows that Jojo is like studying the mask. So he can like frame it, pass it off as like an accident and get away with murder essentially. So he decides to take the mask and like goes out for a night on the town to like test it out a bit, find out how it works exactly, and then come back and kill Jojo. So while Dio is wandering around, he comes across like some homeless beggar dude. And he like forces the dude, he like pulls out a knife, stabs the guy, he puts the mask on the guy, takes his blood, smears it on him, the spikes come out, shoot the, <coughs> got my throat, oh. stab the dude in the skull, Blah blah god, the guy falls down on the, on the ground, he's dead or whatever. <laughs> so so Dio's like, okay, cool, so that's how it works. He moves to pick up the mask, and the guy is still alive. He grabs him with like like this superhuman strength and just Kill Dio! Of, he grabs him with like superhuman strength. That's why everyone's screaming during the scene. And just kind of like throws literally throws Dio down the fucking street. It's a really <laughs> funny clip. <laughs> Like Jack Jackson knows. I don't remember, to be honest with you. <laughs> when he turns the guy. I know, I remember the scene, I don't remember what it looks like. Uh, I'm sure it's funny though. It's, it's funny. I think uh, the part a part where he's crawling towards the sun in English is really funny. Oh yeah, oh yeah. See so, be the stab all sunrise! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so anyway, uh the guy uh throws Dio down the street, Dio crashes into a fence, and the guy jumps on him and he takes his fingers and he's like trying to like He's trying to suck Dio's blood. He's trying to suck Dio's blood. Like, trying to, fla try to flex on him, you know? Trying to flex on him. <laughs> like the Aztec chief team did back then. So, uh, event, like, he's about to succeed, but then the sun starts rising, and, like, the guy gets caught in the sun and starts, like, disintegrating. He bursts into flames, screaming and shit, and he dies, like, saving Dio at the last fucking minute. So Dio's pretty shaken up because he's just realized that this mask doesn't really kill people, but it turns people into like vampires, essentially. And he starts like getting the cogs turning in his head because he's like, oh wait, this is, I can use this. So, <laughs> go on, go on, go on. <laughs> so uh, Dio is still shaken. He, he heads back home to like formulate a new plan on how to like kill Jojo and George. Meanwhile, but he, he arrives home and he's immediately surrounded by like policemen who are, who are claiming he's under arrest for poisoning George Joestar. So, meanwhile, on that same night, Jojo is out investigating that poison in like the back alleys of like London, Liverpool, whatever. And he encounters this like thug guy that tries to rob him blind because he's, he's rich. He's like, hey, you look rich, give me all your shit. So a fight breaks out, and the thug guy gets his ass beat because for some reason Jojo's just built like a fucking mountain. For some <laughs> reason. It's all rugby. What's the thug guy's, guy's name? Anyway, but the <laughs> thug guy gets his ass beat, and he's just so blown away about how dope Jojo is and how much of a good sport he is that he decides to stop doing crime, and he dedicates the rest. <laughs> he, dedi he, he dedicates the rest of his life to helping him out. Really? And who is that thug? It's the man, the myth, the legend, Robert E.O. Speedwagon. Speedwagon! I got some fresh Just like speedwagon. a classic rock. Yeah. <laughs> my, my associates. Yeah. yeah. Robert E.O. Speedwagon. So JoJo and Speedwagon team up, and they use Speedwagon street smarts to find like yeah. the origin of the poison, and they find out where Dio is buying it, and they are buying it from this Chinese stereotype guy named Wang Chan, Rare Rockio. This is real fucking name. I love like depictions of Chinese and Japanese media. It's <laughs> always horrible. Yeah. And they had this man arrested on grounds of selling poison and being Chinese, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> then they used the rest of Chan's wares as evidence, and they bring that to the police to have Dio arrested. So, back to the present. Dio is surrounded by cops, as Jonathan explained... Oh. We have, like, less than a minute left on this. Oh, oh I was about to... Yep. Yeah. Come. Okay, so, where were we? <laughs> okay, Dio... Uh, surrounded by police officers, as Jonathan explains to everyone, Sherlock Holmes style, what exactly went down, and Dio's big plan. Dio's caught, 
and he's like back into a corner. But Dio still has his knife, and most importantly, Dio still has his stone mask. So uh, he pulls out his knife and rushes to like slit Jojo's throat to use his blood to activate the mask. But George Joestar, he's walking around for some fucking reason. <laughs> he, he jumps in the way. Oh, how convenient. And gets stabbed instead. Dio's like, whatever, it's not that symbolic, but I'll take it. And he uses George's blood to activate the mask on himself. It stabs him. And then in that moment, the police do something and they all, they all open fire on him. Dio's like, wait, wait this is England. Yeah, but it's like... I don't know. 1800s. It's a poor person attacking a rich person. <laughs> Dio, he, he gets shot. He gets, like, filled with bullet holes and shit. He collapses to the ground and then immediately, like, pops a backflip and gets back up. <laughs> the mask falls off. He has fangs. He's a vampire now. He rejected his humanity. <laughs> Is it night? It's, it's, night. it's nighttime. Oh, yeah. It cannot all be <clears throat> night. Okay, uh, yeah, everyone watches as, like, Dio uses his, like, vampire powers to, like, instantly close all the bullet holes he has. And then he just, like, goes around just instant killing cops, ACAB, and Speedwagon. <laughs> speed <wagon. laughs> and, like, Speedwagon, he's, he's, he's there, he's still hanging around. Uh, he gets gravely oh, wounded, but he, he's built different, so don't worry about Speedwagon, he's A-okay. Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. So Dio's running around, one-shotting everyone, and Jonathan's like looking around, coming face to face with the supernatural for the first time. So he's like, he can't let Dio get away with this and like get outside and like start killing people and shit. So he decides to kill him then and there. And the best way to go about this is with fire and lots of it. So he sets the mansion on fire and <laughs> <laughs> the scene where he fucking opens the fucking the curtain and it's just like fire everywhere. And he's like <laughs> that that's great. <laughs> so he sets the mansion on fire and plans to like trap Dio somehow inside so it burns down with a minute and all that shit. Fuck Dio. So after a really sick fucking fight, Jojo manages to skewer Dio on like the statue they have in the foyer. If you watch the anime opening, it's like right there in the very beginning of it. Like, like y'all know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. He skewers him on the statue and leaves him. And, and like right before like the flames also consume Jonathan and kill him, he gets caught up in a backdraft and like blown out the window. And he lands outside. He's badly injured, but Speedwagon's there. He takes him to the hospital. Uh, go for real. And inside the hospital, uh, Jonathan is nursed back to health not by none other than Erina Pendleton, who ran off after being kissed by Dio and became a nurse, I guess. And so uh, during Jonathan's stay, they like rekindled their love for each other. And after losing everything, it's this love that gives Jonathan the strength to keep going. And yeah. Wow. Uh, meanwhile, Wang Chan is still alive. Because, <laughs> like, he was kind of... He, he was kind of there just watching this shit go down. He's like, damn, he's... <laughs> he's watching this shit go down. And he, so he's scouring, like, the burnt-down ashes of the mansion. He's looking for, like, the stone mask because he wants to, like, sell it and make a quick butt. Because I guess he wasn't really paying attention, I guess. <laughs> This well, man was not reading. You could probably sell that for a decent I amount. guess. I, th I think this man was skipping parts, honestly. This man was skipping chapters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, he's, he's looking around for the stone mask, and, but he doesn't find it. Instead, he finds Dio, who is still alive, and Dio jumps on this guy and, like, turns him into a zombie thrall, and they disappear for a bit. Oh, yeah, Dio can just turn people into zombies. That's what yeah. vampires do. Kinky, kinky vampire zombie sex. Okay, Jack Jackson. Jojo. <laughs> Dox White. <laughs> so it's like a month or two later, some some like a short, long amount of time passes, and a nearby town is suddenly plagued by like all manner of supernatural <clears throat> instances. So zombies and vampires. What the heck? And uh, Jonathan uh, and Speedwagon figure like, oh shit. Dio, could he still be alive? We have to check it out. So the two head out to this town called Wind Knight's Lot <laughs> to put an end to Dio's plans once and for all. 
So they're on their way talking about how they're going to beat the shit out of Dio again. And meanwhile, they're stopped by like this weird dude. This he's this weird Italian guy, right? And he's like right. standing in a lake. He's like walking on water. He's punching frogs. <laughs> 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 Walk on water, punch your father, oh, shit. It. And the guy, uh, the guy sees the two because he's also on his way to win Night's Lot to beat the shit out of Dio on orders from. Oh, 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 I'll get into that. But this man, his name is Will Antonio Zappelli, and uh, last name Zappelli taken from Led Zeppelin because Araki's like I think it's his like favorite favorite band, right? Really. I don't know. Man. I don't fucking know either. I know, no, because like the way he talks about it, he says like he like he he wants to use the name like Zappelli for like really important standout characters because he loves the band that. Then much. proceeds to forget about them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Will Zappelli, he's there, and Zappelli claims to these two that they can't possibly defeat Dio as they are now. And because what they need to truly kill Dio is it's a little a shit Mahashan. called Hamon. So, in this section titled, What the Fuck is Hamon? So, okay, so Hamon is basically a martial arts technique designed to have the user focus bodily energy into Hamon energy. And this is key in defeating Jojo and, and Dio, as the Hamon energy is comparable to the energy produced by the sun. Zaripu. So, to a sheep. What? So are you turning into a different kind of his energy, or are you just increasing it massively? You're like taking like your own life energy and turning it into like common energy, and then you punch vampires and it melts them. Got it. Through because the they're anti-life, really? so you yeah. put yeah. life in there like bam. Through the common breathing. Yeah. <laughs> so to do this, uh, the user must learn proper common breathing techniques to fully master the martial art. So anyway, after some more frog. Oh yeah. Also, a thing. The thing about common is that uh, there's like not really that many set rules a Rocky places for yeah. So he kind of uses it as like a dos ex machina a lot. It just has it does like whatever he needs whenever he writes himself to a corner. Uh, one cool thing though is that like uh, Tommen does something with like surface tension and shit. Yeah. So it like lets you walk on water and like climb up walls Spider-Man style or some shit like that. Is Jesus a Hamon mage? Um, Jesus, no. is, Jesus does not use common, though. Okay. Who knows what he is? This implies that Jesus does exist in the JoJo's Bizarre. <laughs> Wait, you didn't go over how William Zappelli presents Haman to Joseph? Oh, yeah. Joseph. Oh, yeah. He presents Haman as, like, being able to control the flow of energy. And he demonstrates this by, again, frog punching. You know, when I say frog punching, there's a frog chilling on the rock. <laughs> he walks up to it, like, deep, bre deep breaths and like chops the frog, right? <laughs> but but because of the hamun, the, the force of the chop passes through the frog, not harming it, and instead splits the boulder underneath the frog. The frog is safe. He's the doing rock all this while like prancing around, walking on water and shit. Because yeah. of like surface tension bullshit. Gene. <laughs> Zappelli was the original twink. <laughs> the original Jojo twink. The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so like they train for like 10 minutes in the episode, and then like, uh, psh, and they're like, okay, you, you know Haman, Jojo, let's go kill Dio. So they're on the way now, and they're ambushed by one of Dio's minions, who it's none other than his now zombified Jack the Ripper, who was hiding inside of a horse. Bursts out the fucking horse. Yeah, he was just Jack the Ripper. inside of the horse. Was like, it's me, Jack the Ripper. It's 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 funny too because at the beginning, I think of like the second episode, and it literally just goes from like the plot of the episode, first episode, which is like whatever's happening, and then it just at the beginning of the second episode, it's them just talking about Jack the Ripper. Like, just for no fucking reason. And then it's like, oh, okay, JoJo again. <laughs> just like the Jack the Ripper? The yes. Jack the like, Ripper. Okay. The canonical. Also, canonical. this is not a twink. Yeah, that's what I was yeah, like. Yeah, Jackson, what are you talking this about? Is, <laughs> this man, he's this, beefy. With this he's man's top, top heavy. With, like, what the yeah. hell? Within. <laughs> the, 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 he's no. a twink at heart. The, the twink in your soul. <laughs> I'm so sorry, please get <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyway, Jack the Ripper, he's there for some reason, and Zapelli's like, alright, Jojo, this is a test. 
use your hamen to defeat Jack, but he, he like hands him like like a glass of wine. It's like don't spill any wine. Or you're fucked. <laughs> so Jojo he fights Jack and he learns about he learns more about Haman and he finds out that Haman is like conductive in the same way electricity is. So he uses that to like imbue the glass with Haman energy and like locate Jack who's just hiding around in horses and shit. And then he manages to like one shot him and they move on. So the group moves on and like some fucking kid, his name's Poco or whatever, he doesn't do anything. Uh, Poco distracts them, and then Dio shows up. Ooh, Dio. And uh, so Dio's back. He's fully healed from his fight in the mansion. And like they're like confronting him. They're like, Dio, you fiend, how many people have you killed to heal yourself? And Dio responds, how many breads have you eaten in your lifetime? I used I, I wore the, this shirt bread. yesterday and I forgot I was going to wear it today. And, and, and Zapelli's horrified oh, because he's eaten a lot of bread in his life. So, so that happened. I ate the town. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, he yeah. pretty much did. Uh, so yeah, anyway. Uh, Dio, so Zeppelli, he's like horrified and angered. So he jumps up to like slap Dio with some sunlight karate. And like, Dio is like, Dio managed to come up with like a counter technique to Haman. Where it's weird. Like, I, so it's like. What was it? He like vaporizes the. He grabs someone and then like vaporizes the liquid inside of like whatever he grabbed, and yeah. that causes them to like freeze instantly. Yeah. So he uses that like freezing cold to counteract like the burning intensity of the sun. Yeah. Okay. On William Zapelli, and like, does he lose anything, or is it just like oh, no? It's cold. Ow, my <laughs> arms. He does. He doesn't. He doesn't lose anything. Yeah, 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 okay. Ow, my arms. Some shit. But like they don't beat Dio. They yeah, just, yeah. They and don't they, it's just Dio. like okay, we gotta fucking get out of here. Yeah, they, yeah. They realize like shit. We gotta go. He has like a zombie army now. Fuck this shit. No, <laughs> so so Dio, uh, quick fight ensues. Antonio gets clapped because of ice. He's not ice type weakness. <laughs> and Antonio. Uh, hmm? Antonio? Yeah, Antonio wills a pelly. It's a pelly. Yeah. Okay. I'll just say, I'll just refer to Antonio. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Dio beats them and he heads out, but not before sticking his two big boy zombie henchmen, Bruford and Tarkas. Uh, they're supposedly legendary knights from the 1500s who served Queen Mary of Scots during like her big feud with Queen Elizabeth. And like their backstory is pretty fucked because they're, they're so loyal to Mary that uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, captured Mary and was planning to execute her. But they're like, no, kill us in her place. So she's like, okay. So they're on the chopping block. They're like, kneeled down. The executioner's about to come down. And then Elizabeth's like, oh yeah, I killed that other bitch too. And I'm like, wait, no! And then they like, die and shit. In true anime fashion, they literally explain their entire backstory in the middle of the fight. In the middle of the fight. <laughs> like, so, but yeah, so anyway. Uh, but these two zombies are built different and retain like these memories of their past life as like being knights and shit. Fucking nobody's. Fucking so uh, Bruford, <laughs> wait, which one was the big one? Bruf Bruford was the big yeah. one. Tarkus was the so not as big one. Okay, that's. When what you I say thought. big, do we mean like giant size? Giant size. Buffer than them. Buffer, buffer than Jojo. Swat. Buffer, oh, buffer like than the Hulk. person you, you just looked at on your phone. Like think Hulk. Hulk. We probably had the Hulk. Yeah. Were they like this, or were they? I mean, they were they were just like this before. So okay, got it. Okay, so uh, Rufer. Nightlife, you know. <laughs> it's a scam call. Okay. Uh, oh wow, I have their names backwards in this, but whatever. Uh, Maybe Har I got them. Harford and Brucus. Whatever. I'll just write it, and then we'll come in and edit it and post. I'll just say it, but uh, anyway, so Bruford, having retained memories of being an honorable knight, he requests to Dio that he takes on Jojo alone, and Dio's like, sure, and he heads out, but Tark, but, oh, what the fuck, I wrote this twice. Uh, <laughs> but Tarkus uh, keeps watch so the gang can't jump into their fight and interfere and shit. So the two duke it out, and Jojo starts having issues when he realizes that being a zombie, Tarkus is able to freely manipulate his hair. And not only that, when his hair latches onto his arm, he finds that he's draining his blood through his hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! 
So he's fighting like a hair tentacle man, and then the and like meanwhile, all uh, Tarkus or whatever skinny man, hair man. I'm just gonna call him hair man. Hair man <laughs> is also using his sword that he's also swinging around with his hair while he's like pinning down Jojo. So things are looking really bad. But things go, things get even worse for Jojo as uh, Hair Man drags him into a nearby lake. So now they're fighting like underwater. And this is super bad because uh, Jojo is unable to like properly breathe and like channel the hum on energy he needs to like kill this zombie. And he also just can't breathe. Yeah, yeah and then he just breathe. can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that sword called that Tarkus or Hair Oh, yeah, Tarkus also has the sword called oh, Bluck. Like it has the word luck engraved on it and shit. Like. And what he changed? Oh, hey, hey, hey! I'm sorry, I, did, I thought this already happened. We'll get there. It's, I'm it's, sorry. It's after the okay, break. so, but, uh, so things are looking bad for JoJo. He's starting to black out, but then he remembers fighting Jack the Ripper, and what he learned is that Hamon is conductive, kind of like electricity. And he's surrounded by water. Not only that, the sword is metal and also conductive. So he like uses the last of his air reserves and fire off like his big attack, the turquoise blue overdrive, which sends a bunch of Hamon energy rippling throughout the water. And then the, the Hamon energy catches onto the sword, travels down the sword and into uh, Hair Man, and it like electrifies him and blows him out of the water. So now uh, Jojo climbs up out of the lake now. He picks up the sword Hairman drops, and he's about to like chop his head off with like common sword. But then he stops at the last minute because he realized that the Haman force uh, purified Hairman's soul. So he's not <laughs> <laughs> The Haman Force purified Hairman's soul, and he's not evil, and it would be dishonorable to strike down such an honorable man. Oops. So he explains this to Hair Man, and Hair Man's like, "That you're fucking crazy, bro. Keep it up." So he, <laughs> <laughs> so he uses like his dying breath to like take some of his own blood and like engrave the, uh, engrave a letter P in front of the luck on the sword, and he renames the sword Pluck because JoJo's one plucky kid. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking stupid. <laughs> So yeah, with this, uh, Hair Man disintegrates and dies. Oops. Because but what about just, Big Bitch? He just got pumped full of hum and you know the vibes. Yeah. So uh, also, uh, I'm just gonna refer to this guy as Big Man, Big Boy, Big whatever. Man. Big Boy. Beefus. So uh, Big Boy is like, okay, rip to the homie, and he jumps in and just starts like swinging on all of them. And they're like, we can't take him here. We're surrounded by zombies. So they like scatter up a cliff, right? But they realize there's no way down the cliff. They're surrounded by zombies all over the place. So they're kind of like stuck, they're fucked. So obviously the only solution is to use the Haman, is, to, is for Zapelli and Jodo to channel their like Haman energy together and use it as a kind of magnet to gather nearby leaves in the area and form it into the shape of a glider and then stick all those <laughs> oh, leaves yeah. together. And then they, they take this leaf glider and jump off the cliff and glide for a minute. <laughs> Every word you add to this sentence, I don't understand. <laughs> because it channels the life, and leaves are like living. This is know? what I mean when Iraqi just makes Haman do whatever. Fuck it. Stuff. <laughs> so yeah, they glide. This plan works for five seconds, but Big Man has hops, and he jumps after them, <laughs> knocking them into a nearby building and like splitting up the group. Like JoJo, uh, Big Man. <laughs> Do you need more water? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Shit. But anyway, Big Man and Jojo are like in some separate like chain room where you fight with chains and collars and shit or whatever. <laughs> the Meanwhile, gimp room. The gimp room. <laughs> they're, tra they're trapped in like the kink, the kink dungeon. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone else is not in the kink dungeon and they gotta get in the kink dungeon <laughs> to help Jojo. They gotta get in the Fifty Shades of Grey universe. <laughs> So uh, Poco does something useful and helps the gang get in the King Dungeon as they find Big Man puts on a collar and he forces a collar on Jojo and they're like fighting as like the collars are connected to these chains that run up into the ceiling. So as one collar goes down, it pulls the other one up and vice versa. And, and Big Man is basically like falling down to the ground to like 
lynch Jojo and then rushing in to like chop him in half and shit. So Zapelli, he he we get like a Zapelli flashback, like his whole backstory. So uh, William Antonio Zapelli, he decided to start fighting vampires when, at a young age, his father discovered a stone mask while they're like sailing or whatever, and like he decides to put it on for the meme and becomes a vampire and kills everyone else on the ship except for Zapelli, who kills him. After this encounter. Uh, Zapelli seeks out a means to like fight vampires more effectively, and this leads him to meeting Master Tom Petty. So, Master Tom Petty. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a metal reference? No, it's a uh, like classic <coughs> rock or like singer. He's a yeah, singer. Yeah. Who I really, really don't like. Why don't we like Tom Petty? I just don't like. And by him the way, it's it's one word, and it's spelled T O N P E T T Y. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Master, but anyway, he meets Master Tom Petty, which who teaches him the the power of the ripple. Haman. So Haman is also weird. called the ripple. I think. Oh. And Sendo for some reason. Sendo Haman the ripple. Overdrive. It's, it's 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 all the same thing. So he he's he's so there's like a back, like what's it called? A flashback, flashback. training montage of Zapelli learning how to use Haman, okay. and he finally masters Haman, and like and then Master Tom Petty gives him like a prophecy saying that he will die fighting while aiding uh, a young lion break his chains or whatever. So he flashes back to the present and Zapelli realizes that Jojo with the chain collar is the young is the young lion whose chains he has to break by dying. So he jumps in, something happens and he gets like torn in half by the chains. No yeah, he gets like tied into he, the yeah, chains gets, and it's just Holes yeah, until he gets, gets like tangled half. up in the chains, and like brute, and like big man just like takes that chance to like yank it, and it like closes and rips him in half. So uh, uh, he's kind of dying now. <laughs> Marley. And while while Zapelli's dying, he decides to give Jojo the last of his Haman energy, and he like rapidly ages because he's like giving all his life energy essentially, you know. Oh, so they have a limited amount of. of I energy? mean, I mean, as long as you're alive and able to breathe, it's good because like they say Haman because of its oh. being hot life energy like slows your aging down considerably. Yeah. Okay. But when I mean, you're not alive, you don't have any. Yeah, when you're not alive, you don't have any life energy, unfortunately. <laughs> so. Uh, with this, uh, Jojo gets the power boost he needs to literally break the collar off, and he just punches the shit out of Big Boy, who dies and disintegrates. <laughs> so now, uh, the crew, they're on their way, they, they get out of the castle, and they're on their way to Dio's new mansion. Wait, what crew? It's Jojo, right? It's it's uh, Jojo, Speedwagon, and that Poco kid. Right? Oh, Speedwagon's here? Yeah, yeah Speedwagon yeah. tags along. Oh, yeah. What was he doing back there? No, absolutely so fucking nothing. He just watched you already the know the fuck he was doing. I I have not watched the red part one. Speed wagon is the fucking man the whole time. Speed wagon is the only normal person here, so he stands back and narrates the fight. All speed wagon yeah. does is just go, no, Jojo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyway, they're on their way, uh, they find, like, a man who claims to know Poco, and he's like, Poco, where have you been, you dummy? Your sister's looking for you. And he's like, oh, shucks, later, guys! <laughs> <laughs> and the game turns around, but then they realize the man has been turned into a zombie by Dio, and he's about to kill Poco. Oopsies. So, so, oh, fuck, wait, my thing turned off. Uh. So, uh, Tom Petty, I'm not, but not, what? No, so uh, so Jonathan he goes and one shots the zombie, but then he's immediately attacked by another weird guy who like jumps at him, <laughs> like like he does like the, the the leg split thing. You know what I'm talking the, about? The the cross split attack. Yeah, he like, cross cross split attack. Cross yeah. Cross yeah. Attack. He, like he like jumps at him cross dive, and Jonathan's no. like, "Ooh, I got you now!" So no, he jumps him. in to kick him. Dio. No, 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 makes no. Him no, no, yeah, Joe, no, Joe, yeah, yeah, he jumps into like a, like a flying <laughs> dropkick, right, and Jojo like grabs him, and he's like, ha, I got you, so then the guy that splits his legs is wide open, and like moves into attack, and then Jojo responds by headbutting him. <laughs> In, wait, you... Yeah. <laughs> So then the guy is like, oh, I see uh, Zapelli has taught you well, and this man is none other than Dyer, and he's been sent here with his friend Straso by Master, <laughs> <laughs> Master Tom Petty. <laughs> 
It's Dire Straits. <laughs> Mikaela, yeah, like, yeah, who's the other guy? Dire Straits. Got it. Dire Straits. Dire Straits. It's also and the other guy is Straito. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dire. That'd be great. <laughs> but yeah, Dire and Straitso have been sent by Master Tom Petty to aid Zapelli in his fight against Dio. But Zapelli's kind of like in two pieces now. So that's not good. But yeah. they, they, they decide to team up for revenge. Ooh. And they bust into Dio's mansion. mansion. <laughs> so a fight breaks out. Uh, Dyer, for some reason, decides to do the same thing he did to Jojo to Dio. And Dio responds by grabbing him. Dyer splits his legs open and he's like, ah, I gotcha. And then he like free and then Dio responds by freezing Dyer from like from like from to the neck up, right? And then he like shatters his body, leaving only his head. But Dyer planned ahead as he has a rose for some reason. And he <laughs> and he abused that rose with Haman energy and spits it at Dio and the rose stabs him and Dio's like, ah, Haman energy or whatever. What uh <laughs> And then he dies. <laughs> oh, Dyer dies. Dyer dies. Dyer dies. Dyer dies. Okay. Dio's still alive. Great. Dio's still alive, and there's like roses everywhere, I guess. So Jojo then begins by grabbing a bouquet of roses, and then he uh, he just throws them at Dio. And these are just regular roses. These are regular roses, <laughs> but with humble. I mean, like one of them we has. Get, well, it, does, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyway, he responds, he, he throws the roses at Dio to, like, block his vision. He strafes to the side with Pluck, the sword he has, and, like, just buries it in Dio's head. But, uh, <laughs> Okay, he splits his head open using Pluck. But then Dio reveals that he actually froze the sword when Jojo swung it and mo immobilizing Jojo's arms and legs. So Jojo's frozen there. And, uh... Yeah. So Dio then uses his chance to pierce Jojo's like neck and he like pulls out his carotid artery from his neck and he's like just playing with it. <laughs> he's just, he's just <laughs> like green like he's really just playing with it like uh, My like a lot of shit your carotid. Like a lot of shit goes down in this anime, but like that's the only thing that makes me like squirm on color. <laughs> Doesn't he like <laughs> yeah, no, he's like, <laughs> he's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. like Yeah he's making like weird my thumb and forefinger are between your carotid. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking love like, the job, by the way. Sexual <laughs> tension is there between JoJo and Dio. <laughs> wait, wait, so wait, we're not even there yet. Oh, oh boy. There's, there's gonna be wait. more. Just you wait, this shit gets crazy. They're fucking. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Oh uh, so Dio's messing around with this dude's whole ass vein, right? <laughs> and then he, he, he like splits the vein open and he starts pumping in like that zombie juice because he wants to zombify zombie Jojo juice. and turn him into a zombie minion. But God, shit, yeah, this is Tyler. You okay? Oh my God, fuck you. Okay, <laughs> yeah, fuck you. We all hated that you did that. <laughs> Everyone just like broke. God, fucking not house trained. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so uh, Jojo responds to this by like using his Haman breathing technique to quickly defrost himself and then he ejects the zombie juice out of his like carotid artery, right? So, uh, and then he uses a nearby torch to like set his hand on fire, then he imbues his hand with Haman energy and then he goes in to like strike Dio with the scarlet red overdrive, and it hits, it connects, and sends Dio flying, he's flying, he flies off the balcony, he's falling, woo, but Dio still has a trick up his sleeve, as he uses the classic vampire technique, Space Ripper Stingy Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> alright, 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 alright. We're at, we have like a minute left on this, so we might have to pause. Okay. So yeah, Dio attacks with the signature vampire ability, Space Ripper Stingy Eyes. So, what Space Ripper Stingy's eyes is, Dio fires like a high pressurized like beam of fluid, they say, out of his eyes, and it acts like a laser beam, and it like cuts through shit. But, and he shoots this as, at um, Jojo, but Jojo remembers that Haman can conductivity and shit, so he pulls out the same wine glass 
Zapelli gave him earlier and like you imbues it with Haman and like there's this absolutely bonkers shot of like the laser beam entering the glass and then because of the Haman it flows around the curvature of the glass <laughs> and it flies back and hits Dio and sends him flying even more. It's, it's, it's rad. It's rad as hell. <laughs> you just had to dodge that, John. You didn't have to go so hard. Like, fuck he, it. he flexed on this man. He was like, fuck you, Adam. Jojo. <laughs> That's for Danny. <laughs> That's for Danny. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this happens and uh, Dio succumbs to the Haman that's now like rapidly coursing through his body and he plummets down, disintegrates Ow. and dies, you know. And everyone's everyone's happy because the day the day is saved, the battle's won. Uh, they take the stone mask and they destroy it. Everything's good. It's just fine. He is dead for good. Yeah, he's super dead. Lol. <laughs> so, three months pass, and Jojo, uh, finally recovering from this bullshit he just went to, <laughs> he, he, he finally decides to tie the knot, and he marries the love of his life. That's Aaron not what tie the knot usually means. Marry? But that is not. <laughs> what the? No, that's not. <laughs> and makes plans to begin their new life together in the magical I'm thinking country. of clip. Sorry, my bad. I'm thinking of clipping. Oh. <laughs> It makes plans to begin their new life together in the magical country of late 1800s America. Okay. So why are they going to America? Just my cash right. I don't know, just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are pretty cool. <laughs> but anyway, so the gang, everyone, everyone that didn't like get turned into ice and shattered is there <laughs> seeing the boat go off. They're like, yeah, goodbye, Jojo. Ooh. And then... <laughs> so things are fine, things are just vibes on the boat, you know, until uh, Jojo notices someone, like a, a specific someone, none other than Wang Chan, he's still kicking around, and he's like, what the fuck, he's a zombie, Aaron, I go to the room, I gotta check this out. So he investigates, he goes down to the engine room, and inside the engine room, he finds a black coffin with the word Dio <laughs> like, on the front. And he's like, something's up here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in this section, this dude again, I, uh, I had it written down, but one thing. But in this section, this dude again? Okay, so basically, back in Wind Knight's lot, before the Haman energy can like fully course through Dio's body, reaching his brain and destroying him, killing him permanently, he severs his own head and like leaves oh, his yeah. he severs his own head and leaves his body to like succumb to the Haman while he's just like in disembodied head using like his veins and shit to like walk around or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Dio spider head spider. spider. Yeah. Spider Dio. Spider Dio. <laughs> spider Dio is just walking around. He meets up with Wang Chan and he they both come up with a plan to like restore Dio to his former glory, right? So meanwhile, uh back to the present, uh Wang Chan is running around turning random like people on the boat into zombies and it starts like it, it turns into like a massacre. It's a bloodbath, everyone's dying, everyone's eating each boat. other, it's fucked up. <laughs> uh, Erin, uh, meanwhile, is like running around and she's like trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. Uh, but she, she manages to like hold her own. She saves like a baby from like its mother who took out her and it was about to eat it. Mm -hmm. So that's good. That's cool. She saves this random ass baby. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't respect the parents' wishes. I see what this is. <laughs> They're fucking dead. She saves this random ass baby. Meanwhile, uh, Dio, D Spider Dio, burst out the coffin and he's like, Ooh, it's me! <laughs> <laughs> Size coffin? It yes. Full size coffin. Full size coffin. It's a big fucking. You're about to find out. Okay. <laughs> so restoring Dio to his former glory requires Dio getting a new body of some sort. Jojo, having becoming the only person Dio truly respects in life, has decided no one else would do. I want your body to replace my own. So he plans to kill Jojo. <laughs> Rip his head off, then place his head on JoJo's body because of how beautiful it he is. Says his words, JoJo. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's gay. <laughs> it gets gay. <laughs> We're not even at the twinks yet. Yeah. <laughs> not even like two specific yeah. scenes in part three, part five. So yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, that's Dio's big plan. So JoJo's like, what the fuck, look? That's <laughs> weird as shit. <laughs> So they start fighting, the big fight, Dio's firing off Space Ripper's stingy eyes, <laughs> shit's blowing up everywhere. Meanwhile, up on top, people are eating everyone. It's, it's fucked. This whole situation is so fucked up. <laughs> Bro, I was gonna go, this was just a childhood bully at his <coughs> mansion. Yeah. Fucking <coughs> kicking a dog, too. This whole shit is so fucked up. But anyway. <coughs> what do you like on the Croy head? No. Uh, it's a little cool. Oh. <laughs> oh, sparkling water. Uh, the uh, maybe, yeah. Lex Quarks. It's in the fucking thing <coughs> over there. Let's go, Tyler. Let's go. <coughs> you give me one, too. Daddy. Fucking stop calling people daddy. No, it's only him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You have a lacrosse. Are we just gonna wait for a lacrosse? <laughs> yeah, can we again. keep this in the fucking Yeah, let's keep this in the fucking box. It's a great shoe delivery to the lacrosse for Christmas. <laughs> Thanks, Papa. There's all Pample water. moose. <laughs> okay, okay. So, the meanwhile, races. the fight in the engine room eventually turns into like a raging inferno Damn. that spreads out from the engine room and like consumes the boat, causing it to begin to sink. So, meanwhile, uh, in the heat of the battle, Spider Dio manages to actually land the space stripper's stingy eyes on Jojo, piercing his neck, and he's no, a no longer able to like channel Haman, and most importantly, he can't breathe, so he's suffocating now. So, uh, knowing things are looking bad, so using the last of his strength, Jojo manages to like grab a hold of Dio and like keep him still as the boat goes down. Meanwhile, Dio's like begging Jojo, like, whoa, whoa, wait, bro, I can turn you into a vampire, we can live forever, ooh, come on, come on, join me. But it's too late because Jojo's already dead. Oops. Fuck what happened to Erina? So on February 7th, 1889, Jonathan Joestar passes away, leaving behind Erina, that random ass baby she picked up, and her unborn son. And that's the end of part one. I want to say, by the way, that that scene where the fucking ship is like exploding and Dio is describing what's happening is my favorite scene. Yeah, it's so the good. Stuff. And he's just fucking, he's so dramatic about it. And I, I, I forget his name, but the, his English voice actor is just so overly yeah, yeah, intense yeah. about it. And he's just like, the ship will explode. Yeah. <laughs> so fucking funny. Right, I don't mean to be that guy, but actually I do mean to be that guy. That took an hour, so we might have to like, you know. <laughs> we might have to skip. We that that spent an, we took we spent an hour on that, so we might have to speed up. So it'll be two hours on part two, three on three. Yeah, four on four. It increases exponentially. You might have to just speed through and not touch on everything like you did with part one. Okay, okay. So was that like one season? That's yeah. part that's one. That's in the of. anime, that's literally a half of a season. Like okay. the first 12 episodes. Yeah. Go okay. get uh, Okay. So, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 2, Battle Tendency. Woo! Yes. Thank you. Yes, Patrick Seitz, that's his name. Uh, we return to Mexico in the year 1938, Joe, yeah. and we see Speedwagon having uh, moved to America. He got lucky. He got really stupid lucky, found oil, and now he's like a big, rich fortune man and he's using his he used his fortune to create the speed wagon foundation and this is really cool because uh he eventually uses this foundation as a means to keep supporting the joe star bloodline long after he dies so it's like pretty base pretty base base and speed, speed wagon <laughs> he's still alive by the way he's still alive now though but so anyway he's 1938, like years old or something yeah he's like an old man now but 1938 it's mexico speed wagon is on an expedition expedition with a few members of the speed wagon foundation and they've come across this like pyramid and inside this pyramid in mexico by the way inside this like mexican pyramid they find like these more stone masks and not only that but they find like this weird dude this weird man sort of embedded in this pillar and they're like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? So, uh, Speedwagon decides to call up uh, the last common person he knows, Strizo, who survived the events of part one. And he's like, hey man, can you come like help us out? And there's like the shit going down. So Strizo obliges. He comes down to Mexico and lends assistance. And so, um, 
Strizo helps him out for a bit before he suddenly turns on Speedwagon's men, kills all of them, and then he turns on Speedwagon, killing him as well. He doesn't kill Speedwagon. Shut up, Rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Silly boy. Silly boy. Who's gonna Wait. be the big reveal? So does Speedwagon come back to life? Whoa, Speedwagon <laughs> was not actually dead, but I just wanted you guys I didn't know. to think he was for dramatic effect. I didn't know well, Roland knows so much thought. about fucking JoJo. <laughs> I, I forgot all about that. I'm sorry. I was so confused when you're like, yeah. I was like, oh. So Weedwagon's dead. <laughs> Weed, yeah. Weedwagon's dead. So yeah, Speedwagon's dead. <laughs> So yeah, we now cut to New York, same year, and we see the first black JoJo character, Smokey Brown. Oh, wait, was it Poco Black? No, no. Poco's white. Oh, okay. <laughs> we see the first black JoJo character, Smokey Brown, give it up for Smokey. <laughs> yeah. Smokey! Smokey! Named after the jazz musician of the same name, I think. I didn't know that! Yeah. And he's being harassed by Smokey Robinson, whatever. Anyway, like many black youth worth his salt, Smokey Brown is currently being harassed by police. <laughs> <laughs> so things are looking pretty bad as they openly plan to like arrest him or worse for like just being brown, I guess. And then meanwhile, some dude's walking by, he has like a little soda cap Coca-Cola, he's drinking it, and he sees like this going on, so he intervenes. And he, he like holds up the soda bottle and like some some sort of homin energy starts rippling through it. It builds up and causes the cap to fire off like a gun. It flies off, breaks the finger of like one of the guards, then he just beats the shit out of the other officer and he saves Smokey. So Smokey's like, Whoa man, thanks for saving my life. Who are you anyway? So this man is none other than Joseph Joestar, but his friends call him Jojo. Whoa. whoa. So anyway. Whoa, whoa. Just the name of the show. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> so Smokey's being helped by JoJo. Yeah. The okay. new JoJo. The new JoJo, Joseph Joestar. So we find out that Joseph is actually the grandson of Jonathan. Uh, and then he's hanging out, he's like still living with his grandmother, Erina Pendleton, and they're both really based. There's a scene where they like invite Smokey out to dinner, and they're all chilling, having a good time. Some guy's being racist about Smokey eating in the same room as him. So Joseph's like, hey, can I beat his ass? And Aaron is like, sure, cool, go <laughs> So he beats his ass, you know, base, kind of base for real, my goat. <laughs> Take a shot every time Ed says base in this lecture. <laughs> Oh yeah, also, uh, during this fight, uh, we see like a cool, we, we find out that Joseph, unlike Jonathan, isn't a bitch, and he's not afraid to like throw hands and such. Also, he's pretty smart, like smart enough to even predict his opponent's moves. It's like a running gag, where he's like, oh, your next line is, how dare, how dare you think you can stand up to me? And then the opponent's like, how dare you think you can stand up to me? And you're like, <gasps> like <laughs> Whoa, it's great, I love it. It's great, it's, it's so fucking good. But yeah, anyway, Jojo, I'm, I'm calling him Jojo from this point on. But so yeah, Jojo beats the shit out of this mobster guy who's being racist, and then the mobster guy, like, somehow knows about Speedwagon. He's like, well, that's why your Uncle Speedwagon's dead. And Jojo's like, whoa, Uncle Speedwagon's dead? And Aaron is like, oh no, Uncle Speedwagon is dead. <laughs> Uncle Speedwagon's dead. And then he fucks him up for telling him that. Yeah, yeah, so then he fucks him up even more for upsetting his grandma. And Speedwagon's not dead. Oh my god, I rolled the merit. Three the merits. We're All taking away your professor status again. <laughs> so, uh, so meanwhile, Smokey's there and he's like, who the fuck is Speedwagon? Hey, <laughs> later that day, uh, Jojo uh, gets together plans to go investigate and find out why Strizo just decided to like go ape shit. But actually, Strizo actually tracked him down because Strizo is now a vampire. You, cause, and he explains that back during the events of part one, when he was watching Dio run around kill people, he thought that Dio looked so fucking hot and he wanted that for himself. <laughs> literally. No, like literally. Literally. No. Hot. And he wanted to use the stone mask, but he didn't want to, like, be that guy and let them destroy it. So he, when he finds out that there's more stone masks, he's like, now's my chance, hot girl summer. And he goes to Mexico, <laughs> kills Speedwagon and everyone else, uses the mask on himself. 
And like, yeah, so he's like, I've come here to kill you, Jojo, because you're the only person who stands stands in my way of becoming the ultimate vampire or whatever. So Jojo's like, cool, Man. fuck you. And he pulls out a Tommy gun, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so he just starts blasting. <laughs> he just starts blasting. Fuck this guy. And, and of course, that doesn't work. And Strato's like, you dumbass. And they're like, oh, you're, you're, next you're going to say, you really think that will work against me? And it's like, oh, you really think that will work against me? Because like, <coughs> unbeknownst, unbeknownst to Strito, while Strito was like, talking all this shit, uh, Jojo managed to tie a bunch of grenades to his like fancy cotton <laughs> scarf he was wearing. And Jojo's like, what the fuck? And he blows up. <laughs> that works. <laughs> I like that. He just hasn't like an armory on him. <laughs> yeah, he's like a fucking matrix. <laughs> it's so fucking crazy. Like, like I, I, I'm, I firmly believe if it wasn't for like the shit that goes down later on, where he's kind of forced to learn Haman, like he would have pulled up on cards of like oh, a Glock in his hand. <laughs> like, like, oh my god. We don't know who that is yet, though. <clears throat> oh shit. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, Strizo realizes like whatever. This sucks. Uh, by the way, I had to dump their bodies in the river so the blood doesn't wake up the pillar man. And Jojo's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Strizo breathes Haman energy into himself, being a former Haman master, and he blows up. So Jojo's like, all right, I gotta get answers. So he heads out to Mexico, where he's intercepted by Nazi uh, assassins, right? And he, there's a quick fight, <laughs> cactuses are involved. Uh, the Cat's Nazi, eye. Cat's eye are involved. Cat's uh... <laughs> Uh, the Nazi assassin reveals that uh, the the Nazis they're stationed in Mexico and they've taken this like pillar man and now they're trying to like revive him by sacrificing like the locals. They're like rounding up like people from all these villages, killing them on mass, and then feeding the blood into this pillar to wake him up. So Joe's just like, like shit, that's there. fucked up. Uh, so yeah. They set out, and he and Jojo uh, encounters a man named Ru he he breaks into the Nazi base and meets a man named Rudolf von Stroheim, and Stroheim reveals that he's actually scared. taken Speedwagon prisoner. So Speedwagon is actually alive, but he's being held captive by Nazis. Wait. Wait. Why do the Nazis want Jojo in the first place? They don't want Jojo. Jojo's just there to like see what the fuck is going on. <laughs> they want Speedwagon because Speedwagon has yeah. Because Speedwagon about... actually knows about the Pillar Men, so they're holding yeah. him. Yeah, and about like Hamo and shit. Break into the Speedwagon. Oh, there. to break into the base, uh, Jojo oh, yeah. dons like this, like this, this outfit. He's got like big boobs. He's dressed <laughs> up as a woman, like big boobs, big butt. You know, he's like, oh come on, boys, <laughs> <Just one party." laughs> What was that Tyler Perry character? <laughs> Medea. <laughs> <laughs> so Jojo just sees the Nazis doing some weird stuff and it's like, let's investigate, breaks in, finds out they have an uncle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, uh, the Pillar Man has already been awakened and Rudolf von Strauchai dubs him Santana. I don't know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know that. San Viento! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, they're like, they got Santana in like SCP containment, they're watching him. <laughs> like, look at him, he's so powerful and beautiful. This is the <laughs> next step in human him. evolution and shit. So Santana quickly breaks out of containment by like squeezing his frame. Like he's like, like Jojo size, right? And he's like squeezing like his body into this air vent and like worming his way through it. So everyone's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, if that's me, I'm pissed. <laughs> so, like, some Nazi guy's, like, looking into the air vent. He's like, where is he? Oh, I'll get him. Santana bursts through the air vent, forces his way up his nose, <laughs> takes control of the guy's body, turns around, and starts firing off on everyone else. Everyone else starts shooting at the guy because they're freaking out now. And then Santana, like, still in control of the guy, takes in the bullets and then fires them back out of his body like shit. Then he like rips him open like a cheap costume. He's like, ooh. So Jojo watches this, and Jojo's like a complete fucking dumbass. So he's like starts playing games. He's like, oh, look at this. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> Wait, what? Like, yeah, you don't remember. He's playing. He's playing. I mean, I remember this, but I don't remember what he was here doing. It's like he was playing hokey pokey with the guy. No, no, he's like coming in like he's gonna touch Santana. Ooh. Like, he's like, ooh. <laughs> Like it's, it's great. <laughs> Bro, imagine 
imagine walking up to shy guy doing this shit. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so Joseph's having his fun in games until he realizes that Santana, for some reason, can like eat stuff just by touching it. <laughs> and his Santana almost does that to him, but he's saved because he still has like that latent human energy that he inherited from Jonathan, like flowing through him. So it's not enough. So then a uh, big fight breaks out. Uh, Jojo uh, shit happens. Stroheim jumps in with like a grenade and he blows, he like heroic sacrifice. He's a Nazi, by the way. Stroheim's a Nazi, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Stroheim, Stroheim blows himself up. Take like, like blowing him. He's, he's dead. He's fucked. He's dead. He's fucked. And like, and Santana splits into pieces. And then Jojo's like, he's like, shit, uh, he grabs a piece, throws it out into the sunlight, and it turns into stone. It doesn't disintegrate or anything, just stone. So he was like, all right, close enough. He throws all the chunks out into the sunlight. And then he's like, yo, Speedwagon, what the fuck is going on? And it was like, don't worry, there's someone, we gotta go to Italy. There's someone I want you to meet. Italy? Italy. Yeah. Italy. Well, Rome, Rome's in Italy, right? Rome's in Italy. <laughs> Don't worry. <coughs> that always fucks me up too. Rome doesn't seem like <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of fucking Italians in the show. Like, I just realized. Yeah, the vibes yeah. aren't right. Okay, so once in Rome, Jojo meets up with a man by the name of Caesar Antonio Zappelli. Whoa! The grandson of William Antonio Whoa. Zappelli. And like they don't hit it off because Caesar fucking hates Jojo because he blames Jonathan's incompetence for his grandfather's death in Phantom Blood. So they're kind of like on bad blood right now. But Jojo, Jojo's like, well, man, fuck you too. So and so there's like a whole scene. They fight in a restaurant. There's like spaghetti involved. <laughs> there's like common infused spaghetti. Bubbles get thrown at some point. It's wild. Uh, but anyway, meanwhile, the Pillarmen are being held by Nazis underneath the Coliseum and are on the verge of waking up. So Jojo and Caesar get their shit together. They come just in time to watch the Pillar Men wake up. They like burst out of the wall and it's like these Aztec like fitness gods and like thongs and shit. And they like strike, <laughs> they like strike a pose and it's like, oh no, it's, it's the Pillar Men. You want to play the Pillar Men theme right here in the video? Oh yeah, please. Holy <laughs> fuck, please play the as Pillar Men theme right, right here. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, we see. Do you see them like just start flexing on everyone else? With Literally. like one of the pillar men, uh, like he just uses his superhuman speed to run around all like the Nazi guards surrounding them, and he like fuses their hands together. <laughs> then he runs to the other end and like just starts sucking the blood of one guy. But because they're all fused together now, it's like a big Capri Sun chain, like, <laughs> leaving their body as they just deflate and shit. Rolling. Are you gonna explain how they got out of this stone? Because they had like lights on them and stuff. Yeah, they had like light. I, I don't. I forgot. This. Okay, okay, I know how this works. They had like well, they, they had UV. They had UV. Okay, so they have like UV lights on them, right? Because like it's sun, sun energy, sun beats the shit, right? And so in order to beat them, the moment they break out of the pillar, they just kill like ev all everyone in front of them, and it just spatters blood all over yeah, the UV yeah. lights, so they can't hit them, and they just like walk over and do this shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we find so here we learn the names of the three pillar men. We got Wamu, we got Essi Desi, and we have Cars. Yeah. Wamu, Essi Desi, and Cars. So, Wham, AC Daisy, and a band named the Cars. So yeah, those three. Wham. Wham. <laughs> yeah, Wham. Like. You know, wake me up before you go, go win. Imagine that yeah. while all this is going on. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, okay, so anyway, uh, Caesar's best Nazi friend is there named Mark. Remember Mark, 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 he's a Nazi, he's Caesar's best friend. He's a Nazi. It's like Mark Anthony. Kind of, kind of problematic, I don't know. Uh, so, so Mark is there, and Mark's like, he's like, oh man, I love serving my country, I can't wait to go back home and marry my girlfriend. Ooh, so anyway, uh, the, the pillar men are like walking, they're just walking menacingly, they're like, let's get out of here. They're like ignoring everyone else. They're walking, Mark's like, stop! And like, and then like, uh, who was it, Wamu, like just brushes up against them, but the act of brushing up against them like consumes half of Mark's body, so he's like literally split in half. Yeah. And he like starts bleeding out, screaming and shit, and Caesar, <laughs> <laughs> and 
and Caesar has to like mercy kill him with Hamid and shit. So Caesar's like, fuck this shit. They start a fight and quickly get their ass beat because like, duh. <laughs> so to save his ass, uh, Jojo tries to appeal to their inner dickhead, right? And he makes a bet that with one month of proper Hamid training, he can clap each and every one of them <laughs> if, they, if they let him go. Respectfully, of course. So Wamu, so Wamu's inner dickhead is touched. And so he agrees to let Jojo go and train on one condition. He like manifests a ring and then just like inserts it inside Joseph's heart. Or something like like a ring around his like aorta, around his heart. And like in one month's time, that ring will dissolve, releasing a poison that will kill Joseph. And to get to antidote, uh, Joseph would have to defeat him and take his nose ring, which has the antidote inside. So then, as he does, he's watching. He's like, "Yo, shit, let's go!" <laughs> so he makes his own ring and puts it <laughs> and puts it in, like around uh, Joseph's like windpipe. Same, same thing. Poison one is in one. the earring this time. It's in his nose ring. Or no, Wamu's nose ring. No, it's a lip ring. It's a lip, lip, ring. It's a lip, lip ring. ring. You're right. My bad. Yeah, Wamu has the lip ring. As he does, he has the nose ring. But whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're so right. they're like, "Yo, Car, you want to get in on this shit?" And Car's like, "You fucking idiots. We gotta go." <laughs> 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 we don't have time for this shit. <laughs> So they go, and like Caesar notices like Jojo's tenacity, and he's like, all right, all right, all right. You're cool, I guess. Like, I can help you out. So they travel to Venice to meet up with Caesar's homo master, a woman by the name of Lisa Lisa. Fun fact, the character Lisa Lisa went on to be the inspiration for the character Rose in the Street Fighter series. Whoa. Yo! So yeah, there you go. I actually didn't know that that's me neither. I did <laughs> Rose from Doctor Who. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, they meet up with Rose. She teaches them proper Haman technique by like throwing them in a pit and making them climb up like a grease slick pole using like the Haman surface tension shit I mentioned before. So yeah, after that happens, she like explains what Cars is really after. So Cars is after an object known as the Redstone of Aja, specifically like a flawless version of it that has the power to like amplify sunlight to like the hundredth degree. She demonstrates this by like holding it up to the sun and then like a laser beam just comes out the other side as the sunlight's just magnified that much. So he, so he's like, shit, can't let him get that. <laughs> so we find out that Cars wants it because he plans to combine it with a stone mask, like put it in the stone mask, put it on, and then become the ultimate life form. So that's bad news. We can't have that. Oh, and also, uh, shit, I have it here, original use of the mask. So the original use of the mask were created by, like, the same race cars as, like, the pillar people or whatever <laughs> as a means to create vampires and then feed on the vampires. Nice. So, yeah, it's heavily implied that that Aztec tribe from the very beginning disappeared because they all got, like, eaten by the pillar people. Damn. That's crazy. Okay. We don't call them pillar people anymore. No. Well, keep an eye, and if it turns off, just let me know. Okay, I will. We started. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, now with, uh, there's like a little time jump, and now there's like one week away until the month deadline, and Jojo just fucking dies. So uh, Lisa Lisa sends Jojo and Caesar to fight off for assistance. Mass like, what was, what was your name? Something in logins. I forgot. Whatever. Uh, so, oh, fight um... Yeah, I don't remember either, but yeah. Yeah, fight, fight <laughs> those two as their final test. But as Jojo arrives at, like, the Coliseum to fight uh, Loggins, I think, he finds that Loggins was already murdered by Essie Desi, who's been waiting there for him because he just couldn't help himself. So, so quick fight breaks out. Uh, Essie Desi, he's, like, he's using, like, freely manipulating his veins. They, like, burst out of his body like tentacles, and he, like, shoots scalding hot blood everywhere. That's a whole thing. It's, it sucks. But eventually... <laughs> Uh, Jojo does manage to big brain him and destroys his body. I say his body because his brain and brainstem are still fully intact and he's able to like walk around and shit. It's just like a brain and eyeballs and shit. <laughs> so, so he uses that. So he's in like brain mode. He infiltrates the island and like he finds uh, Lisa Lisa's assistant, a girl, a girl named Susie Q. And like he kind of like latches onto her back and starts puppeting her body around, and he uses that body to like grab the redstone of Aja, and then he fucking like mails it somewhere. He like heads out to the post office and like mails it out. 
Meanwhile, uh, Jojo and Caesar burst in and they're like, shit, get off of her weirdo veins. They they fight, they kill him. And then Susie Q's like, wow, Jojo, you saved my life. You're so hot, hot. <laughs> so, so we find out from Susie Q, because uh, she was like conscious during all of that. So she finds out that uh, Essie Desi made her ship the Redstone all the way to Switzerland. So they head out to the Swiss border where they come across like some Nazi leader who like recognizes them, even mm. though they haven't seen him a day in their life. And they do this under a week. Uh, yeah, yeah, or a day. <laughs> a day. <laughs> like, like, whatever. No, no, <laughs> yeah, that, it's unimportant. Time is not that relevant in the early parts. But, uh, so, uh, uh, this mysterious Nazi leader invites them to his cabin where they're just hanging out, I guess, and they accept for some reason. So now Jojo and the gang are just hanging out with Nazis in Swiss, in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, when suddenly, uh, Cars just shows up and he, like, uses, like, these, like, bone blades that come out of his arm to, like, literally cut the house in half and it, he, like, cuts it in half from, like, like this level, so like it blows the literal roof off the place. Everyone's dying and shit. So the Nazi leader reveals himself to be none other than Stroheim, who has been rebuilt with German engineering, and he's now a cyborg now. So he like strikes a funny little pose, and like his abdomen opens up to reveal a Tommy gun, and it starts firing everywhere. And he's like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Who is he again? The guy. The, the guy. The guy from the who blew himself up to stop to him. kill Santana. Yeah. Got it. So meanwhile, that's happening. The redstone goes flying. It's, it's teetering on a cliff. Cars and Jojo go for it, but Jojo's smart. Cars is, is also very smart, smarter than Jojo, really. But he doesn't get the stone, and he goes falling down into the cliff. But he's fine because he's built different. Uh, and yeah, that's that's the end of that. So the next day, we find out that the Pillarmen are taking up residency in a nearby hotel they cleared out. And Caesar wants to ambush them, like get the jump, because it's like day right now. And they have the advantage if they like keep the fight outside. And everyone's like, no, that's clearly a fucking trap. But, so, but Caesar's like, see, this is why my grandfather died. And then he left. <laughs> so what the fuck is up with Caesar? Jojo's wondering what the fuck is up with Caesar. Lisa Lisa arrives and explains his tragic past. So, uh, so Caesar's deal is that uh, his father Mario Zappelli, his father Mario Zappelli, uh, just one day up and left, and he's to go fight vampires and shit. But he saw that as his fam as his father just abandoning him, and his mother recently died, forcing him to take care of like his eight siblings by himself while he's still a child. But he so time passes. He eventually like reunites with his father and he like plans to kill him but then like his father doesn't recognize him because it's been like over a decade and stuff and he like pushes him out the way because he's a, they're like right in front of like the giant pillar with the pillar man inside and like tentacle shootout and like try to grab caesar but his father pushes him out the way despite not knowing who caesar was and like he gets dragged inside the pillar and eaten so uh, inspired by his father's like touching act and sacrifice and shit and realizing what he left to do, Caesar decides to take up Hallman and start fighting vampires and shit. Blah, blah, blah. So that's his backstory. Uh, Joe what about his eight siblings? <laughs> the Zappellis. Part five. I'm joking. I'm joking. I mean, I guess they're used to that be fucking wild. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so anyway, uh, Jojo, upon hearing Caesar's tragic past, decides to give Caesar another shot and goes to rescue him before he gets himself killed. <laughs> uh, with, so, uh, meanwhile, Caesar's pan is falling apart because it was indeed a trap. Who knew? And Wamu, uh, it's just Wamu there. It's not the rest of the pillman, just Wamu there. And like, Caesar's like, Caesar doesn't even have like the sunlight to work with because Wamu is able to control the wind right so right now wamu is like gathering moisture in the air and surrounding it around himself to create like a barrier that reflects sunlight away so he's just walking around and this also makes him invisible because it's reflecting light 
So you have like this invisible, immortal Aztec vampire god walking around, <laughs> and Caesar's trying to fight them. Things will not. Things, things don't go well. Doesn't it also like make him invisible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you just, just said that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. Yeah. So <laughs> eventually, a fight time. breaks out, but Caesar uh, manages to fight back because he uses a modified version of Haman. Like, like I don't, I forgot the exact explanation for it, but he has like soap sewn in. It. <laughs> Soap. He has like sewn soap. in his clothes. He has like soap sewn into soap. his clothes. So when he uses Haman and shit, soap. it like creates Haman infused bubbles. And he uses those. He uses the Haman to like. <laughs> <laughs> he uses the Haman to like control the bubbles, and they turn in like little like they start spinning and shit, and they turn in like little razor blades, and he like sends them flying at people. And shit. The rambling. It's, it's really. It's really. <laughs> Imagine pitching this he stuff. Shoots, and he shoots the fucking bubbles. <laughs> it's really. It's, 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 no, he's his magic energy. He is so stoned into his clothes. <laughs> so okay, okay. bubble spin. Okay, so anyway, uh, using this Haman bubble technique, he's actually able to like stand a fighting chance against Wamu. So Wamu decides to take the fight into the hotel, and Caesar follows him like a dickhead. <laughs> So now Caesar they're fighting a bit, Caesar, but Caesar's still holding his own because he still's got like the bubbles, he's like zoning them the fuck out, Wami's getting kind of pissed. And so uh, <laughs> for his big, big boy attack, uh, Caesar channels up like a bunch of Haman bubbles and like uses them as lenses to reflect sunlight coming in through a crack in the ceiling. And as the sunlight jumps from bubble to bubble, it gets stronger and stronger until it eventually hits Wamu and it pins him down, turning him into stone. Caesar sees it as his chance to run in. He jumps in for a final strike, but as he jumps in, his body blocks the sunlight for a fraction of a second, giving Wamu the chance to like reanimate and like hit him point blank with like this giant like divine sand divine sand so that's sandstorm. what it's called the rude sandstorm the rude sandstorm <laughs> <laughs> And like this, like absolutely shreds Caesar. Like Caesar is fucked up. He's he's not making it out of this. So uh, so Caesar, uh, and remembering JoJo's act of defiance earlier on, decides to like show off on his own account. And he like takes his scarf off, imbues it with Haman, and then like puts it in like a Haman infused bubble created out of his own blood. Uh, he also grabbed the nose ring. From from Wamu too before yeah, I forgot to mention he grabs a nose ring, grabs his bandana, makes a humming bubble with the nose ring and the bandana inside, and like Jojo. chucks it outside for Jojo to fly when they. And it's the last of his humming. It's yeah, it's like it's this the is last the last of, of my humming, Jojo. Take, Take it. it from me. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Wamu's like, damn, that was, I'm like right here. I could just walk up and pop this bubble. But I respect you. And so Wamu leaves the <laughs> bubble as a sign of respect because Caesar really did like fight pretty good. He was pretty based in that fight. <laughs> Cesar. And, and he, so he lets, he lets him go. Let, lets him go. He, he just leaves Caesar to bleed out and shit. So, so then uh, a giant fucking cross-shaped chunk of debris is knocked loose from the ceiling and falls on Sealer, killing him instantly. Sealer? Caesar. 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 Caesar, killing him instantly, yeah. <laughs> what shape? Cross-shaped. Cross -shaped. It was cross Like the oh. Christian cross. Oh, okay. So, so Jojo and Lisa Lisa arrive and they find that, like, they're like, Caesar, where are you, Caesar? And they see, like, this cross-shaped rock. And then out of nowhere, like, blood starts trickling from underneath. And they're like, oh, no, it's that Tim, isn't it? Ah, uh, Caesar! <laughs> <laughs> Bro, if you knocked Caesar over the board, I would have cried. <laughs> So yeah, Jojo finds the bubble, takes all the Haman that, that Caesar left for him, takes the headband, and then he takes the nose ring, but he vows not to use it until he kills Wamu himself. So, uh, now we get to fight Wamu, they, they go to like some random ass arena, they start fighting Wamu. Uh, Jojo's trickery is like too big brain for Wamu to handle, so Wamu decides to gouge out his own eyes because they cannot be trusted when dealing with Jojo. <laughs> well, there's a bit more to it because they say like a fighter has like a trigger where they like do yeah. something to themselves to like activate their fighting and yeah, that's something. And for him, it's like, gouging out his own eyes. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that makes it make that much more sense. It does not. No, but he gouges <laughs> out his own eyes. Uh, so yeah, he's using like 
the wind and air pressure to like locate Sorry. Jojo when they're fighting and shit. So during like a big wind up of one of his attacks, he's like sucking in a bunch of air to like shoot at Jojo. Joseph takes Caesar's headband, lights it on fire and tosses it at him while he's sucking in the air. And then like he sucks it in and like explodes. <laughs> like how fucking like King the Dong. <laughs> He sucks it in, explodes, he and then Wamu, and Jojo's like, you know what, Wamu, you're pretty cool. <laughs> he, he takes the nose ring and finally uses it. So now that's two antidotes down, and now they're ready to go fight Cars. So uh, Lisa, Lisa, and Cars begin fighting, and then Cars uses like Cars, yeah, Cars. He's he, he's he's clapping Lisa, Lisa. He's like beating her ass and shit. So. Uh, he knocks her unconscious right when Jojo arrives and like tries using her as like a shield to like stall for time. And then he eventually, and then like for some reason, they now use this time to explain Jojo's like family lore and shit. So it's revealed that Lisa Lisa's husband was actually Joseph's father and he was killed by one of Dio's zombies troops during like World War One or whatever. And she. Oh, so Dio's still around? No, no, like just like remnants of like a zombie. Yeah. Right. So, uh, fear, fear, fear. <laughs> okay, so uh, to take revenge, Lisa Lisa goes and kills this like zombie that's posing as an officer. But because she killed like an officer, she has to go into hiding and change her name from Elizabeth Joe Star to just Lisa Lisa. So, yeah, so Lisa Lisa is Joseph's mother. And Lisa Lisa is the person training Caesar and Haman. Uh, yeah. She was. And Joseph. She was. Also, also it's revealed that Lisa Lisa was the baby that Aaron rescued at the end of her. Yeah. yeah. So. Got it. Oh, so our Jojo isn't technically connected by blood to the Joe Star family. No, he's, he's... No, he is. Yeah, he is. Lisa, yeah, Lisa and George Joe Star. They just, like, skipped the generation. Married. Yeah, George... Lisa Lisa married George Joe Star, like, their unborn son. Like, like he named. Wait, so they were basically siblings? And no, they're, they're not. No, 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 no because I think Erza gave Lisa Lisa to over to Sprite Soda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then they eventually like found each other again. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> oh my god! Imagine though. <laughs> Weird. All right. Continue. So, but so yeah, uh, Cars has the Scars manages to grab the mask. He has the redstone of Aja. All he oh, needs fuck. is like direct sunlight to activate it. So, so the Nazis don't know any of this. They pull it with like the UV lights. So like, ah, we got this bitch now. <laughs> and I was like, stop, wait. So they turn on the UV lights to like trap cars. But cars looks up with the mask. The UV light <sighs> like reacts with like the redstone of Aja in the mask, and it starts like glowing and shit. He starts like moaning and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> And now Cars has become the ultimate life form. And as the ultimate life form, he's able to like shape shift into any living thing. Like he turns also, his, he turns his hand into like a squirrel and sets it loose, and the squirrel just starts biting people and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I have like, we have, like infinite yeah. power, and that's the. First he also thing is immune to sunlight now. Oh yeah, he's yeah. immune. He to cannot turn to stone now. He's not. He's not a Pillarman anymore. He's, he's the he's, ultimate life form. So all the, the weaknesses a Pillarman has, he doesn't <laughs> have. So yeah. he has no weaknesses. Yeah, he's that guy. He's become that guy. <laughs> You're not that guy. You're not cars. So uh, shit hits the fan, and Jojo just starts running for his life because he's like, "Fuck this!" Shit. Run the Joe Star family technique. Spooky. Running away. Running away. Uh, so, uh, but cars are managed to. Man eventually manages to catch up and like there's like a dog fight in a plane or something they're like flying around shooting each other yeah, he just like jumps off a cliff and there's a fucking like plane yeah yeah <laughs> like, the, yeah so just cars, plane now. cars shoots like a bunch of piranhas at, at jojo in the plane and like it causes the plane to crash into the side of volcano they fight in the volcano for a bit like they're like it's like a dormant volcano and like they're fighting for a bit Jojo's pinned now, and like he's like, "Oh, I got you now, Jojo. I'm gonna kill you." <laughs> and then like the the narrator now the narrator jumps in, and the narrator is like, "Jojo doesn't know why, but for some reason, maybe it was the will to live. He lifted up the red stone of Aja. So Jojo lifts up the red stone of Aja." It reacts to the sunlight, it shoots a beam down into the volcano, which wakes the volcano up, and it erupts. 
while wow. they're on it. Yeah, like the little like stone cap that forms on it is now launched up into space. And Jojo's like, in the, what? Wait, into space? Into, into space. space. Into space. <laughs> and you're like, what the f and Carlos like, ah, oh, Jojo, you're so smart. Ooh. But you'll never see this coming. And then earlier in the fight, I forgot to mention, earlier in the fight, Cars cut off one of Jojo's arms and shit. So now, out of fucking nowhere, Jojo's severed arm just flies up and like grabs cars by the neck oh. and like pushes him further into space until he can no longer control himself and he's just drifting away. So cars keeps drifting and drifting until he eventually stops thinking, and that's the end of cars. Yeah. So He's just uh, what happened to Joseph, Ed? Uh, Joseph unfortunately died in the eruption. No! And it's, it's, it's fucked. So, uh. Well, he reached a space. That should kill him. Yeah, him. like, yeah, no shit. So, uh, a little time skip. Weeks later, Erina, Lisa, Lisa, uh, the remaining, uh, training assistant that didn't got die, his name is Mesita. It didn't got die. <laughs> Smokey and Speedwagon are all like having a little funeral for Jojo. When a car pulls up and all out walks Jojo, and he's like, what the fuck, <laughs> So it turns out, uh, after being blown in the fucking space, Jojo crash landed somewhere near Italy, was fished out of the ocean by a fisherman. There he met up Su with Susie Q, married Susie Q, and was like, all right, Susie, tell everyone I'm alive. I'm heading back to the States. Oh, but, Joseph, Susie Q so but Susie Q forgot, because she's kind of ditzy like that. <laughs> so she left everyone to think that Joseph was dead, and they had a funeral, which he pulled up. He pulled up to his own funeral. This is that you lose? He's so fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do that one day. And that's the end of part two. And then, like, the epilogue, we they get, we get like, a, like, where are they now moment. So Lisa Lisa revealed that she was Joseph's mother to Joseph and then moved to America and married a Hollywood screenwriter, I guess. <laughs> Erina Joestar continued her work as a school teacher, and then she died in, like, the 50s. Uh, Speedwagon continued running the Speedwagon Foundation. Then he died of a heart he attack. He died of virgin. He, he died of virgin also. Uh, do they make Do they make a specific note of that? They, they uh, say he, he died of never married. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, uh, whatever. He anyway, died of virgin. Uh, despite the discrimination <laughs> yeah. he faced as an African American, Smokey Brown went on to become a major political figure in college, and then soon became the first black mayor of New of a city in Georgia. So. Smokey! Major Rudolf von Stroheim, the Nazi, he died in Stalingrad. Yeah! No Nazis make it out, baby! Yeah. Alright, so Major Rudolf von Stroheim was killed leading the German retreat at the Battle of Stalingrad in 1943. No. So there you have it, no Nazis made it out alive. Yeah. Whoa! Common or Rocky W. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we cut to 48 years later, and we see an aged up Joseph as he's like at JFK International Airport, and like a Japanese man's walking by and like accidentally bumps into him. So Joseph responds by kicking him in the shins, <laughs> and then proceeding to talk about how much he hates the Japanese. <laughs> Is this how the Japanese see us? Huh? Is this how the Japanese see it? <laughs> <laughs> it's just jokes. It's just racist now. And he, he explains that uh, that he, the reason he hates the Japanese so much is that his daughter that he had with Susie Q married a Japanese musician, moved to moved to Japan, and never came back. So now, so now he's uh, after getting a call from Susie Q for the first time in like years. Uh, something wrong with his grandson or, or whatever, he's off to Japan to investigate. And that's and the last thing we see of Joseph is him getting on a plane bound for Japan. So cut to Japan and we see a strange man sitting alone in a prison cell. Ooh. And that's the end of part two.
Ooh. Well, if he can't take one Japanese person to airport, what does he even do? <laughs> he just gets on. He just has <laughs> a, 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 a fucking seizure. <laughs> oh my he, just, he just, he just, start, he just starts harmoning He's things. like fucking frothing at the mouth. Oh, the my dry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was part two, and now we move on to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, part three. I can't Parody remember. Oh, wait, what? What was the name of part two? Uh, Battle Tendency. Got it. And part three is called? Uh, part three, when it first started publication, was originally called Heritage for the Future. What? But was later renamed by Iraqi into Stardust Crusaders. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. that. Yeah, yeah, we're learning. Stardust Crusaders. <laughs> uh, okay, so Stardust Crusaders begins. Uh, the year is now 1983. That's tough. And uh, somewhere near the Canary Islands, there's like a trio of treasure hunters, right? And they're like going around scuba diving into the ocean, pulling up cool shit to sell. So one of them, uh, after being down for quite a bit, he comes back up with a coffin with the word Dio plastered on the front. <laughs> and like this is around night. So they open up the coffin and then like a few days later, the ship is found. No one's on board and the coffin is empty. Dun, dun, dun. I wonder what was in so, it. So, cut a few years. It, the year is now 1988, and we are in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we see this lady, <coughs> Holly Kujo, the, the daughter of Joseph Joestar and Susie Q, and she's on her way to visit her son, uh, who's uh, been arrested, apparently. He's, like, in jail for, like, beating up four people and shit. But the reason she was called in specifically is that uh, her her son, uh, like, refuses to leave. Like, they're like, all right, kid, you served your sentence, get out of here. But he says he won't leave because he's possessed by a, by an evil spirit. And he doesn't want this evil <coughs> spirit to go around attacking anyone else, even though he just beat the shit out of four other people, and that's why he's in prison. Fuck it. <laughs> so, so uh, we soon find... So Holly makes it into the containment area, and we see this man... And we see, we see none other than Jotaro Kujo, our Jojo for the part. And jo and they're like, whatever, man, what evil spirit? So he demonstrates this evil spirit by stealing, by using it to steal a gun from a guard. We see, like, a transparent hand reach out of him, grab the gun from a guard, and, like, rip it off the chain it's on. And then he holds the gun up to himself and fires. And, like, the bullet just stops. And we see like a hand like holding the bullet. So everyone's like, so only, okay, also the only person that can see like the hand is Holly, by the way. Holly? Yeah. How, Holly. How, his mom. His Got mom. It. So JoJo says like, and that's why he's staying in here. So uh, that's when she calls for Joseph to come and help with her son because there's some weird shit going on. So Joseph boards a plane to Japan flies all the way to Japan with one of his friends, Muhammad Abdul, and they go to the police station and they're trying to like explain to Jojo what's really going on. So Abdul reveals that the spirit is actually a thing known as a stand. <laughs> Spirit is always standing by your side. <laughs> okay, so what is a stand? A stand is that. basically a sort of mm, like a manifestation mm -hmm. of a person's like life force and like mental psyche into like a sort of metaphysical being that stands beside them, hence the name. <coughs> <Your> stands. Fuck <coughs> Hamon. <coughs> Fuck Hamon, by the way. Hamon's <laughs> gone. Hamon's gone. Hamon's gone. All right. So, uh, so uh, Abdul uses this as a chance to reveal his own stand named Magician's Red. And Magician's Red is like, like a fiery guy. He's like shirtless. He's got the parachute pan on. And it's a bird. And he has a bird head. He looks like a flying man from Earthbound. Yeah! Watch the Earthbound lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he uses, he summons forth his Magician's Red. It uses its like pyrokinesis. To like pin Jotaro against a wall with like these flames, but the flames aren't burning because it's stand flames. Ooh. Meanwhile, uh, no one. Okay, okay. So basic rules about stands. Uh, number one, only stand users can see other stands. So while Jotaro is being like pinned against the wall by like this 
beefy bird man, the cops that are watching are just seeing Jotaro just like hanging out on the wall and it's suddenly like 10 degrees warmer. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, another rule, uh, only stands can interact with other stands. That's why ghost-type Pokemon are super effective against ghost-type Pokemon. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> Would that be not very effective as well, then? Anyway. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so yeah, this is going on. So Abdul's like, yeah, this is a stand. You're not possessed, you dumbass. You got a stand ability now. Uh... And Does Joseph, jo the old Jojo know anything about this? Yes, because Joseph also recently manifested his own stand, which he named Hermit Purple. And Hermit Purple, it's not like a humanoid sort of stand. It's like takes the shape of vines growing out of his hand, and he can like like use purple the vine. vines. Yeah, he's Indiana vines Jones. Like a whip. He's, he's Indiana Jones essentially. Got it. it sounds like it's you know, it, it can also do something else. Yeah, what are the, I mean, like they can't. Yeah. Oh yeah, it can do other stuff. No, yeah, yeah, but yeah, there's lots of similarities between like stands and tulpas. So yeah. My Little Pony tulpa. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those. <laughs> you gross. But yeah, bonus points. Good comparison. Uh, so yeah, Joseph reveals his stand, Hermit Purple, and he's. Oh God, what the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking like a little Croy ad. Like a bunch of snot just like flew down my throat. Nice. Uh, so yeah. They're at a restaurant now. Okay, so yeah, he says that uh, the reason that you recently manifested a stand, as well as Joseph, is that someone else in your family further down the line manifested a stand. So they're like, who the fuck is it? So Joseph's like, I'll show you. So Joseph uses Hermit Purple with like, hom does he use Hamanu? No. no, he just uses Hermit Purple and okay, Karate yeah. Chops a camera. Yeah, like he pulls out it. like this expensive ass camera, he summons Hermit Purple around his hand and like chops the camera in half, destroying it, but in the process it produces a photo of none other than Dio. Dun dun dun! But not only that, there's something really off because in this photo it's like a picture of like Dio's back with Dio looking back at it, and it's like like, oh uh, shit, I didn't even mention this. It's the like, Joe Star I didn't birthmark. Even, but yeah, all the Joe Stars, all the main JoJo's, they have like a star shaped birthmark on their back. Mm -hmm. And like on Dio, on Dio's back, despite being like a Brando, he also has the star shaped birthmark. And Joseph reveals that Dio from the neck down is actually using Jonathan's body. So he Damn. succeeded at the end of part one. We just didn't see it. But, 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 Ed, how did he survive the explosion in the ship? He's a vampire, he's a, he's a vampire and he hopped in the car. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> so, yeah, Dio uh, managed to acquire a stand, and that awakened the stands of everyone else, and I mean everyone else, in the Joestar family. So, as, like, a response to sort of, like, hey, cut this out. So, yeah. Uh, Joe Duro is kind of like, whatever, man, you're full of shit. And, like, goes about being, like, a delinquent. So he goes to school the next day where he runs into uh, a man, a, another student, exchange student named Noriaki Kakyoin. Yeah. Kakyoin. So <laughs> he's Japanese? We're in yes. Japan now. Yeah. We've been in Japan. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh... So Kakuin stalks Joe Jotaro for a bit and reveals himself to be an assassin sent by Dio to kill those of the Joestar bloodline. So Kakuin manifests his stand, Hierophant Green, to attack Jotaro. Hierophant Green, it's like 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 a green dude. He has tentacles. He, yeah. he looks like a Ben Tan alien. Yeah, 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 yeah. He does. Yeah, he kind of looks like a Ben Tan. He looks like Goop. Goop. <laughs> yeah, that Ben Tan alien. SCP nine nine nine. Oh my god. But yeah, he uses Hierophant <laughs> Green to like attack Joseph and Joseph's not Joseph, Jotaro. Jotaro's like, oh shit, uh my stand they they fight. <laughs> uh Kakun gets the shit beat out of him because Jotaro's stand is just nuts, like insane. Punch it's, goes. Punch it's, he goes. It's it's the punch ghost. It's the punch ghost. It's just a guy that punches really hard and really fast. That's its special power. There's other things, but we can, we can. <laughs> No, that's literally it. That is literally it. No, there's like, there's like, oh, oh, there is literally it. Uh, okay, okay, so anyway, uh, 
So after beating Kakuin, Jotaro realizes that he was actually brainwashed and being controlled by Dio even now because Dio placed like a piece of his own flesh and had it like drilled into his forehead. And that's what's causing Kakuin to attack him and other members of the Joestar bloodline. So they take him back and they use uh, Jotaro's stand, which uh, Abdul named Star Platinum. And like Star Platinum, aside from being really fucking strong, just hitting shit, it's also said to be extremely precise. So they decide it's the best to like use that stand to like take the like rip the flesh bud out of Kakuin's head. Every time you think JoJo can't get more anime, it surprises you. <laughs> no, that's the whole point. Yeah, it just gets worse. <laughs> so, so, so how do they come up with the names of the stands? Oh, okay, so they come up with the thank you. They come up with the names for the stands because Abdul is a fortune teller. So he like takes a look at a person and like what color their stand is and then assigns them a tarot card based on their personality. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got like Hermit Purple, Magician's Red, Star Platinum, Hierophant Green. Hierophant Green and mm -hmm. shit like that. Wait, what's the Hierophant card? Like a guy he sees there. <laughs> I mean, there is a higher fan card. I can't tell you what it means. <laughs> I I think it's like desire. Or whatever. And this is the naming convention for stands for the first half of part three. So, uh, so eventually, uh, they break Dio's hold on Kakuin, and they're like, "Oh man, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I, me and my family went to Egypt one day, and like, I met this really hot guy, and then he brainwashed." <laughs> it's like, "Ooh, you so sexy, ooh." And then Abdul was like, I've had the same encounter with Dio. I was walking okay. around my home and I saw this really hot guy, but he was super evil and I had to run away, but I couldn't tear my eyes off of him because he was so beautiful and attractive. Actual words from Actual the show. Words. <laughs> <laughs> from the show. Like everyone's hot in this show. <laughs> so, Jackson. Jackson. A hierophant is a person who brings religious congregants into the presence of that which is deemed holy. As such, a hierophant is an interpreter of sacred mysteries and arcane principles. It's some guy. <laughs> Some guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyway, so uh, using the info they got, they're like, okay, so Dio's in Egypt. Where in Egypt is he? So they pull up the photo that Joseph made with his stand, and they're like, Joe Taro's like, wait a second. So another thing Star Platinum is doing is that it has really good eyesight. So it's like <laughs> able to like take a close, close look at the photo J Joseph took. No, oh, Tyler? No, no. Uh, take a close look at the photo of Joseph look and it notices a fly in the like Whoa. a grainy little fly in the photo so they give those Dan like a pencil and paper and it starts sketching out this fly in great detail to which Joseph replies wait a second I know this species of fly <laughs> <laughs> it's only found in this specific town in Egypt so Cairo? Of, in Cairo Egypt so because of a fly Dio got doxxed <laughs> <laughs> really impolite of Joseph to dox Dio like that. Cancelled. So, so they're like, okay, we gotta head to Egypt. And Jotaro, meanwhile, is like, whatever, man, this is dumb. This is, you're, you're all dumb, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Until one day, uh, Jotaro realizes his mommy didn't give him his good morning kisses. <laughs> and so something's wrong. <laughs> and it turns out... <laughs> <laughs> Something is wrong, and Holly was trying to put on a brave fun, but she also began manifesting her stand. But it's starting to kill her because, as Abdul puts it, like stand users require like a certain amount of willpower to be able to properly wield and control their stand. And women just don't have it. Well, Holly doesn't. Well, Holly doesn't. But but <laughs> so as a result, Holly stand is like more like a sickness that's just slowly draining the life out of her body. And she's like, her stand manifests as like similar vines as Joseph's, but it's like green with like roses and shit, like you know. So yeah, so Jotaro finally con so finally convinced because his mommy is sick <laughs> to head out to Egypt with the gang. So the gang sets out to Egypt, and so they head out to the airport. They board a plane and they fly to Egypt. Ba da 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 da. So on the plane, uh, they're immediately attacked by one of Dio's assassins wielding his own stand, Tower of Grey, and Tower of Grey is just like a beetle that flies around and like bites you and shit, that's, that's it. <laughs> but it's enough to cause the plane to crash. So, so they opt like public transportation <laughs> is a no-go because they don't know, 
because of the nature of scans, literally anybody could just start trying to kill them at any given moment. And they want to like lower the risk of like collateral damage, like anyone else bystanders getting hurt. So they opt to just like hike it to Egypt the long way. From Japan? From Japan. Okay. Well, Wait. but the plane crashed. The plane crashes in Hong Kong. There. Oh, yeah. okay. They they walk from Hong Kong to. They like hitch. They like ride a bus or like. Well, not like, ride a bus, but they'll like call a taxi. Call something. taxis, ride buses, camels at one point. Ride camels and shit. Like, I mean, they're fucking rich. They're they're just hyped. Yeah. 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 <laughs> at one point, they commission some. Not commission, but they get a submarine. You know. Yeah. <laughs> because of course. So after so. We done joke. No. No, that wasn't a joke. <laughs> we'll so the plane is a bus, and they decide since they're in Hong Kong, let's get some good old fashioned Chinese food. So they head to a restaurant, and they're chilling now, talking about like, "Oh man, we gotta look out. The stand user could be anybody." So uh, then this man with like a giant like <laughs> flat top, <laughs> like like this French dude flat top, he pulls up. He's like, "I've been sent by Dio to kill you guys," and he manifests his stand, silver chariot. How did he know to look for them in Hong Kong? Fuck it. <laughs> Dio, Dio, he still has like the Dio thing in him, so maybe that's it. I don't know. Go here. <laughs> Oh, so this man is revealed to be none other than Jean-Pierre Polnareff. And also, fun fact, uh, <laughs> uh, fun fact, Polnareff was also the visual reference, the visual inspiration for the character Guile from Street Fighter. Yeah! And when, when they were designing Guile, they were like, wouldn't it be funny if we took oh. Polnareff's flat top and just smushed <laughs> it down? And that stuck. Oh my god. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, how do I remember that? Polnareff, yeah. Polnareff uses his stand, Silver Chariot, and he challenges Abdul to a duel, so... <laughs> Abdul? Wait, I'm sorry, is Jean Pierre a dude? Yes. Yeah. He has massive tits. Yeah, he <laughs> does. That's every JoJo uh -huh. character. Yeah. Him specifically. Tits so are all fucking moved out. I didn't notice that, can I see it? <laughs> Go on. So, jo so uh, Paul Nerev and Abdul take it outside, and they have like a little stand battle. It's pretty sick. Ab Abdul, wait, what's up? Wait, what does Silver Chariot do? Oh, Silver Chariot. It takes the shape. It's a humanoid type stand, so it's like people shape, and it appears as like this like thin robot looking thing with like wearing like knight's armor and shit. And it uses like a rapier to attack. It has its own rapier, a sword. and it like engages in like sword fights and shit. So yeah, they two, the two of them take it outside, they fight, it's pretty sick. Uh, Paul Nerf gets his ass beat though, because Abdul's that guy. And they realize <laughs> that Ab they realize that Paul Nerf also has a flesh buzz, so they get Star Platinum to do his thing, take it out, and then they hear Paul Nerf's story. It turns out Paul Nerf, want so Paul Nerf wants to team up with them because they're looking for Dio, and Paul Nerf believes that Dio probably knows the guy who murdered his little sister. So this guy... Uh, he describes him as having like two right hands. Two right hands, and uh, when it was raining, when he first saw him, the rain just wouldn't touch him. So that's all Polnareff's going off of, no. I guess. Cut. So oh. that's Polnareff's reason for wanting to join the crew. It, it, it's super funny because in the anime, like, <laughs> like Polnareff was like, "Excuse me, Mr. Joe Star, but can I ask you a bizarre question?" They're like, mm, you said it. <laughs> okay, but yeah, anyway, so Polnareff joins the party, and now it's all of them, and they're heading out. So they're like, all right, uh, they decide to set sail from Hong Kong to Singapore. So they, like, Joe took- You're sitting on the dog. Oh, shit. <laughs> hey, Tyler. No, don't, you're, not, don't be a JoJo character, Tyler. Don't, don't be a JoJo Taylor. villain. He's the next Come deal. On, not your ass. ass. Okay, you won't move, I guess. Right. <laughs> okay, so anyway, <laughs> they, uh, so Joseph, I forgot to mention this, but Joseph at this point in his life is like fucking rich as hell. Because not only did he inherit all like the Joe Star money, but I think he got into real estate and is also yeah. making bank off of that. So he uses his money to just casually like rent like a, like a ship and crew to take them to Singapore. Yeah. So they, bo so they board the ship. And everything's fine, but uh, Jotaro finds like a stowaway girl on the ship. And to make matters worse, there's a stand user sent by Dio to kill them. 
So uh, we eventually find out the stand user is actually the captain of the ship. He was sus. He was imposter. <laughs> <laughs> He was imposter, and he was using his, and he's planning to use his stand, Dark Blue Moon, to kill them all. Dark Blue Moon, uh, Araki really loves horror and shit, so uh, the stand is basically creature from the Black Lagoon. Like, just think that. Yeah. So there's a quick battle. Jotaro ends up in the ocean fighting this fishman stand, uh, <laughs> but he beats the shit out of it. You know, like like he always does. Stop! Finger! Yeah. Shit, that was... <laughs> okay, so uh, Araki for some reason just gives. Jotaro star platinum random ass moves and he wins this fight by coming up with a move called star finger <laughs> Which is when he stretches he, his points and then like his two fingers like just stretch out like a little projectile <laughs> and stab fucking, it. Man, fucking yeah. How fast? What the hell is it doing from the Like a bullet? Like, like I guess. a bullet. Damn. Oh, uh, like Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh shit, another rule of stands I forgot to mention. Damage done to a stand is transferred back to the user. So when Jotaro like like stabbed this guy, like stabbed his stand like through the chin, the guy also got just through the head. And shit. So yeah. I know a fucking crazy toast. <laughs> <laughs> but in the ensuing fight, uh, I think the ship was actually destroyed by Dark Blue Moon, right? So they're like drifting for a bit, and yeah. then they come across yeah. uh, they come across like a giant empty freighter ship. And they're like, hey, it's free real estate. So they climb on the freighter ship, and the only living thing on it is this orangutan named Forever. <laughs> <laughs> so things start, shit starts popping off when, like, through a series of, like, mysterious accidents, like, the surviving members from, like, the previous ship start getting killed off. Like, out of nowhere, like, a crane, like, malfunctions and, like, swoops in and pales a guy and, like, lifts him up and everyone's, like, watching his corpse bleed out <laughs> and shit. They're like, oh, geez, what the fuck? So, it's that. So, long story short, uh, the orangutan, forever, is very sentient and it's actually Dan Schneider as it starts creeping on the small girl. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that all orangutans are sentient, you idiot. I mean, but this, I know, I know, There's but it's like... Have you ever met an orangutan? <laughs> yes. And proved its sentience? <laughs> you, you know what I mean. Yes. They're, they're, they're like, oh, it's just a monkey. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. But it, so it turns out the it turns out forever is actually a stand user, and its stand is the ship. <laughs> <laughs> and the stand's name is strength. Just strength. Yeah. After the the, the carrot card. Is, wait, who named the orangutan stand? I guess Dio's also naming stands. I guess. Fuck it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, strength. And like, because the ship is the stand, they're able, the uh, forever is able to like freely manipulate it. Like he like walks through walls and shit. He like bends pipes to like trap Jotaro. Yeah. But like Jotaro, he's Jotaro, so he beats the shit out of forever. And like the gang, the surviving gang, like all the other crew from the ship is essentially dead. They got like murdered on the stand ship. So it's just the main crew again. Mm -hmm. And as they like hop on a lifeboat and sail off, uh, they look back and see like the ship shrinking and shrinking until it becomes like a little dinghy with forever unconscious inside of it. So yeah, that's that. And so now the gang reaches Singapore, and they find the to wake up on a tiny ship in the middle of the ocean. I mean, he did it to himself. Yeah, fuck, so he's an fuck gorilla. That <laughs> orangutan was an asshole. Yeah. yeah. I would really hate to wake up and found that I sat on my own dinghy though. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the crew finally reach uh, Singapore, and uh, so they decide like, man, that shit was intense. Let's check into a hotel, rest up for a bit. So they all go into the hotel. They're like, "Hey, I'm gonna check out the lobby." They're like Poner's like, "Cool, I'll oh, we'll do something in the room." So they're hanging out, but he's suddenly ambushed by Devo the Cursed. <laughs> <laughs> he's ambushed by Devo the Cursed, and but Poner luckily uses his stand silver chariot to like wound the guy and like make a quick getaway. But that's just what Devo wanted because this stand, Ebony Devil feeds off of like hatred and shit like i forgot how it works but eventually like i think devo's own hatred for someone it yeah. feeds off of yeah yeah i think it's like revenge or some shit yeah it's like revenge stand. yeah it's revenge like it feeds it feeds off of the hatred he got from being wounded by Ponerv and like channels all that negative energy 
to the point where like the stand is able to possess like a little doll and the doll pulls out a knife and starts like attacking Polner with like Chucky style because you know Araki loves horror movies and shit. But Ara It sounds like he just got into them before writing the season. I mean it's yeah. the 80s so they're just coming out when yeah. he's writing this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, Polnareff, uh, he's Polnareff, he's pretty cool, he manages to beat the shit out of the doll, and because the stand is in the doll, it beats the shit out of the stand, because he's beating shit out of the stand, Devo gets a bunch of shit, like, holes poked in him, he dies, that's it. Oops. Yeah, uh, what else, what else, what else? Speed round, let's go! <laughs> there's there's a lot of sands. I just want to like lightning around these. Okay, guys. so meanwhile, while all this is going on in the hotel room, uh, Jotaro and Kakuin are hanging out when he notices Kakuin starting to act sus. And it turns out <laughs> Kakuin is imposter because he was actually replaced by someone. Uh, what's what's the guy's Yellow name? Temper. Oh, yeah. Rubber, Rubber Soul. Soul. Rubber Soul. Yeah, Rubber Soul and his stand, Yellow Temperance, which is like the blob, essentially. You know, the blob. Yeah. And Why he uses, is it called yellow temperance? It's like a yellow blob. Yeah, and the temperance is a tarot card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he uses yellow temperance to like get rid of Kakuin somewhere, shapeshift into him, and sort of like fuck with Jotaro for a bit. Like he tr like they're like looking over a ledge and he like physically pushes yeah. Jotaro. Jotaro flies over the ledge, uses Star Platinum to catch himself and pull himself back up. And then Kakuin, Kakuin is like, oh, it's just a prank, bro. And then he starts licking the cherry. All the JoJo fans just start. Like, wow, Jotaro, you're fucking sucking that shit. Fucking congregate of autistic people. Eventually, Jotaro sees through his bullshit and beats the shit out of Rubber Soul in a stand. And that's the end of that. So, uh... Okay, so, Rubber Soul, while being pummeled and, like, knocked out of, like, the Sky Rail car that they're in for some reason, he reveals that there's four more assassins on the way. Uh, yes. There's the stands Death, I mean, the, the tarot cards Death, Emperor, Hanged Man, and Empress. So, the, so uh, the thing about the Hanged Man stand user, it's actually revealed to be the person who murdered uh, Spolnerf's sister. So that's a whole thing. Who's the silver guy chariot. got it. The silver chariot, sword guy, dude with the big boobs. So the gang yeah. finally arrives in uh, India, and I think this is when the stowaway girl she disappears because she. Oh yeah, there was a stowaway girl with them this whole time, by the way. Yeah, because I mentioned with the yeah. Dan Harmon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan, Dan Schneider, not Dan, Dan Harmon. Dan Jesus. Schneider monkey. <laughs> I mean, fuck Dan Harmon too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so meanwhile, they're in India now. And uh, there's two assassins after them, the Emperor and, uh, no, a guy named Whole Horse, and then uh, the Hangman stand users, whose name is Jay Guile. So uh, Jay Guile no recognizes Polnareff and is like, ah, I killed your sister, and then he disappears inside of a mirror with his stand. So Polnareff is like, oh, that guy killed my sister, and Abdul's like, dude, relax, it's a trap. But he runs out anyway, and they start a fight when they run into Whole Horse, and Whole Horse... Uh, pulls out his stand, uh, the Emperor, and the Emperor is a gun. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally just a gun. Cut. Oh. Alright, so, uh, Whole Horse reveals his stand to be the Emperor, and the Emperor, for his stand, he wields a gun. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's a special gun, because he's able to, like, uh, control, freely control the trajectory of the bullets after he fires them. Yeah. They're like homing missiles. So he does this by like firing a few shots at a Polner who like dodged them because like he's like, ooh, you're shit, you're shit. And, <laughs> uh, fuck, what else was... Uh, yeah. So while this happens, uh, Abdul is like also like watching like nearby. And like Abdul's like, wait, no, Polner, look behind you. Because one of the bullets, uh, whole horse shot, actually like curved around the long way to like stall for time and was coming back to like beam bolt Polner in the back of the head. But luckily Abdul was there to like push him out the way and he like gets nailed in the head by one of the bullets. And then at the same time, uh, Hanged Man, Jay Guile activates his stand, Hanged Man. Hanged Man, by the way, uh, humanoid stand. It's like a really burnt up looking dude wrapped in bandages. 
And the way it works, its ability is that it's only able to interact with things through like reflections and mirrors and shit. So while the stand doesn't appear in like the physical space, it like appears in reflections and attacks that. So Tang Man's nearby in a nearby window and like after Abdul gets shot, like stabs him in the chest and then Abdul's dead, rip. And Paul Nareb's beating himself up because like he got caught up in his revenge and lost a friend because of it. So sad. They bury Abdul and move on. So they head to Vera Nasai, a joint, and they're joined by like some random girl. And on the way, uh, Joseph develops like a random boil on his arm, uh, and it's it's uh, 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 speed round. Uh, this boil is actually the Empress, and the girl Nina is the stand user for Empress. Empress like a boil that gradually grows and grows until hijacking the person's arm, and then like uses that arm to kill the person. I mean, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that happens, and they defeat Nina and the Empress, and they move on, they leave Veronisai, and yeah. Uh, so they're on the route to Pakistan, they meet another stowaway girl, I don't really remember her name, but they're being pursued now by a dude in a mysterious car that stalks them. They decide to like, you know what, let's go up this cliff, and the car drives up the cliff. The <laughs> <laughs> 70s right now. Yeah. 80s. 80s. Like in-universe? In-universe. Oh, yeah. And like in real life, because, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the car, so it's revealed that the car is a stand, and that stand is Wheel of Fortune. And the user is naturally the driver. So shit happens, they fight, Jodaro beats up the, the car and it beats up the <laughs> beats up the he car. beats up the car and it beats up the stand user. And then they like tie the stand user to a rock out in the middle of the desert and just leave him there. You get into one accident and you're just dead. I mean, well, it doesn't pretty get into accidents because it's a stand. It's a pretty tough car, though. So, so I like to imagine because people can't see stands that he's just sitting in the air. <laughs> I mean, it's the way which stands people can see or not, but I like to it's imagine a better that's stand. one of those they can't see. It's a better <laughs> stand than the fucking fly, okay? It's a step up from Tower of Grey. It yeah. Is. yeah. So, the crew make it to Pakistan. And, uh, psh, so they arrive in this weird town on their way to Karachi. And something's weird about the town because it's just covered in like this thick fog, right? And like all the townspeople are quiet and despondent and just wandering around aimlessly, kind of shambling around. So they're like, ooh, that's weird. So they check into a hotel where this woman named uh, Enya Guile appears. And it turns out that Enya Guile is actually Jay Guile's mother. And she's stepping in because she wants to. Wait, what? Ooh. <laughs> Jay Guile? The, oh, yeah, the, and, okay, long story short, man guy, uh, yeah. they run into Jay Guile again, Paul Nerf kills him. Yeah, so en, uh, Enya Guile uh, is now pissed because Paul Nerf killed her beloved baby boy, and now she <laughs> wants to kill Paul Nerf and the crew. But also, Whole Horse is there, because he's like, after getting like humiliated, he's like, fuck all this stand shit, I'm chilling. <laughs> For real. Yeah. So he checks into the hotel, and like, starts helping out Enya with like chores and shit before Enya tries to kill him also for uh for being like a shitty partner because Whole Horse teamed up with Jay Guile to kill them, but Jay Guile got killed, so she's gotta be it. Uh so she eventually turns on Whole Horse and reveals her stand, whose name was what? Justice, right? Justice, yeah. yeah. Ju Ju judgment. Judgment. No, judgment was the other one. No, you're right, no, it is justice. Yeah, yeah. this is justice. Okay, yeah. So justice is like a it's, it's a weird thing. It's like takes the shape of like a giant floating skull with like two hands yeah. and it's like covered in smoke and stuff. And its ability is that Justice sends the smoke into like open wounds, blows them up, like, like turns the wounds into like clear cut holes and then just starts puppeting a person around through that. And it's revealed that the, enti the reason the entire town is like covered in fog and people are acting so weird is because Enya already killed them and it's now just like puppeting around their corpses to like keep up the illusion and like lure them into the hotel. Mm -hmm. So that's fucked. Uh, but Joe's Jotaro manages to beat Justice by like sucking it. <laughs> oh yeah! He so, inhales yeah. Right. Justice. Yeah. Jotaro uses Star Platinum to inhale the stand because like, he's both in a lot. So he breathes in Justice and because of this, uh, Enya starts suffocating. 
<laughs> and then he just then uses that chance to like beat the shit out of her. Another quirky star platinum ability. Star platinum moment. Let's go. <laughs> star suck. Star power to breathe. Star suck. Star suck. Star 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 fucking star star Kirby. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so the group arrives in Karachi and they try to take the flesh bud out of Enya too, so to get her to talk, but before that. Uh, Enya is actually executed by another one of Dio's assassins, Steely Dan. <laughs> I've heard of him. The boy. Oh, yo. The JoJo character. <laughs> fucking the JoJo character or the musician? The musician. And the JoJo character. What? <laughs> no. I didn't know there was a Steely Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, Steely Dan reveals his stand, The Lovers. What The Lovers so is... It's like a, it's like a colony sort of stand. There's like multiple instances of it, and it's like these little crab-like guys that like shrink down, jump into your body, and like beat you up, like you know, you know, like that shit. And he gives you crabs. Omnosis Jones. But it's like brain crabs. Yeah, it's like awesome brain crabs. crabs. Essentially, yeah, brain crabs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is a really uh, tricky fight because uh, after killing Enya, he implants some of his stand inside Joseph. It, wait, was it Joseph, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. he plants some of his stand inside of Joseph and, like, holds Joseph hostage and essentially just makes Jotaro, like, make an idiot of himself for his own amusement. It's like, hey. It's like, oh, Jotaro, you know, if anything happens to me, I'll kill your grandfather. Uh, put yourself ar across that gap so I can walk across it. So Jotaro <laughs> has to suck up his pride and, like, prop himself over, like, a hole so Steely Dan can walk across him. And Steely Dan stops and starts, like, stomping on him. <laughs> <this shit. laughs> Why is he working for Steely Dan again? Uh, because Steely Dan has Joseph hostage with the lovers. His stand. He Got put it inside it. Yeah. Him. yeah. Joseph is Jotaro's grave. Meanwhile, uh, Kakuin and Paul Nerev, uh, shrink down their stands to go inside of Joseph's head and fight the lovers, because that's a thing stands can do in its only instance. <laughs> they, they ever do it. They never do it they again. They never do it again. But but it's, it's funny. It's like they os Osmosis Jones fight inside Joseph's head. Uh, eventually, they manage to defeat the lovers without like killing Joseph in the process. And they give Jotaro the okay. So Jotaro just stops everything he's doing and like beats the shit out of Steely Dan for a solid 30 seconds in the anime. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's like just mm -hmm. him getting beaten. It's nuts. Uh, so then he sends him flying through a wall. And yeah, that's the end of Steely Dan. So they're walking. So they're leaving. Where were they now? Karachi, right? Yeah. Karachi. <laughs> <laughs> they're in Asia. So they're in Karachi. Yeah, yeah, Pakistan, Karachi, whatever. So yeah, they're leaving uh, Pakistan now and moving over to uh, the United Arab Emirates. And to do that, they got to cross the desert. So right, so while they're crossing the desert, they're crossing it on Camelback, and they notice like there's something weird about the sun because it's still out and it's like 8 p.m. So this is not right. I mean, that's not that weird for. But not only that, it's super hot, and the sun's kind of like shooting beams at them. <laughs> the sun, this instance of the sun is a stand named the sun. <laughs> Wait, is that really what it's called? Yeah, yeah the sun. Oh my god, yeah! <laughs> so, so the heat gets too intense, and the stand becomes more and more stronger, like they're approaching. Oh yeah, another thing about stands, the closer the stand is to the user, the stronger it is, blah blah blah. So yeah, they notice the stand, use, the stand getting stronger and stronger, so they take cover, in like under a rock formation where it's like cool and shit and they wait it out but like 12 hours go by and nothing changes the sun is still out they try to move out it like blasts them now with like lasers and shit so they're like okay what do we do here so then Jotaro looks out and he notices a rock and then he notices a rock next to that rock but that rock is actually a reflection of the rock and it turns out the sun user is just sitting out there he set up like a bunch of mirrors <laughs> and he's just waiting with like a bunch of like AC units and like water coolers just waiting to just like cook them out. So Jotaro sees this, starts laughing and then just makes a dash for the guy, beats the shit out of him and that's the end of that. Well I thought he like shot him with a rock and then... Like, uh, yeah, I think he picks up head. a rock, uses star platinum to like flick it at the guy. And it's like it a nails bullet. It. Yeah, it's like a bullet and it like knocks him unconscious. Poor guy, that was a pretty smart plan. It was really smart. <laughs> so afterwards, the gang decides to uh, take, like to actually rest because it's now dark at like midnight or whatever. 
So they go to bed, uh, and night and uh, Kakuin finds himself trapped in a nightmare world with some weird clown man attacking him. <laughs> Wait, how did we get here? Uh, after asleep. they beat the sun, they decide to properly take a break. Take a break. He's asleep. So they go. They like make camp and go to bed Got for it. the night. He's in the nightmare world with a weird clown, and there's a theme park, and like the and like this clown attacks him. But right before uh, he Polnareff wakes him up. And Kakuin completely forgets about the dream. So, so uh, they're traveling across, and they meet like like some guy, and he has like a baby. They decide to like take the baby across the desert, whatever. Duh. Long story short, the baby is a stand user sent by Dio to <laughs> <laughs> assassinate them, and the baby stand is Death Thirteen. And how it works? It's like Freddy Krueger's people. Yeah. Like it waits for them to fall asleep, then the stand attacks the person while they're defenseless in the dream world. And then if you die in the dream, you die in real life. Ooh. And then how do we beat them? Uh, somehow Kakuin manages to like carve the phrase baby stand into his <laughs> arm. <laughs> because like he forgets the dream every time he wakes up. So he sees baby stand and he's like, oh, guys, the baby's a stand user. And they're like, whatever, bro. <laughs> so after convincing everyone the baby is in fact a stand user, they realize they can't beat the shit out of a baby. I mean, I so can't... instead, no, they... so instead they take the baby's shit out of its diaper, mix it into like its porridge, and feed it to it. Owned. Great. Owned. The baby. Fucking that's owned. The owned. Wait, just but that doesn't defeat the baby. I know, but they're like, if you actually, if you do anything again, we won't hesitate to just beat the shit out of you. That was a warning. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, uh, eventually the group makes it to the Red Sea. Uh, Joseph and Jotaro want to head out to an island because they have to inform Abdul's father of his passing. So sad. So Abdul's father is like, oh, you guys, ooh, I got pet chickens here, ooh. But Ponair <laughs> can't bring himself to face him because he's he feels uh, responsible for Abdul's death. So he goes and, like, soaks about in, like, a swamp somewhere. Okay. Meanwhile, he's visited by a genie who claims he could grant Abdul three, uh, not, what, not Abdul, Ponair three wishes. So naturally, Ponair wishes uh, for uh, his sister to come back to life. Uh, what was his other wish? Abdul to come back, right? Besides that. Uh, he brought to bring his sister back. And I don't think he had a third have, wish yet. I don't think he got the third wish. Yeah, 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 okay. So he brings his sister back to life. His sister's chilling in the swamp. Now he's like, oh, Sherry, I missed you so much. But it turns out it's not Sherry. It's like a weird monster Sherry that tries to, like, bite his face off. So he's forced <laughs> to kill his sister again. <laughs> And then right away, and then he's like, oh, God, I can't beat you. Where's, you're a stand, aren't you? And he's right, because this stand's name is Judgment. Ooh. <laughs> and he says, hail to you. Yeah, every Wait, time. Wait, who the hell named the stand? It just came into existence. It... No, the user's hiding nearby. He's in, like, a hole in the ground. Yeah, he's hiding in a hole in the ground. And we piss in the, the straw that yeah. he has oh, this to is the user in. who's unrelated to the genie and the wish. No, no, the stand is the genie. Yeah. Got it, okay. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, he wishes, so right before Poner, like, makes a wish for, like, Abdul to come back, Abdul comes back, and he's like, oh, God, it's another Abdul monster. It was like, no, man, I'm the real deal. And it turns out Abdul wasn't dead, in fact, because flashback to when, uh, Whole Horse shot him with the Emperor, it turns out the bullet merely grazed him, like, grazed his head, and knocked him unconscious. And like put him in a coma or something, right? Yeah. yeah. So Jotaro and Joseph opted to like just let him heal up a bit before meeting back up. Fun fact: the only reason that Araki brought Abdul back. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the reason Abdul gets brought back is because uh, so when originally creating him, he gave his stand ability to control fire, and Araki thought that ability was like, too busted. So he had to get him out the picture, and then he realized he could replace him with Whole Horse instead. Like, have Whole Horse redeem himself and become, like, a part of the group. But then, like, was it, like, Fan? Out Fans were like, we like Abdul, though. Yeah, they were like, we like Abdul, we like Abdul. So Araki had to pull, like, some yee bullshit <laughs> to, like, bring Abdul back into the story. Yeah. And that's why Abdul is back. It's also kind of weird that he thought fire was too busted, considering the stands we see later on. 
And yeah. the stands we see later nah. in this is, part is like one of the most simple let stands. Alone, yeah. <laughs> let alone, let alone when we get to like part seven and shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fire's too much, but somebody can have the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he wasn't sun. immune to the stand, also, so maybe I don't know. But yeah, so yeah, Abdul's back. Uh, they team up, beat up the stand. They find the stand user hiding in a hole, and they just piss on him. <laughs> Literally. Literally, they piss they in they the piss hole. Him. Power they piss on him. <laughs> so so Abdul. He just sits there and gets peed on. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's just, just, that's how they beat him. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Abdul explains to Polnir that he merely faked his death because he got badly injured and wanted to rest up. And it's revealed that Jotaro and Joseph knew this, but they just didn't fucking tell Polnir. <laughs> I am. Yes, I am. And then he says, hell to you. Hell to you. <laughs> kind of raw. Kind of, kind of raw. raw. Abdul's just a little bit raw. <laughs> Magician's red pilled. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So, okay. So eventually, the gang finally makes it to Egypt. Fuck, wow. just the right, not the right town in Egypt, but they are in Egypt now. They Ooh. just have to take a small little submarine over to like the mainland mass. Easy. There's but they're attacked here. by a stand named uh, High Priestess. And the stand, how it works, it's able, it's like a little gremlin. Like, it's like the thing. No, it's like literally like a little gremlin. Like, what, you guys seen Bar ba uh, Barnyard, right? Yeah. What are you talking oh, about? I know, yeah. The dude in um, the box. Yeah, the dude in the box. It's, it's Wild Mike. The yeah. Barnyard. Yeah. Who plays Carl Angel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Wait, what? It's, it's wild. Go watch Barnyard. Barnyard. I've watched Barnyard. But, it, but uh, the stand is able to like shape shift into anything metallic. Because so it's the thing, Ed! It's supposed to be the thing! From the movie, the thing! Whatever. We'll <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 you were talking about how you, like all these are horrible. How about you go how about you go spoil some plot elements? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So anyways, the dog type. No! <laughs> Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, in the Death 13 fight, a dog does die. Oh yeah. He does kill a dog before killing Kakuin. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, uh, they're fighting High Priestess in the submarine, and shit's pretty fucked up, so they decide to, like, abandon the submarine and swim up to the surface to look for the user. But then that's when the ground beneath them opens up into a giant mouth as it's able to, like, enter metallic objects and, like, freely manipulate them. So it becomes the ground and tries to swallow all of them, and it succeeds as they're all trapped in its mouth. So Jotaro just says fuck it and starts punching out all of its teeth. And then the pain is enough to, cause that's transferring back to the user, by the way. Like its teeth are getting like blown out. So the pain is enough that it just spits them back out onto land. And then they reach on land and they see like an unconscious young woman, but her face is too mangled to like identify. They're like, oh, user. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. So now they're in Egypt. They're at the. They're in Egypt, and they get a new ally. Uh, I think Joseph has like the Speedwagon Foundation stand yeah. and Iggy. So Iggy, uh, Iggy, and his stand, the fool. Wait, so, what's Iggy? Oh yeah. So the crazy thing about Iggy is that Iggy is a dog. <laughs> uh, specifically, he's like a Boston Terrier. So you have the scrappy little Boston Terrier running around with like a stand. Oh no, we have their name and the name of the Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Ed's grinning ear to ear. <laughs> okay, so basically the fool is essentially has the ability to the manipulate stand. I think the physical stand itself manifests by like gathering sand and clumping it up into its physical form. No, it is just, the stand it's itself is just sand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, Oh, I thought you meant like it can manipulate Like it sand. gathers up the sand to form itself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like able to freely manipulate that sand and all that stuff, you know, you know, you know. So, uh, so, uh, Iggy arrives just in time as the gang are ambushed by a yet another assassin sent by Dio. And this oh, guy's... Shit. This guy named Endul using the stand Geb. So uh, at this point in the story, like the halfway point, Iraqi start stops using tarot cards and starts naming enemy stands after Egyptian gods and goddesses. But Ed, there's still one tarot card we haven't used yet. Hey, I'll get to that. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you fucking duct tape Roland's mouth. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So, Endul ambushes the group using his stand, Geb. And what Geb is, Geb is like, just like a little bit of like water, sentient water, able to like move around super fast, super strong. Like we first see it, like there's like a strange rattling coming from inside some speed wagon foundation members like uh, canteen. He mm. opens it up, Geb's hand reaches out, grabs his head and drags it into the canister. Like ripping off his head. Yeah. Yeah. Oopsies. So yeah, it's pretty strong. It's pretty nimble and its range is insane because while they're like fighting against like a fucking puddle, the actual user is like well over two miles away watching yeah. this all go down. <laughs> Imagine living in the normal world and dying because you opened your canteen and <laughs> right. out and... So a thing about Endul is that Endul is in fact blind, but he uses like vibrations in the earth and shit and like sound and all that shit to like locate people. And he's doing all that through his stand while it's running around and shit. So uh, the gang tries to like, what the fuck, how do, we, how do we deal with this? Because if we approach the user directly, he's just gonna send Geb after us and we're too slow for it. So uh, Jotaro gets a plan. Uh, he's like, hey Iggy, you think you can glide us over towards the user? So Iggy, Iggy's kind of an asshole, we, we see here. As uh, Iggy glides over, but then he, Iggy realizes this plan is not gonna work. So immediately he tries to like shake Jotaro off to save himself. But Ochotaro responds by grabbing Iggy with Star Platinum and chucking him at Endul. Endul can like barely like comprehend, grasp the fact that there's like a Boston Terrier flying at him. <laughs> Cause he's blind, he's like something's coming at him very fast, but he doesn't know what. Then he gets smacked in the face by Iggy. While he's disoriented, Jotaro runs in with Star Platinum and beats the shit out of him. I love when he beats the shit out of people. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see that happen more. Yeah, but anyway, in this fight, Kakuan actually gets pretty fucked up. Like, and, like, uh, Geb manages to, like, slice his eyes. Yeah. So he's, like, down for the count for a bit, but he comes back with, like, cool shades and shit, so it's cool. Like, way later. Yeah, way he's later. in the hospital. Right? But yeah, he's, he's out for now. So, yeah, that's the end of Geb. And meanwhile, uh, the Joe Star group, they arrive in Aswan, Egypt, where they run into two more assassins sent by Geo. Two brothers that go by the name of Oingo and Boingo. Yeah! Yeah! Who the fuck? Paris, <laughs> <laughs> bro. So, uh, so uh, Oingo Stan is like, has the ability to manipulate his face and make him look by any like anyone, but it's only his face, and it's not really that good at it. It's Stan name is uh, Kanoom. I think that's Noom. how you pronounce it. Noom? Just Noom? I think it's Noom, yeah. Just Noom, okay. Yeah. And then meanwhile, Boingo, the younger brother, has a stand that's like a comic book uh, named Toth, and what Toth does, it like reveals the future through like, like uh, manga pages. These sound like really shitty assassins. They are. I they mean, are. They are pretty shitty. Don't make the whole episode without like the gang even knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they, their entire fight, they, the gang doesn't the even know they're The entire fight is entirely one-sided because the gang doesn't even know they're being attacked. <laughs> yeah, literally. So what do they do in this fight? Uh, Boing okay, so uh, they arrive and uh, Boingo predicts that Joseph, Jotar, and Poner will drink poison at a cafe they're staying at. So there's no need for them to step in and do anything. Everyone, so everyone goes to the cafe. They sit, they order tea and drink it. The tea is poisoned by the cafe owner who's also working with Dio. Everyone's working with Dio. But then Iggy acts up, causing them all to spit out the poison and find out what Iggy's doing. <laughs> uh, Boingo then predicts that Jotaro's head will be split open by a bomb. And Oingo tries to plant a bomb hidden inside an orange in the group's car, but is surprised by Joseph and Polnareff. And then, because of this, uh, Boingo, was it? Oingo has to use his stand to quickly make himself look like Jotaro and pass off Jotar like he's Jotaro. And, there, and meanwhile, uh, Polnareff and, uh, who else? Joseph are like, yo, Jotaro, you're so funny. Do that funny party trick again, where you, like, take all the cigarettes and put them in your mouth. <laughs> and Boingo's like, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's great. And then, like, because he's Jotaro, or he's Jotaro now, or he looks like Jotaro now. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Also, he looks like Jotaro now, but it's, like, a really scuffed version. Like, jo like his, like, he did Jotaro's hat, but it's, like, tall now. <laughs> yeah. No, but, like, because the fortune foretold that Jotaro would be... Oh, shit, the fortune thing. also depicted not Jotaro specifically, but someone who looks like Jotaro getting their head split open like a bomb. It, by a bomb, and because uh, Oingo looks like Jotaro in that moment, he unfortunately uh, eats the bomb orange. He doesn't die, he's just retired for a bit, but yeah. That's funny. And, but yeah, overall, Oingo and Boingo, they're defeated without even being noticed, Sag. And so, um, the group eventually makes it to the Nile, where a uh, stand named Anubis, which is like a sword possessed by a stand. Uh, the, uh, but the stand is not the sword. The stand is not the sword, it dwells within the sword. Yeah. Uh, it's found by a farmer named Chaka, and like the farmer's like, oh, cool sword, and then he's immediately like brainwashed by Anubis. Anubis is like gassing him up, like, oh man, you're such a good sword fighter, you could kill anyone here. You should, you should totally kill the Joe Stars, man. <laughs> you should totally kill the Joe Stars. The stand has its own awareness and shit. So uh, Chaka eventually so goes to fight uh, Silver Chariot, Paul Nero uh Silver Chariot beats the shit out of him because like Chaka doesn't really knows what he's doing, and then Paul Nero decides to take the sword with him, unknowingly letting him possess him. This leads to Paul Nero possessed by Anubis. His stand, uh, Silver Chariot, is now like dual wielding these two swords, and he's like fighting Jotaro. It's pretty cool. But uh, Star Platinum beats the shit out of him, and yeah. And then they toss the they toss sword the in the sword lake. in the lake, and it's just there. And it because it can't move or anything, it's just yeah, stuck it's just there. And eventually, he stopped thinking. Eventually, he too stopped thinking. Like mm -hmm. like uh, cars. So anyway, the group leave the Nile, and they make it to Luxor, where they encounter Mariah Carey and her <laughs> Bastet. So Bastet, it's not, it's, really actually, it's not actually Mariah Carey. But her she's named after Mariah. Mariah, yeah. But so Bastet, what Bastet? It's it's uh, where, where is it? Where's Bastet? Just Bastet. <laughs> right there. It's right there, Ed. Where the the plug? Right there. It's Here the plug. it is. Cut. Here's the plug. This is this is the cut, face. Cut cut. Now. <laughs> All right. So Bastet is one of these. This is one of these. Bastet appears as an electrical socket. Like without a wall? It like, just appears somewhere. and it's like, like it could be in like a boulder or something. Yeah, it, oh, it appears okay. anywhere. And it's, it's like that because it's like people are like, what the fuck? Why is an electrical socket on a boulder? So they go and investigate. That's when Bastet like gives them a little shot. And then from that point onwards. Could you move the. Sorry. Oh, I think that's got a little spot. The blinds, sorry. Jokes on you, these blinds are clear. Yeah, but they help. The lighting's a lot better now. Okay. okay. So after being shocked by Bastet, that person is now magnetized. So Bastet's user uses that to like draw like metal objects in an attempt to like crush the person or stab them or all that shit. She uses it on Joseph and Polner. Not jo no Joseph and Abdul. They get magnetized and start like having sex with each other. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not a gay porno, mom. It's a joke on JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Like 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 uh, who who was it? Like like uh, Joseph gets stuck like ass first on like uh, Abdul's junk, and they're like trying to pull each other up, but you're like, <laughs> yeah, it's great. There were yeah. so many times I think you're kidding with this shit. <laughs> this is not, you can look this really, up if you want. It really happens. Okay, but yeah, so anyway, uh, they, they eventually just say fuck it and beat Mariah by gathering a bunch of metal objects around them and then just running at her directly with all the objects trailing because she either has to deactivate her ability, leaving her vulnerable to their stands, or either she keeps her ability up and like crushes all three of them. Mm. So naturally, uh, she, de she, what's it? Uh, she decides to keep it up, but gets crushed as they just dodge each other's metal shit. And that's the end of Mariah, retired. So, meanwhile, uh, Jotaro and Polnareff are walking around. Uh, 
and they're being stalked by yet another one of Dio's assassins, Alessi, and his stand, and his stand, Seth. So what Seth does, <laughs> what Seth does is uh, it manifests as like Alessi's own shadow, and it like reaches out. And if it like touches someone else's shadow, that person begins to rapidly uh, age backwards. Okay. And like he does that until they're children, and then he beats the shit out of them. Yeah. <laughs> Why not age him into like non-existence? That's, I mean, they yeah, can do that. But he just likes beating up kids. Yeah. <laughs> That's really like his character trait. He likes beating up children. Yeah. Isn't isn't he like canonically a pedophile? I'm pretty sure he's a pedophile. Want to know that food? What to do when your pedophile would also say this? <laughs> So yeah, Polnareff gets turned into baby Polnareff, and Jotaro also gets turned into baby Jotaro. But because Polnareff was born with a stand, he's still able to like use it to defend himself somewhat, but Jotaro cannot. Because, yeah. So that's a fun little detail. Eventually, baby Jotaro, without a stand, just throws hands up a grown-ass <laughs> man and wins. <laughs> so. so yeah. So they finish off Alessi. Meanwhile, cut to Dio. No, cut to Whole Horse. He's reporting back after like getting clowned on twice, and he's like, "Man, fuck all this Dio shit. I'm I'm going out." So he tries to like shoot Dio, but then Dio just appears behind them, even though he was standing just in front of him. That's so fucking weird. And <laughs> so so a Whole Horse gets scared into going against the Joe Stars for a third time. Meanwhile, the group enters Cairo, Egypt having fought their way all across the rest of Egypt. And meanwhile, they like stop at a cafe, they're having a drink where they encounter a man named J Daniel J. Darby, who is in fact yet another assassin sent by Dio to kill them. Oh, <laughs> oh no. I hope his stand can uh, not- So he challenges them. <laughs> so he uses his stand, Osiris, and challenges them to like a game after he steals Polnareff's soul after Polnareff loses a gamble. So the way Osiris works is that once like the gamble or bet is in place, if the person loses the bet, Osiris steals that person's soul and turns it into a poker chip that he just holds on to. And if you win? If you win, then he's like, oh man. And then he, he gives you what he agreed on, right? Yeah, because he's an honorable man, but he cheats like shit. Yeah. So. So he gets Polnareff's soul, and then they're, everyone's forced to like start gambling their souls to get Polnareff's back. So like Joseph goes against them, they're like dropping like, uh, he like fills up a glass with whiskey, and they start dropping coins in. So like if the, whoever drops the coin in that breaks the surface tension and causes it to spill, loses. So they do that for a bit, and then even though they're halfway done, Osiris acts and steal Joseph's soul because Joseph knew in his heart that he couldn't win. So it's not just like an immediate loss, but like if you feel like you've lost, then damn. that's it. <laughs> Did that, damn. So eventually they settle things, Jotaro and Darby settle it in a game of poker where Jotaro decides to bet not only his soul, but also Abdul's soul, uh, Joseph's soul, Pear Polnareff's soul, his mother's soul. <laughs> he bet Iggy's soul, he bets everybody because because he's just that confident in his hand. Meanwhile, Darby can't, oh, what's up? He bets so much that Darby has to put up to even out. Yeah, Darby has to even out too. So Darby starts betting shit that he cannot afford to lose also. And then because of this, he starts like, the pressure starts to crack, like get under his skin and Darby starts to What crack. was the thing that made Darby crack? What was the thing that made Darby He had to tell him what Dio's stand was. That's what, yeah. That's oh, yeah, when that was, he freaked out. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, yeah, that was the bet. He, if he lost, he had to tell him what Dio's stand was. Not get the souls back? I mean, and give everyone souls back, but tell, give right out his boss, you know. And that's something he didn't want to do. And, and he started frothing at the mouth and Yeah, fell eventually, Jotaro's bluff was so powerful, Darby started frothing at the mouth, spasming, and eventually collapsed. And a reminder, Jotaro had junk. He had nothing. Jotaro had the shit in his hand, known <laughs> to man. When you don't think you can get anywhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> Your hand was shit! <laughs> so yeah, that's that. So meanwhile, so then after that, the group returns from as well. Wait, wait, wait. So yeah, uh, meanwhile, Whole Horse returns, and this time he's aided by Boingo with Todd, and they decide to like use Todd to like do the shit. Shit happens. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> 
Uh, shit happens. Uh, long story short, they lose and it's funny. Uh, so right now, so now they're in Cairo, Egypt, and they're looking for Iggy for Dio's mansion. So Iggy splits off from the group to do some investigating of his own, where he encountered Dio's pet bird, Pet Shop, and like Pet Shop stare. What was it? Uh, Horus. So Horus is like the same as the fool, but instead of uh, sand, it's ice. Okay. So they duke it out. Uh, Iggy loses an arm, loses a paw. It's pretty fucked up. But he does come out on top and bites off uh, Pet Shop's beak. Can and the dog killing talk? It. Huh? Can the dog talk? No. Like, only like internal monologues. But oh, yeah. No one else understands it yet. Do we have the dog narrate some episodes? Uh, this episode where he's like fighting Pet Shop, yeah. And he, just, he has like a fucking like, like a Latino accent. <laughs> like a really like thick Latino the accent. The dog is Latino for some reason. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, a fight breaks out. There's a kid who gets caught up in it. Iggy sacrifices a paw to save the kid. Ooh, uh, and yeah, he. Oh, and two more dogs die. Two more dogs do die. They're like yeah. hanging out. Uh, pet shop just like crushes them by for like making an iceberg and then like just dropping it on the fucking dogs. He's like, fuck these dogs. But yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, pet shop dead. Iggy injured, but they find Dio's mansion. They enter it, Dio's mansion where they fight, where they find, uh, oh, what's up? Um, who comes back right before they go to Dio's mansion. Oh yeah, before they go into Dio's mansion, Kakuin rejoins the group with his cool sunglasses, as I mentioned earlier. And while they go in, they find Talance T. Darby, the younger brother of Daniel J. Darby, and his stand, a tomb. It works the same way, like, make bets, uh, steal souls, but, uh... Uh, Darby Younger, as he's called, is a gamer. <laughs> <laughs> so he challenges the crew to, like, video games, which doesn't sound bad, but you have to remember, this is, like, the 80s, and video games are a relatively new thing, meaning that Jotaro, despite being 18 years old during this, has no fucking clue how to work at N64. Or a yeah, family. they don't have N64. Famicom, NES, yeah. or whatever. He has no idea what happens. Well, yeah, they're just using NES, that's right, yeah. And it's super funny because it's clear that Iraqi doesn't know either. So he just so he's like making up like yeah, this sounds like it would be in a game. Mm -hmm. uh, they play like a they play like a baseball game called Oh, that's a baseball. I'm sure this is based that's on the experience of like playing with the younger cousin. Or something. I guess yeah, most likely. And then uh, they play a racing game. Long story short, Darby Younger loses. Ooh. Yeah, like, screen. there's this scene where Kakuin's playing a racing game with him. Kakuin and he's the only person that knows how to play video games. And he's using, like, like techniques in the yeah, game where he's, he's like, doing, tap. like, light, like one-frame taps on the D-pad to, like, <laughs> yeah. get the most speed. Yeah. It's crazy. crazy. But, yeah, they beat Darby Younger, blah, 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 blue, blue, blue. And they leave his, like, room that he has in, like, Dio's mansion for some reason. Meanwhile, uh, a man by the name of Vanilla Ice... One of Dio's <laughs> last, one of Dio's last remaining minions informs Dio that the crew is inside the mansion, and Dio sets his big plan into order. But first, he orders Vanilla Ice kill himself and offer up his blood. Vanilla Ice, super loyal, uses his stand to kill himself, and Dio revives him as a vampire. Vanilla Ice. So yeah. Uh, is this power stealing music? <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. So, uh, the group. Wait. Okay, so yeah, uh, Polner, Iggy, and Abdul, somewhere else, they like just entered the man mansion behind everyone else. They're walking down the hallway when all of a sudden Abdul sees something coming up from behind Polner, pushes him out the way, and now Abdul's gone. Just his arm remains. So yeah, Abdul is dead for real this time. Oh shit. <laughs> And then it's revealed that Van it was actually the work of Vanilla Ice and his stand, Cream. Now we're past the Egyptian gods and tarot cards. We're now naming stands after bands and music and shit. So, first musical name stand, Cream. Ooh, let's go. Technically, there was also Billie Jean, but it was like a really minor stand that no one gave a fuck about. Wait, what was that? The, the dude, remember the little dude who like hated the other stand users because they were more important than him? And his oh, stand, yeah, his stand, he was where, he was, he used his stand to make the illusion that they were on the island where they were fighting Younger Darby. 
Oh shit! Yeah, yeah and it was called. I for, I think his name. I think his name was, was Billy Jean. Jean. I forget what his stand was called, but yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. The box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah. Anyway, uh, so cream. Uh, it's a humanoid stand, and its ability is to like eat itself until it leaves like a hole of emptiness, like nothingness, and then it runs around like sucking objects into that black hole, essentially erasing mm -hmm. them. So that's what it did to Abdul, and that's what it plans to do with everyone else. But a fight breaks out. Uh, Iggy uh, manages to sacrifice himself for Polnareff's sake and gets the shit kicked out of him by Vanilla Ice, and he dies. But <laughs> I love the fact that in the fighting game, Vanilla Ice's finishing move, or like one of his ultimates, is that he does the kick he does to Iggy to you. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, no, I, 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 so yeah, poor Iggy, yet another dog killed for Iraqi's machinations, you know. <laughs> and uh, Polnareff, uh, enraged by having losing yeah, another one of his friends to his that. own carelessness, uh, goes ape shit, beats the shit out of Vanilla Eyes, and like throws him in the sunlight where he disintegrates and dies. Ooh. Made it worse. Cut. Okay. All right. That's a funny dance, Ed. That's that's what the dance SpongeBob does. You ever seen that gif? Like oh my god, yeah! <laughs> and he's like fucking rapping. <laughs> <laughs> let's get this shit. Let's, let's get, get this shit. shit. Hey, let's, let's get this shit. Let's, let's get this shit. Top, top of the morning. Top of the morning. Top of the morning. Top of the morning. morning, morning, morning. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> so we beat Vanilla Ice, right? Did we okay, so Vanilla Ice is dead. Polnero yeah, got mad, Vanilla tossed Ice. him into the sun. He disintegrated because he's a vampire. L. Uh, Iggy's dead. Iggy's Abdul's also dead. dead. Abdul's dead. It's fucked. Uh, meanwhile, uh, so now Polnareff confronts Dio. Finally, everything's Dio standing at the top of like this staircase, super menacingly, and like Polnareff's like Dio. I've had enough of your bullshit. It ends now. So he starts marching up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> he starts marching up. <laughs> He starts, he starts marching up the steps, and then he stops, and he's at the bottom of the stairs. So he's like, okay. So he starts marching up the stairs again, stops, and he's at the bottom of the stairs. It's like the fucking stairway from Mario 64. So he's like, what the fuck is going on? Meanwhile, Jotaro, Joseph, and Kathuin break through, and they make Dio run away because they busted a hole in the ceiling, letting in a bunch of sunlight. Oh yeah, they just like bust into the fucking stairway. Yeah. <laughs> so Dio retreats for a bit, and he like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so they're like, come on, we can't let him get away. So they follow him up to the top of the mansion where they look out the window and see that the sun is setting and shit is about to get real. Oh boy. So they heard, so Kaku, so the two, they split up into two groups. Kakuin and Joseph were in Dio while Jotaro and Poner follow him behind. So like a car chase, this shit, shit's crazy. Just like a car chase. Uh, they like jump from roof to roof and shit. Uh, Kakuin manages to somewhat unravel the true nature of Dio's stand. Uh, but he dies in the process. But so basically, he dies in the process, but before he dies, he manages to like fire off some of like his Emerald Splash ability and it hits a nearby clock tower. So everyone's like, what the fuck is going on? But then we see what actually happened is that uh, uh, Kakuin put up his like big boy like ooh no one can get past my 20 meter emerald splash and then Dio he summons his stand the world and stops time yeah and dun, then dun, dun. and in that stop time he just casually like walks past like all of Kakuin's impenetrable defenses and then just donuts him like he punches him so hard in the abdomen that his fist comes through He's a donut. The world is also a punchy ghost. The world is also a punch ghost similar to Star Platinum. Wait. It, what was it? The world itself? No, no, no the name is the called The World. Yeah. Named after oh, like the tarot, the tarot card. card. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the world, uh, I like to call him Cheese Man. So the world, it, it's like a yellow dude. He has like cheese wedge on his head and he has like scuba tanks on his back because Dio spent the past hundred years or so at the bottom of the ocean. Fun little detail. Oh, true, yeah. 
So yeah, uh, the world uh, is Dio Stan and it has the ability to stop time. Crazy. So Dio stops time for five seconds and in that time kills Kakuin. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone else is still trying to figure out like exactly what just happened. Like they just, cause they saw like Kakuin and then all of a sudden Kakuin was dead. But he shot at the clock tower so they're trying to figure out what's that about. Meanwhile, uh... Joseph eventually figures it out and he's like running he's like running to Jotaro telling him like bro I figured it out Dio stops time meanwhile Dio stops time throws like he pulls out a bunch of knives and like throws one at Joseph like piercing his neck killing him and then he like takes his blood for for his Jojo blood you know uh, Dio wants uh, the Joestar blood because he has Jonathan's body mm -hmm. and he wants to like perfect it you know <laughs> Because doesn't Jonathan's body still have like Colin coursing? Yeah, it? Jonathan's so, body is still yeah. like rejecting him somewhat. Yeah. So he needs more Joe Star blood to like complete the process. But mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, Mimo, Jotaro, now knowing Dio can stop time, uh, decides to approach Dio. Which Dio <laughs> is like, oh, you're approaching me? And we get like the funny JoJo walk meme. <laughs> <laughs> Roland, we cannot see you. Oh, shoot. Nice arm. <laughs> like this? <laughs> you know, it's just a little one of these. Deal! <laughs> yeah. So they approach each other and they're like, let's compare the strength of our stands, Jojo. It's so sexy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then they pull out their stands, Star Platinum, the world, and they just start like going at it like DBZ style. It's fucking sick. And they start flying because they of the force of their punches. Listen, okay. listen. Okay, so I feel like they aren't exactly flying. They're not flying, no. It's more like stand leaps. They're using their stance to like just jump really hard. But, but due to the nature of manga as a medium, like it kind of looks like they're flying because they like stop in the air for a bit and they like hang in there for like give a whole monologue and then fall down after yeah. jumping. I read the manga for this final scene. It. it it is like they're just jumping around, but in this specific scene, the reason they're going upwards is because the force of their oh, so like yeah. in punch it, it pushes, pushes so them. high that it pushes them up a little bit. So like yeah. Minecraft. Like how Fun is that? Minecraft? That same thing happened to Superman. He originally didn't fly. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. But yeah, you get them just jumping around Cairo, Egypt, like smacking into buildings. It's it's nuts. But uh, eventually, Dio's like, "Fuck this! I'm done with you." <laughs> He's, I'm done with you. He like knocks, they're like jumping right now and like Dio like pulls up like a stop sign I think and then just smacks the shit out of Jotaro with it knocking him into like a bridge and then Dio stops time, runs somewhere else in the city, grabs a road roller, jumps back while time is still stopped and then proceeds to try to crush Jotaro when time resumes with the road roller he fucking found. So Why not do it while time still stopped? I mean, I think he does do it while time still stops, yes. but we find out that Jotaro's also able to, like, stop time with his stand. He just never thought to oh. try it. Wait, wait. This oh, was man. figured out stuck. earlier in the fight. Yeah. Like, this there's, a, out there's a whole thing where, like, Jotaro figures this out and he's trying to stop Dio from knowing that he knows. Yeah. And so yeah. he's, like, doing a bunch of tricks to make him think that he because can't. Because Jotaro can partially move around while time is stopped. Yeah. And so Dio's just, like, oh, fuck, what the and fuck? And throughout the fight, Jotaro is able to move slightly more and more yeah, as yeah, time yeah. continues. Yeah, yeah. Forgot to because, that. because Star Platinum is the same type of stand as the world. I mean, there are stands <laughs> with similar abilities, so, like, like the Darby Bros. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But... Go on. But yeah, so eventually uh, this plan fails and they, they start going in at it at like in another sort of like fisticuffs thing. But for some fucking reason, Dio decides to kick with his heavily injured leg, which Dotaro responds by just punching it. And the force of that punch causes like the crack to travel up the side of like the world's leg and like in turn blow up Dio because the same thing. And now Dio is like dead. Like, dead, dead, Dio We've Brando. We've killed Dio. Dio Brando is truly dead. Yay. Once and for all, we throw him into the sun and everything. Yeah, they, like, throw his corpse in the sun and, like, watch it burn just to be safe. And he'll yeah. never come back again. He will never he come really back won't. again. He really won't. Yeah, he really, really won't. Yeah, he really won't. So, yeah. Uh, now the big fight's done, and out of everyone that joined in the big journey, there's only, like, what? 
Like it's three just of old them and <laughs> and Joseph literally. and Jotaro yeah, that are still three alive. Three of them survive. Insane. And, uh... <clears throat> And yeah, that's it. Everyone's Jotaro, Joseph, Polnareff say their goodbyes to one another before splitting up. And meanwhile, back in Japan, Holly finally snaps out of her stand-induced coma and eagerly awaits the return of Jotaro and her father. And that's part three. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> you want to take a break? Yes. Or do you want to go for another 17 minutes? Sure. Okay. So JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part Four. <laughs> kidding. No. Wait. No. I mean, do you want to or do you not want to? Yes or no? It's your choice. I mean, I'm fine either way. All right. 17 minutes. Let's go. 17 minutes. Okay. So it's still rolling. Yes. So now we cut to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part Four. Woo! Come Woo! on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm now we are once again back in Japan in the now fictional town of Morio, and the year is 1999. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, the story begins. We see like a much older Jotaro Kujo. He's like in his 30s now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's like in his 30s now, and he's on his way to Morio, uh, investigating some upsetting revelations about the Joe Star family. Nothing too major, it's just like kind of wild when you think about it. As it turns out, he's trying, he's going there to meet a local high school freshman by the name of Josuke Higashikata, who happens to be the illegitimate child of Joseph Joe Star. Which one's Joseph? The um, Joe part, Rose grandfather. Part two, and then the Hi. old man from part yeah. three, Hermit Purple Man. Yeah. Oh, is he running around for all part three with him? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, know, you never clarified about the fact because you were like, "Oh yeah, Joseph died," and then. Oh no! No wait. Yeah, oh, yeah, you, no, yeah. They revived that Joseph is still alive. They, they revived Joseph. They like took the blood he sucked out of Dio and put it back in. Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> so Joseph is still alive. He's like in his hundreds or something. No, or he's like eighties. Yeah, he's he, he, not. He's he's he's, 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 he's whale. He's senile now. Yeah, he's yeah. like in the seventies. He's like Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, Jotaro is going to Morio to meet the illegitimate son of Joseph Joestar, Josuke Higashikata. And then this is crazy because that would make Josuke Jotaro's uncle, despite Josuke being like 14 years old. Yeah. And Jotaro like 38 at the time. So yeah, crazy. Man, this man was getting around pretty late in life. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so... Uh, so, uh, Josuke and Jotaro meet, and they, like, have a nice little talk for a bit. Wait, do they have a nice I, I don't know. I need a break. I get this. All right. I need a break. Just a okay. Until I get tired and I'll use the tripod. All right. Okay. <sighs> Would anybody like some rainbow sherbet? No. Uh, maybe. It is over here. Maybe later. Ew. Let me eat you. I don't like sherbet. I mean, it's not that I'm not a big fan. I don't, I don't really like ice cream either. That's Damn. fair. I think... I yeah. honestly think ice cream's a little overrated. Here. It is. Yeah. I like Cold Stone, though. Hey, Daddy. That's Are fair. you filming right now? <laughs> okay. Can we continue with the lecture? Let's go, Edouard. Okay. We had a little lunch break because this has Mr. been... Mr. Orgy. Where were we? Okay. Now it's time out. <clears throat> part four. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, part four. Diamond is Unbreakable. So, this part takes us to the fictional town of Morio, Japan, in the year 1999. So, as the story opens, we find uh, now 38 middle-aged uh, Jotaro Kujo on his way to Morio on important Joestar family business, as he means to track down the illegitimate child of Joseph Joestar, a uh, high school freshman by the name of Josuke Higashikata. So after a brief run in, some words are words are said, glances glanced, uh, stands out, uh, and Josuke uh, reveals his stand to Jotaro, uh, stand by the name of Crazy Diamond, named after the Pink Floyd song. And uh, so uh, Crazy Diamond, his ability is that he's able to, a lot of people say it's healing, but it's more like restoring objects to a previous state. So for example, like 
you take like uh like uh, I don't know the, that chair or a glass the mug. You take the mug for example. Foot. And no! you, like, pick it up. God damn it! <laughs> Fuck that one guy that asked about the gender is gonna fucking comment on this. <laughs> I would like to see more feet. <laughs> uh, but anyway, like you take the mug, pick it up, shatter it. Crazy Diamond would simply restore it back to its previous state. When it was not shattered. When it was not shattered. So, we'll use CGI to illustrate that later. <laughs> so yeah, that's the general gist of Crazy Diamond's ability. And uh, Josuke and Jotaro actually get into a mini scuffle, which Josuke, despite being like 14 years old, actually manages to give Jotaro a run for his money. Uh, so much so that Jotaro resorts to using the... Uh, using Star Platinum to stop time and like just he pull he, he puts his stand back and just lands a punch on Josuke. He's like, hey, cut that shit out. Uh, so yeah, they eventually talk and uh, Jotaro reveals to Josuke that he's there because he's there to talk about uh, the matter of like his, Josuke's inheritance money as he is Joseph Joestar's illegitimate son, but he's still a part of the Joestar family. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's messy, <laughs> messy business. Cause sometime around, sometime between the like part, the end of part two, and maybe during the events of part th no, not during the events, a little bit before, like between two and three, uh, Joseph was running around Japan and got some chick pregnant without knowing it. So, oof, big yikes. While he was married to Suzuki. While he was married to Suzuki. You know, I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> this isn't character assassination. This is par for the course. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Nat, but Josuke, he's such a good boy. He's like, oh, sorry to bother you. Uh, please, don't worry. We're fine. So, it's like, oh, cool, cool. But there's more pressing matters as recently. There's a stand-using murderer named Angelo Katagiri who's lurking around Morio right now. And uh, he's going around murdering people with his stand as, as he does. And uh, his stand is Aqua Necklace. And Aqua Necklace, I guess it's kind of like a humanoid stand that's just, it's kind of like Geb, but. It can change what fluid it is. It's Ge Yeah, it's Geb, but it's able to like change the fluid it appears as. And we'll get more into that later, but yeah, that's Geb. That, that's Aqua Necklace. <laughs> <laughs> so after a quick fight with Aqua Necklace, a Joe uh, Josuke manages the big brain. He's big brains it, and like he, <laughs> it's just crazy. So he takes up to. So long story short, they're in this house. It's raining outside, so Aqua Necklace has like free reign. And then like Aqua Necklace breaks in, starts turning on all the faucets, starts boiling water because it's able to travel through like fluids and water and stuff. So it does that. So Josuke, knowing that it's already in the house and can like kill him at any moment, uh, he, when no one's looking, he cuts up a rubber glove and swallows all the pieces of it. So then when Aqua Necklace eventually finds him, it forces itself down his throat, but he uses Crazy Diamond to repair the glove inside his stomach, trapping Aqua Necklace inside of it. And then he pulls the glove back out with, with Aqua Necklace thrashing around. So they're like, cool, we got him. That's but, uh, so fucking cool. It's so fucking cool. It gets better. So they're like, okay, shit. Uh, let's let's keep this guy under wraps for a bit. Uh, so they leave him. They they leave him un like unwatched while they go like figure something out. Meanwhile, Josuke's grandfather, a cop, oof, a cop. <laughs> <laughs> Josuke's grandfather, a cop. He comes in after a long day of doing cop things, I guess, and. He, he's like, oh man, I can sure use a, a glass of whiskey. Aqua Necklace proceeds to turn itself into a glass of whiskey. Uh-oh. Uh, so Jos Jotaro and Josuke come back, and they find uh, his, fa his grandfather spazzing on the ground, having drank Aqua Necklace without knowing what it is. It kills him. It, it's sad. <gasps> it's oh sad. God. And they try to, like... Like, oh, okay, so, uh, Josuke is like, oh, it's no problem, I got Crazy Diamond. So he uses Crazy Diamond, stops all the bleeding and hemorrhaging and shit, and he's like, see, Cabal, Grandpa, get up. <laughs> 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 he's not getting up. 
<laughs> so we learned the limit of Josuke's crazy diamond is it's able to repair anything, but if someone dies, it cannot bring per a person back to life. Big rip. So yeah. Great what a fun, fun, horrifying way to introduce the audience to this concept. Yeah. Can I also point out that a lot of people get this confused and think in this scene, Jotaro is explaining that no stand can bring people back to life. And so later on, when that happens, people always bring up this scene. That's not what he's, he's saying. It's Crazy Diamond specifically. Yeah. yeah, he's saying Crazy Diamond specifically. Oh, in the same scene, Jotaro also says that Josuke has the kindest stand ability he's ever seen. Because so far, he's only seen stands that just rip people apart, uh, melt them, magnetize them, stop time and throw knives. But then this kid's out here like just putting band-aids on people. So it's like, hey, you're, 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 you're legit. So anyway, uh, Aqua Necklace is now loose again, running around the house. And uh, he see, he's so they're searching frantically while the grandpa corpse chilling there. And they <clears> find <throat> Josuke's mom uh, pouring herself a nice glass of tap water with aqua necklace inside so it was like oh shit he runs over but it's too late she <laughs> drinks the glass <laughs> but it's all cool because we have crazy diamond so josuke summons crazy diamond uses it to punch a hole through his mother <laughs> <laughs> through his butter grabs aqua necklace moves his hand all while healing his mother in like the space of like a fraction of a second and she doesn't even like feel it that's how fast it was <laughs> so he's got aqua necklace again is like shit okay traps him in the in the rubber glove again uh long story short they manage to track down angelo the stand user he's hiding out nearby outside like they just they do this by like violently shaking the glove and because like the stand affects the user and vice versa they just see like a dude like violently shaking in a tree outside to, and then they like throw the glove on the ground and the dude like gets flung Audrey's uh, like there he is so Josuke chases his dude down in the pouring rain like stand be damned backs him up against a rock and the guy's like whoa whoa you can't kill me if you kill me you're just as bad so it was like, okay, I won't. So he proceeds to use Crazy Diamond to beat this dude into the rock. But while he's beating him into the rock, he's also restoring the rock <laughs> to the point where Angelo eventually fuses with the rock. And he is the rock. He becomes a monument. And he becomes like one of the like local urban legend spots, the Angelo Stone. So that's that's the first arc. <laughs> that's the first arc. The first mini arc. Don't they... Have you introduced Koichi yet? Uh, well, Koichi comes in. No, he he showed up. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but also oh, yeah. Uh, Koichi was also introduced earlier. But he's like, I'm Koichi, I'm not that important, and then he walks away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because I mentioned that, because there's a scene where they walk past Angelo, and Koichi's like, Hey, I don't remember that stone being there. Yo, and like, then yo, he's like, Angelo, yo, yo, Angelo, like, yo, Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> and then Koichi's like, Oh, oh well, oh, okay, oh, oh, yo, yo, Angelo. <laughs> Yeah. This is already the best season. Right? <laughs> God, this is already so good. Part 4 Fox. Part 4, Part four Fox. Fox. Okay, so next up, next up, next up. Uh, they're looking into what's causing all these uh, sudden appearance of stand users. Because it's not that... Cause, oh, another rule I forgot to mention about stands. Uh, stand users are drawn to other stand users through fate. So that's why you get all... To justify like all the battles and shit, whatever. <laughs> But, but there's something wrong, because in Morio, it's not that there's stand users coming in from the outside, but rather someone is going around creating stand users, and they gotta put an end to that, because that could quickly spiral out into like a really bad situation. So the big mystery is finding out who the fuck is going around with this magical bow and arrow, shooting people with the arrow, and then getting a stand. If is that literally how it's happening? Yeah, someone's going around for a stand arrow, shooting random people, just shooting anything with a pulse, really. <laughs> and then, like, if, if, the, it, if, if it, the arrow doesn't kill the person, like, immediately, then they get a stand from it. <gasps> so it's, like, a matter of, like, being worthy and all that shit, you know. Got it. So they're trying to track it down, and they get a tip that uh, someone uh, who... who, who uh, Keicho Nijimura yeah. is going around shooting people with a bow and arrow. So they're like, okay, let's go to the Nijimura's house. So Josuke arrives at the Nijimura estate where he finds Koichi 
and they're just hanging out outside. Uh, something, things happen. Keicho, he's like, oh, cool. He he leans out the window with the bow and arrow, draws it, sh and shoots Koichi with it. Koichi gets struck like in the mouth, like the arrow, <laughs> like he's talking, and then the arrow like flies in his mouth and buries himself in the back of his throat. He is not surviving this. Uh, and then uh, Keicho then drags Koichi's like spasming body inside to see if he'll manifest a stand or not. <laughs> Ooh. So uh, Josuke decides to barge in there, but first he has to get past Keicho Nijimura's younger brother, Okuyasu. Okuyasu! Nijimura. Yeah. So Okuyasu Nijimura is armed with his stand, the hand. Now, the hand, uh, its namesake is a band called The Band. Oh, but yeah. It's the hand because <laughs> it's the hand because its ability is that its right hand, I think, has the ability to scrape away anything. It's a humanoid stand. It's a humanoid stand. It has the ability to erase anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Including? And it fills in the gap and it causes, like, the yeah. space to, like, sort of collapse in on itself, filling in the gap. Because mm -hmm. Josuke notices this when he sees like a sign that normally says like do not enter but it just says do enter like there's a clear point where it was like chopped open and, and like copied and pasted but there's no mark sign there's no marks it's a clean cut which is odd so Okiyasu was like all right i'm gonna scrape you away from my hand come here so i can beat your ass and jose is like no you're a fucking idiot so Okiyasu, big brain is like cool so he scrapes, he simply scrapes away the distance in between them, causing, like, Josuke to instantly, like, fly forward, and then he just punches the shit out of him, sending him flying back. It's, it's very cool. Uh, this goes on for a bit, but Josuke manages to use his surroundings, so when Okuyasu goes to scrape away the space in between them, he ducks out of the way, and Okuyasu ends up scraping away the distance between him and, like, a random flower pot, causing the flower pot to fly at him and nail him in the head, and he's out. But he's, but he's so impressed with how cool Josuke is, he decides to help Josuke uh, stop his brother from being weird, and they team up to save Koichi. So now Okiyasu is now a Joe bro. Let's go. Hell yeah. So inside, uh, they, inside the uh, Nijimura household, they make their way up to the, uh, what's it, the attic, where Koichi is being held by Keicho, and Keicho uh, decides, no, what happened first? Uh, I think Josuke got to Koichi first, right, and used Crazy Diamond to save him yeah. before he like bled out from the arrow. And then, technically, surviving being pierced by the arrow, Koichi manifests a stand, which is just an egg. Yeah. <laughs> but now he can see other stands. But now he can see other stands, so he knows what the fuck is going on now. So... Uh, just, wait, what, like a chicken egg? Like, just yeah. a giant fucking egg. Oh, is there a yolk in it? Can he break it? If it breaks, uh, can it, does it, like, fix itself? We'll uh, see. If it breaks, I, and that's, I'm pretty sure we'll just kill him, right? Cause yeah, because cool. cool. if any damage done to the stand happens to him. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so, a base, so while uh, Josuke's trying to, like, give Koichi the rundown of what stands are and how they fucking work, Keicho begins his attack with his stand, Bad Company which is a colony-type stand that takes the form of, like, these little toy soldiers, but they have, like, very real weapons and shit. Yeah. So he calls, like, mini, like, fighter jets and mini attack helicopters to come and, like, blow the shit out of them. So Josuke, with his quick thinking, just kicks Koichi's egg to the side, which causes Koichi to be dragged away oh and out God. of the line of fire. It's funny. And, like, Ko and uh, they go at it for a bit. Uh, Josuke manages to, like, redirect some missiles, Ke Keicho fires, by, like, breaking them apart real quick, and then, like, reconstructing them Well, backwards. no, they blow up on him, and then he reconstructs the bo the missile, so they fire back at him. Yeah, something like that. Something yeah. like that. And, like, long story short, Keicho is beaten, and we finally get his reasoning on why he was going around shooting people with the arrow. So, as it turns out, Keicho's father, I mean, the, so, first off, the Nijimuros are, like, really rich. And they got this rich because of Keicho's father actually struck a deal with Dio sometime between the events, sometime before the events of part three, I'm pretty sure. 
And as a result, Keicho's father was implanted with one of Dio's flesh buds. But because he wasn't able to like get it removed by the, when Dio was killed, it caused him to sort of like mutate into like this like green blob monster. So Keicho is going around trying to find <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, she's the only person who actually manages to survive the experiments, and she tells this this old woman, like, the secrets of the universe, basically, and it's too much for her to, like, process and understand it, so they have a meeting where they talk about it, and instead of actually telling them, she just basically tells them, like, no, no, I can't tell you, bye, and then she fucking kills herself, like, she literally shoots herself in front of them. And then that's the end of the movie. It's fuck. It's uh, that's kind of like the gist of what I'm remembering. I haven't watched it, but it's fucking crazy. <laughs> All right, we ready? There you go. Okay, so uh, after uh, Keicho is defeated, we find he finally explains himself why he's going around shooting anything with a fucking pulse with stand arrows and shit. <laughs> so it turns out uh, his family is stupid, stinking rich, and they got that way because his father actually made a deal with Dio, and like that five year gap between like Dio's like reemergence from the coffin and the start of Stardust Crusaders. And because of, like, his deal he worked out with Dio, he had one of those, like, mind control flesh bud things planted in his head. And uh, because Dio died while it was still inside of him, it sort of, like, caused him to, like, mutate into, like, this green blob monster man form. Why not? So Keicho <laughs> is trying to create a stand with the ability to restore his father to his previous state. No, 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 no. Not restore his father, but to kill his father. And put him out of his misery. Yeah. Like, one of the two. Both of the two, I'm pretty sure it's just either or. I, either or, He's but, just like, for he would be fine if that. it would, like, put him out of his misery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why he's going around shooting random people. That's why he shot Angelo with a stand, and that what's created a uh, aqua necklace. That's why he shot a bunch of other characters we'll soon meet. And, yeah. So, with his thing revealed, uh, Josie's like, well, shit, I could, like crazy diamond maybe that'll work it was like oh yeah maybe and then hot red hot chili pepper burst in through like the tv in the room grabs keicho and the stand arrow and then drags him back through the tv they're like wait what the fuck happened and then <laughs> koichi's like look out there they look outside in the power lines keicho's fried corpse and the stand arrow and bone arrow are gone you didn't really like say it was a stand or anything. You're just like red hot chili pepper. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so red hot chili pepper is a stand. It's a humanoid stand. It kind of looks like the, that little dinosaur, with, like the ball of plate. I forgot the name, but it, yeah, like you know, you know, yeah. you, you know, the Pokemon Cranidos, like that. Like that. <laughs> but it has like people arms and legs and shit. It's like it's, it's a little guy. He's running around, and it has the ability to like. Uh, channel electricity and like move oh, through Lord. electrical appliances and shit. So that's what it did when it like reached through the TV and then dragged away Keijo and shit. So now Okuyasu's kind of stuck because his brother is dead and his dad is still like a blob thing. Josuke can't cure him and now the thing that the cause of all their troubles is missing. Probably the user of Red Hot Chili Pepper has it most likely. So uh, they team up and investigate <laughs> later on. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Toast, please. You want me to get him off you? No, I'm fine. Continue the lecture, please. So uh, the gang splits up and search for clues. So a lot of people don't like part four because they say like it's a whole lot of nothing happening and this is one of those instances of like nothing really happening but i like it because i like the little grounded slice of life moments cut in with like the shonen battle nonsense yeah. so next up uh this seems completely unrelated but we got koichi he's chilling he's walking down the street where uh, and then a con man pulls up on him and starts like trying to scam him because he recently obtained this new stand called the luck and what the luck is, the luck is like an object stand. It takes the form of an object, kind of like how Bastet did, y you know, like, yeah. And it takes the form of a lock that embeds itself in the victim's chest. 
And the way it works is that uh, the guiltier that person feels, the heavier the lot gets until they're compelled to kill themselves. And the only way for that to like leave is for the user to like dissipate the stand or whatever. Or, yeah, so it'll like just that. make you feel guiltier and guiltier until you kill yourself. Yeah, and that's what he uses to like extort and con people. Okay. Like I think uh I think it was Koichi riding a bike or something and the guy throws like a basket out into the middle of a road and Koichi runs it over. And he's like, "Oh no." And then the guy runs over like, "Oh, I can't believe you did you just killed my new kitten." Oh no. <laughs> there, there's no cats in the basket. Right? But he's like, "Oh man, shit. Well, maybe if you gave me 30 bucks." Be- <laughs> and Koichi's like, "Oh man, uh Fuck. Wait, wait. Okay, yeah, Koichi's like, oh shit. Uh, I, I guess I have 30 bucks I could give you. Sorry about your kitten, man. Meanwhile, Josuke's walking by and he sees exactly what's going on. And he threatens the. What's his, what's the guy's name, by? Tamai. T- Tamami, yeah. He threatens Tamami, the guy who's using the lock, into like backing the fuck off and leaving Koichi alone. So the guy, see, he like pulls out Crazy Diamond and is like, hey, yay. He's like, okay, shit, huh? And like he dispels the lock and runs away. And, and Koichi's like, hey, hey. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, man, I feel so much better. So later on, uh, Koichi gets home and he finds that Tamami is already inside of his house. And he's already <laughs> working his, like, con man charms on his mother and sister. He walks in and sees them walking around. They're, like, physically being weighed down by, like, the locks that he's placed on them. And he's like, oh, shit. So, uh, Tamami's like, oh, what are you going to do about it? He's like, Koji, well, I'm going to do this. And he manifests his egg. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a really bad idea because his stand could just get shattered at any moment. I know, but like the lock can't do that. It's it's like yeah, the lock isn't like a it can't attack it can't people. it can't attack people. It just yeah. So stands can do crazy <laughs> shit. I mean, you don't know that. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. Has what else are you gonna do against this guy? What? Yeah, so Tamami's like, the fuck are you gonna do, your egg kid? Get out of here. So then this is when Koichi. Uh, decides to like stand up for himself for the first time in his life and in doing so he unlocks the first act of his stand uh, so the egg hatches and out crawls Echoes Act 1 Ooh. What does Echoes Act 1 do? So Echoes Act 1 uh, it implants the sound it, it implants sounds into objects and people so he does so Koichi uses this to like get his mother and sister to snap out of it and realize they're being scammed by a piece of shit. Like, listen, 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 and like repeats the words listen and listen and shit. And then they're like, oh man, hey, who's this guy? Get out of here. And then Tamami is like, oh man, oh man, the jig is up and he runs off. Uh, Koichi threatens him and yeah. So following this, Koichi gets a little more confident in himself. And yeah, yeah, there you go. So yeah, another cool thing here, uh, Echoes, as, as some people might notice, I named it Echoes Act 1. That's because Araki, keeping up with like the musical motif and shit, uh, decides to like, if a certain stand has like an evolution down the line, uh, like specific evolutions, he calls them like acts, like acts of a song. And that's why he uses Echoes in this case, as Echoes is known for being a song with three acts. By Pink Floyd. By Pink oh, also Floyd. by Pink Floyd, yeah. SOS? SOS? <laughs> That's the dog, what the dog? What the dog doing? He shit it. Oh shit, I'm cameraman now. <laughs> oh, so. oh, thank you. Uh, we were having fun there for a while, and he then he just, just decided ah! that you were a bed now. <laughs> Come on, sit with the right. <sighs> Tyler, you. you can put him upstairs. You want to put him in my mom's room? All right, Jackson. He's such a little attention whore. Uh, yeah, he is. Yeah, he was good earlier because I was petting him. <laughs> so that's the end of like that little mini arc. Koichi learns to stand up for himself, upgrades his stand, grows as a person. You know. So, <clears throat> like Pokemon. Yeah. So so yeah. Uh, later on. Uh, one of uh, one of their classmates, Hazamada, begins targeting Josuke with his stand because he was hired by 
I think Red Hot Chili Peppers user to like keep him out the way, keep him off his tail. So while they're investigating his office, because uh, Koichi gets a lead, I'm pretty sure they're like, "Hey, this Hazamata guy is bad news." They investigate his, they investigate his like locker at school, pull it open, and inside is like one of those wooden mannequin art doll figure things, but it's like life size, like people size. So they're like, that's weird. And then it turns into Josuke. And they're like, that's weird. <laughs> and then it crawls, it climbs out of the, it climbs out the fucking locker. And now it's just standing there in the hallway with them. So they're like, that's weird. So this thing is Hazamata's stand. It's like a bound stand, a stand bound to an object. And like, I'm pretty sure these stands can be seen for the most part. Yes. By yeah. normal people. Yeah, yeah. What's it called? So this stand is called Surface. And whose stand is this? Uh, Hazamada's. Who is? He's uh, going after the random person. Random student of the- random, like, classmate of theirs hired by Red Hot, Red Hot, Hot Chili Pepper Got it. to okay. get him off their tail. Oh, so, right. Stands are everywhere in this town. Yeah, because they're, like, new stand users were just created and shit because of yeah. Keijo. The standemic, if you will. The standemic, honestly. But, yeah, so... <clears throat> Uh, so the way Surface works, it picks a random tar it picks its target, transforms into them, and then if it's like within like I guess field of vision, field of vision. No, I, I don't know. It's just there's like, a part later where like they're way far away, like field of vision, like of the person. Of the person they're copying. Yeah, no, because there's a part way later when like he's like way out of like yeah. a, away from. Whatever. The Basically, it turns to the person, and then whatever surface does, the person copies it. Got essentially, it. so yeah, so it turns into Josuke and tries to get Josuke to like kill himself. You know, vibes. Uh. Yeah. And this is, turns into a whole thing, it's a big fight, Jotaro gets involved because he's still in town, because he's like, where the fuck are all these stand users coming from? I'll stay and figure it out, blah blah blah. Uh, long story short, they beat Surface, everything's cool, and Hazamata uh, is like, he backs off because he's kind of a coward. Yeah. Oh, but he does become friends with Koichi though, weirdly enough. They like bury the hatchet. They're friends now. They're and, and he's also friends with the lock guy. What was his name? Oh yeah, he also becomes like kind of their friend. With yeah, them. lock guy also Fine. becomes everyone becomes everyone's friends in this part. Yeah. How does lock guy redeem himself? Uh, he comes in clutch later on. I think he does. I, I don't think he comes in clutch, but he's like, hey Koichi, I he, brought you lunch like today. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like Koichi kind of like shook him. Grown ass man. By the way. Yeah, grown ass man. Koichi kind of like. Shook him up when he like manifested Echoes Act One. Feel free to Google what Echoes Act One looks like, and then you're like, "Wow, this dude's <laughs> sure." But uh, yeah, uh, there's also like this weird thing where he's like a grown ass man, and then later on he's drawn as like a freaking yeah, man. yeah. A lot of people take that as like Koichi's perception of him. Maybe Jin, once he like finally, finally. knows him. He becomes a kid drawn later on. No, he, he, he gets drawn by like, like, first seen as like a tall, menacing, like adult man, and then later on is revealed that he's just like Danny DeVito size. Yeah, got it. <laughs> it's a good comparison. Same thing happens with Hazamata, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, these two become like Koichi's buddies, you know. So yeah, that happens. Meanwhile, uh, the next morning, a f another fellow student of theirs, Yukako Yamagishi, confesses her undying love to Koichi, who's at oh, first yeah. pretty, she's like, oh wow, a girl likes me, he 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 he. But then he finds out that Yukako is a yandere. Um. Oh no. Uh, fun fact, apparently <laughs> Yukako is like the first yandere? From what a lot of people say? Like, like she's the Possibly. First. Yeah, she's yeah. Due to like the time the part came out, she's probably like the first major use of this character archetype. Huh. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Koichi initially. For those of us who don't know, yeah. a yandere. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> thanks, <a> yandere <laughs> dev. <laughs> so a yandere is like a girl who's who's like madly in love with another character, typically another dude, and. She's this love goes to the point where they're willing to commit like literal crimes like murder and kidnapping to like eliminate other romantic rivals and so ensure that she's like or just even random perceived romantic rivals yeah perceived pr romantic rivals and shit like that yeah but anyway Koichi's originally like 
pretty psyched because a cool, cute girl likes him. But then he finds out that she's actually insane. And so uh, so he turns to Josuke and Okiyasu for help, and they proceed by just slandering him. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I think Koichi's pretty mid. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go out with Koichi. He's so fucking lame. But, Yuka but Yukako is undeterred, and she kidnaps, she breaks into Koichi's home while he's sleeping and kidnaps him with her stand, Love Deluxe. So, Love Deluxe is yet another bound stand, and it's bound to her hair, letting her freely control and grow her hair to act as, like, tentacles and shit. This guy really likes hair tentacles. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah. So, right now, Koichi's locked away in, like, some random-ass house at the end of, like, Morio or whatever, all the way on the edge of the town. He's locked there. Yukako's, like, has, like, a whole regimen set up so he can become, like, the ideal man for her to marry. Like, he has to, like, solve, like, complex math equations to, like, eat food and shit like that. He's like, oh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna have such a great time. <laughs> oh, God. And Koichi's not having it, so Koichi sends Echoes out, because Echoes has a pretty big range. Like, he's able to, like, pilot it remotely away Got from it. his body, unlike other stands. So he's, like, sends it out to, like, call for help, but he's noticed because uh, Yukako sees Echoes flying around, and she, like, throws a fit, smashes the door open, and, try, like, tries to break the door open to, like, get to him, to, like, get him to cut it out. So in that moment of, like, just, like, fear and shit, Echoes evolves into Act 2, and it places, like, a sound effect, whoosh, on the front of the door. Yukako touches the door, whoosh, she's blown away. Whoosh. So, it yeah. Can create, it can create onomatopoeia on objects, and then they have the property of that onomatopoeia. Yeah, yeah. Act 1 is the sound of words, Act 2 is the effect of words. Yeah. As, a, as an easy little reminder. Can we give some examples of this? Um, there's really cool examples that come up later on if you're willing to wait. Okay. But like whoosh and then like pushing noise. Like, Got it. Yeah, whoosh. Effect. She touches the door and she's like blown away by a gust of wind. Whoosh. <laughs> so uh, this blows her so hard that she flies off like the cliff that the house is placed on and like she's falling towards these rock spires. So Toichi freaks out and throws like another sound effect at one of the rock spires. She makes contact with it and it like springs down and then like launches back up with a big boing sound. Cause he, he nailed it with like boing. So it's now it's like rubbery and shit. And it catch he launches her back up the cliff. He catches her. And then, like, Yukako's is like, all right, all right, you're cool. I guess I can learn to be cool, too. And that's the start of their relationship. And yeah. they do actually date. Come on. <laughs> the merit. I thought, wait, is that not revealed now? That doesn't happen. This is the start, Roland. No, that happens at this point. Like, no. They, yeah. No. What do you mean, no? No. <laughs> okay, whatever. God. What? <laughs> no! No! I no. think I think Roland needs his professorship taken away again. <laughs> what the heck? No! That okay, happened. I gotta speed up. So anyway, uh, Koichi and Yukako are now on good terms, and they're just friends. Nice. So, meanwhile, uh, and ooh, Yukako was the yandere. The yandere. Yes. But because she saw how cool Koichi was, she's like, okay, maybe I can cool it just a little. Bit. Maybe. Cause like before this, she tries to like set another girl on fire for looking at Koichi. So, yeah, like, yeah, so she, she's cool with that. She's cool. My girl. <laughs> so that's a hobby typing. Oh, so now we get uh, my favorite arc in the entire fucking franchise. Let's go eat some Italian food. <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite arc. This is my favorite Oh, my God, tell it right now. Let's go. Do it. So, Josuke and Okiyasu discover a strange new Italian restaurant whose owners and chef Tonio Trusardi cooks dishes that like have these weird crazy ass effects, right? So the dishes, are, so basically how it works, they walk in and it's like, hey, where's the menu? So Tonio's like, oh no, we don't have a menu, I cook what you need. So that's the first. What you need. That's the first red flag. So after he does like some palm readings and like 
just asked him about he does <laughs> <laughs> after he does like some palm readings and asks like gives them some questionnaires to fills out uh he then goes back to the kitchen and he cooks okuyasu's meal first uh i forgot exactly what it is but it's so fucking good okuyasu can't stop eating it in fact he can't it's so good he can't stop eating it even when his eyes start to just like water up continuously to the point where it's just like a steady current of stream oh this is some spirited away shit a steady current of tears constantly flowing but he's still eating it because it's so fucking good his eyes are literally drying out and shriveling up in his skull but he can't <laughs> stop eating because it's so fucking good Josuke's freaking out go oh, guy Okiyasu put down the meat no <laughs> <laughs> Michaela can you throw me that water so he reaches across the table knocks the food off the table so Okuyasu could stop eating it, but Okuyasu's fine because he's, he's feeling nice and refreshed. His eyes are normal. He's like, oh, wow. Oh, I, 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 got, I feel like I got a good night's sleep. This is great. Josuke, oh, when's your food coming out? So Josuke is like, okay, okay, that's weird. So Tonio brings out Okuyasu's next dish. Okuyasu begins eating that and starts, like, scratching himself. As he scratches himself, he's pulling off, like, clumps and clumps of dead skin until he's eventually digging into his own collarbone, and he has, like, a giant mound of, like, dead skin just sitting on the table, and Josuke is once again screaming, begging for him to stop eating because this isn't normal. <laughs> But it's too late, and by the time Josuke does anything about it, Okuyasu's done, the stiff like pain he's had in his shoulder is gone, everything's fine. Like his stiff his back's fine, everything's fine. So Okuyasu's like, oh so Josuke, he's had enough. He busts into like the back of the kitchen and he's like, okay, what the fuck's going on here? He sees like a little dog in the back of the kitchen caged up. <laughs> and like he sees Tonio like feeding the dog something oh, no. that he cooked and then all of a sudden the dog like starts whining and it's like guts burst out of its chest and Josuke runs out of the kitchen he's like oh Kiyasu we gotta get the fuck out of here now meanwhile Tonio saw him and he's like oh, I can't believe you would do that he grabs Josuke by the collar how dare you come back in the kitchen without washing your hands so it's like <laughs> what <laughs> So here we get the explanation. Tonio is in fact a stand user with his stand Pearl Jam. So, <laughs> so basically Pearl, how Pearl Jam works, uh, Antonio uses like his incredible culinary skills to like create like food and stuff to like help his customers like alleviate whatever aids them. Then he puts Pearl Jam inside the food and that boosts the effects. That's why like uh, Okuyasu started like crying like uncontrollably, eyes shrivel up, and now he's like not sleepy anymore. That's why he started like peeling a whole bunch of like dead skin, and now like he's like super flexible and shit. You know, now that I like, think about it, that's like really overpowered. Like yeah. low key, if that if they were to like actually like put him in the fucking anime as an important character, that would be so fucking overpowered. You could just what, give... what the fuck about the dog? Uh, it turns so the way Pearl Jam does. That, though, is, like, still extremely violent. So the dog was having tummy issues. So when he fed it the food, the food worked in conjunction with po uh, Pearl Jam. And Pearl Jam opened up the dog, rearranged its insides to get rid of its tummy issues, and then put everything back in, leaving the dog nice and happy. <laughs> Do you feel better, Toast? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, red herring averted. Uh, Josuke apologizes red for being. <laughs> Josuke apologizes for being uh, acting all weird, and they frequent this restaurant regularly now. <clears throat> and that's 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 the art. Right, that's the let's go eat Italian food. Woo! Woo! I want to eat some Italian. I didn't do it justice. The anime's did. way better, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, so finally, uh, Josuke is at his house. He's playing like on this SNES or N64, I guess, because it's like 1999. Yeah. He's playing video game when suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> when suddenly Red Hot Chili Pepper appears, bursts out the screen, and begins attacking Josuke in the comfort of his own home. Uh, but it's like unsatisfied with itself, saying that it's not as strong as it wants to be, and like quickly retreats. So Jotaro gathers the group. They're like out in like a field hanging out and near some power pylons. And they're like, uh, 
and like Jotaro explains to them that uh, to deal with like this red hot chili pepper dude to like actually find out who the user is, he's bringing in uh, his grandfather, Joseph Joestar from the US because Joseph has Hermit Purple. And as we've seen in part three, he's able to use Hermit Purple to take like photos of people who aren't really there. And so he can like find out who the user is and get to the bottom just like that. But he has to be careful as Red Hot Chili Pepper could overhear this info and work to intercept Joseph and kill him before he has a chance to expose who he is. So that's exactly what Red Hot Chili Pepper does. It eavesdrops and flees to the port before, jo before Joseph arrives. Uh, meanwhile, Okuyasu chases after him and he like tries to like swipe, but he ends up swiping the ground, revealing like a bunch of like electrical cords running through it, which Red Hot Chili Pepper uses to like it jumps out at Okuyasu, like chops off an arm and then drags him back into like the electrical cords to do what he did to Keicho. But Josuke, with his quick thinking, grabs Okuyasu's severed arm and uses a uh, crazy diamond to like restore it basically dragging the Okuyasu back before he dies and then like healing him back to normal pretty pretty sick Josuke a goat for real Josuke a goat for real uh so there's a big fight is this where you got the idea for the Rainex power to repair anything in that one DM? yeah <laughs> Okay, so meanwhile, as so they're at the docks now, Morio docks, and they're waiting for Joseph. They see a ship out on the distance. So Jotaro and Okuyasu get on like a little lifeboat and speed out to make sure everything's cool on the ship. Meanwhile, Koichi and Josuke stay at the docks and keep look out for a red hot chili pepper or the user. Uh, so this is when uh, the user a Red Hot Chili Pepper, Akira Toishi, reveals himself to Josuke and Koichi, and they start a big fight. Oh, Akira is like this, like glam rock guy yeah like, <laughs> you like can you comment on the appearance of everyone in the season so far uh do you want me to gay yeah he's like <laughs> this like glam rock Man. guy he carries like an electric guitar and it's revealed that he's like just some dickhead 20 year old going around because he's bored he's like shooting he's also shooting things with the bow and arrow but not for some greater good like Keicho but just to see what happens just yeah. for hey, where did he get this bow and arrow he stole it from Keicho after he oh, killed him oh right so yeah this guy is just certified dickhead like i think at one point Josuke breaks his finger like with crazy diamond so he like so he like starts throwing a big temper tantrum then will then, then like wills his finger back into place and then starts playing his electric guitar to like cool down but the, the way he's playing his guitar with like such passion that it, the, the sound waves coming off the guitar form words and he like uses it to threaten Josuke it's, it's crazy he's like oh I'm gonna kill your mama <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but yeah every time you can't think it can escalate in certain way it's, it's great. It's a great scene. But uh, eventually, so the fight begins. Koichi, Josuke, and, and uh, Akira, they're duking it out on the docks. Uh, Josuke cannot keep up with Red Hot Chili Pepper as it's using the cords running through the docks to like pretty much like teleport and play like the world's worst game of whack-a-mole with Josuke. <laughs> it's not fun. But Josuke, using his quick thinking, uh, he grabs a tire... Uses, re uses Crazy Diamond to like restore it to a previous state, that being petroleum jelly, and he spreads it around. So whenever, uh, right before Red Hot Chili Pepper comes up to attack, like bubbles start forming at that spot. So he waits for bubbles to start forming, uh, Red Hot Chili comes out to attack, and then he like restores the, the oil back into a tire shape, trapping Red Hot Chili Pepper inside. And because it's a rubber tire and Red Hot Chili Pepper is electricity, it can't do anything. So it's trapped. That's out of the way. Meanwhile, on the boat. Uh, oh, fuck. Meanwhile, on the boat, a Toishi manages. He like the boat comes into comes into the docks, and a Toishi manages to like slink away, and he sneaks on to like kill Joseph himself, like with his bare hands. His stand is still trapped in the tire. He can't do much. So uh, Okuyasu uh, is on the boat looking for the imposter and he just decides it'd be faster to just beat up everyone on the boat because he doesn't really know what a Toishi looks like. 
So that's what he does. And, he, and it, like the two guys he chooses are like this normal dude. Like there's like some Glam normal Rock dude doing his job, and then like glam rock guy wearing like uh, like a guard hat. So <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's really funny. Cut. Keep going. Okay, so crisis averted. Otoshi uh, contained. Uh, uh, Joseph finally gets off the boat. And he meets his uh, son, Josuke, for the first time. Things are a little tense, but Josuke's like, sure, whatever, and takes him back home. And yeah, that's it. So, meanwhile, uh, Josuke and Joseph, they're like trying to like bond over like something. Like trying something, trying to find something to relate to. Meanwhile, they discover an abandoned baby just chilling in the park. Uh, so Joseph takes the baby, names her Shizuka, and like Shizuka is also a stand user. Not like to the degree of like Death 13, it's just a normal baby like instinctually just using the stand, whatever. Gotcha. And its stand is Octung Baby. And what Octung Baby does, it just turns shit invisible. So it turns like Shizuka invisible as like a defense mechanism. Whenever she's like scared or agitated or upset and shit like that, so like you just see them like walking around with like like baby clothes and like the vague shape of a baby while the actual baby is invisible. It's, it's pretty sick. That's a horrible survival mechanism for a baby. <laughs> well, especially because and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but the reason they find Shizuka to begin with is that she turned invisible and her parents couldn't find her. Mm -hmm. Something along those. Yeah, lines. that's why. That's why her parents aren't around. <laughs> God, that's so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So naturally, the baby. Oh, but the baby, uh, its ability also extends to objects. So it's able to turn other objects invisible. So a hijinks ensue. The baby carriage starts rolling down the hill. They're like, "Oh no, the baby carriage!" And, you, you know. You know. Uh, anyway, shit happens. Joseph adopts Shizuka, and yeah. So meanwhile, Koichi and Hazmata are t are hanging out, and they say like, "Hey, that one famous mangakaka, Rohan Kishibe, lives in this town. Let's go see what he's doing because like, that's what you do. You just visit celebrities that live in your hometown, I guess." Yeah. So they go. Uh, they go in. He he opens the door. He's like very creepy, very creepy like art guy. Oh, a thing about Rohan is that he is a Rocky self insert. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 So I mean, a Rocky self insert. Like so, a Rocky of course is like a manga artist, right? So Rohan is also a manga artist, but Rohan is like the best manga artist. Super accomplished for someone Rock so young. Rocky is the name of the guy who makes JoJo. Yeah. Yes. What's what? his full name again? Hirohiko Araki. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So he sort of like made Rohan to be Got his self-insert. Like he he drew art of like him and Rohan like hugging each other. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I remember that. That was where the friendship ended thing came from, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty great. So yeah. Uh, so he so Rohan being creepy invites both of these like children inside his home after they step in he immediately uses his stand heaven's door so what heaven's door is like a humanoid stand you know it's like a like a little white dude in like a top hat like little white like like pale white you know? it's supposed to be the the protagonist of his manga. oh yeah it's also heaven's door takes the shape of the protagonist of Rohan's manga which is a nice little touch Dark so, pink boy, right? Dark pink boy. <laughs> Wink. So, yeah, uh, Heaven's Door ability is that it's able to, like, reach out, touch an object or a person, and then it sort of, like, opens them up like a book. And he can flip through this book and read, like, their entire history, like, their date of birth, what they like to eat, what they did yesterday. But not only that, he can also use Heaven's Door to write inside of this book. So he writes things like cannot, uh, cannot like, is allergic to cats or cannot harm Rohan Kishibe, shit like that. It's it's pretty busted, really busted ability. Uh, but he does this. He turns uh, Koichi and Hazamada into books, and he starts reading their like life story for inspiration for his manga. <laughs> 
any plans to just keep them in his house so we can like keep ripping out pages and like reading like oh shit this is so good and then he like immediately like throw he just dumps ink on a page and it fin makes like a finished manga page <laughs> like he's that good at it like this isn't stan shit he's just that good <laughs> He like reads like, oh whoa, when you were three years old, you wet the bed. <laughs> That's an actual PG yourself too, isn't it? <laughs> like this shit is insane. So uh, they're being held they're being held captive by their favorite manga artist. Things are bad. Uh Josuke and I hope this is not a biographical. <laughs> <laughs> Josuke and Okuyasu team up and they burst in, they break in the house to like save Koichi and Hazamata from like this crazy manga guy. A bunch of things happen and uh, I think at one point towards the end of the fight, uh, he grabs a hold of Josuke, turns him, he like, he, no, first thing he does, he's like, whatever kid, you can't stop me, your hair's dumb anyway. And then <laughs> he, grabs his, he grabs Josuke, opens up a book, opens him up, and writes, cannot harm Rohan Kishibe, and then he holds it up to Josuke, he's like, look at this, I've won, and then he gets punched in the face anyway, because as it turns out, uh, whenever people insult Josuke's hair, he just flies into a blind rage. <sighs> So, literally like, literally blind rage? Literally blind, blind rage. rage. He's like holding up these rules that he wrote yeah. and Josie just doesn't see him. He just sees red and beats the shit out of him. Mm. With Crazy Diamond, of course. And that's... And he's a pretty boy who cares about his hair. Uh, I guess I can explain his hair thing because that's not a really big plot thing, right? It's... Yeah, it's, you, this is when it's explained. Oh, so, okay, okay. Sorry. So basically, the reason Josuke cares about like his hair, like you've seen it, his pompadour... Like, so much like, is that back when he was young, around the events of Stardust Crusaders, when I so back when I said everyone in the Joestar bloodline manifested a sin, that included Josuke when he was a kid, and he was much like Holly, where like he they didn't have the willpower to like properly use it, and he felt like gravely sick. So his mother uh, drove him out in a snowstorm to like the nearest hospital, which was a few miles away. But the car got stuck in the snow. So everything's looking bad. They think he's going to die there. But some stranger, like this other kid with like the same haircut, uh, decide like just happens to walk by. Uh, he like helps them get out of the car, and then that he helps them like get stuck, unstuck from the snow, and then that's the last they see of him. But Josuke is like so touched and inspired by this random act of kindness from this one stranger with a pompadour that he grows his own pompadour as a sign of respect for that guy. <laughs> well, he doesn't just grow; he starts grooming. Yeah, himself yeah he starts grooming himself to have a. That pompadour. sounds like the anime backstory for a hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, he beats the shit out of Rohan, and everything's cool. They're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Josuke and uh, Rohan Jos still hate Josuke each other. Josuke and Rohan hate well, each yeah, other, but Rohan's friends. cool with literally everybody else. And I mean literally everybody else. Wait, he never gets called on for kidnapping these children? No. No, it's like, oh, that shit happens. <laughs> it's Moria, what are you gonna do? He, j they just, he just specifically hates Josuke. For beating him up. So anyway, later on, uh, Jotaro enlists Josuke's help in hunting down some rats. Because these rats are stand users. Because remember... <laughs> <laughs> so remember when I told you uh, Akira was running around just shooting random shit for the meme? He shot a rat and that rat has a stand and it's making issues in the countryside. So the rat's the rat stand is naturally named Rat with two T's, and what it is, it's like a sentry turret. It's like a sniper turret the rat like gets up on. It's like a sentry turret the rat gets up on, and it shoots out like these darts. And when these darts make contact with like organic material, it causes that to like sort of melt. And like they're they're like, come on, it can't be that bad. And they find like an abandoned house. They open up the fridge in the house, and there's just a rat cube. It's it's just a cube of rats melted together. Yeah. <laughs> Don't they find people later as well? Yeah, and then later on, they find like the elderly couple that used to live in that house, who are also melted together in a cube, just in the refrigerator. So this rat is like means business. Uh, so Jotaro... Wait, what's the rat's power again? Uh, the rat stand is named Rat. 
with two T's, like like the band, you mm-hmm. know. And then its ability, it's like a sniper turret that the rat gets up on and it fires these darts that when the darts make contact with organic human flesh or just fleshy material, it causes it to melt. So it uses that to sort of like melt its targets until they're immobile and then it runs in and eats them. Got it. So they find like an abandoned house where the rat set up shop and they like, they're doing some investigating. They open the fridge and there's just like a cube of rats. (laughs) <laughs> like, like melted rats just in the fridge they open up the freezer and there's like the elderly couple that used to live in that house also fused together in a cube <laughs> it's, it's, it's fucked up it's so fucking funny though <laughs> so Jotaro tries to make a move on rat but rat is big brain and then it counts for Jotaro stopping time like, <laughs> to, like it shoots darts at Jotaro and Jotaro stops time, sidesteps it, but Rat accounts for this because it was actually aiming at the rock behind Jotaro. The darts hit the rock after Jotaro moves out the way and rebounds into Jotaro's soldier, soldier, shoulder, shoulder. from behind. <laughs> it, it's crazy. So yeah, Jotaro almost gets his ass beat by a rat. Fun fact. <laughs> Does the rat have like a voiceover? Uh, no, it's just a rat. It's just... It's just a rat. It's just a rat. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so after a few close calls, they finally managed... Oh yeah, the rat's name is Bug Eaton, by the way. They they managed to defeat Bug Eaton. Uh, Josuke heals Jotaro, the elderly couple, and the rat cube, and everything's good. So, meanwhile... Uh, shoot. So JoJo, right, guys? Yo, JoJo. That's pretty cool. Yeah, rats. I like when the elderly couple was melded into a fucking cube, and they just opened it. Like, what elder tour shit is that? (laughs) (laughs) That's probably like the most fucked up thing. (laughs) Too, like. No, what's fucked up is a guy turning into a rock. Oh yeah, we just left that. that also he's still up. alive. He's still there, he's the by the rock. way. He's yeah, like a landmark. Exactly. Or the most rat people we've sent to an eternity of loneliness, so they eventually just stop thinking and become numb. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah speaking like of cars. which, remember not that, but speaking of the landmark thing, remember when the, we made the when we turned the spike thing that Yukako landed on into like a boundary? That's thing? also another. Landmark. That's now a landmark. They're like a fun point thing point about eight. part four is that like. All, like, every other stand battle results in the creation of, like, some landmark that Morio begins to become known for the world over. So it's really, it's funny like that, yeah. So we got, like, the Angelo... We got the Angelo stone. We got Boing Boing Kate, which is the stones. And then we see more as it goes on. Yeah, there's more, it pops up. But, yeah, so, uh, rat, rat averted... Uh, meanwhile, uh, Rohan's just coming out the hospital after beating, after getting the shit kicked out of him by Josuke. Josuke didn't heal him, which is really <laughs> funny. Like, like, they hate each other. But he, he teams up with Koichi. Uh, well, he sort of drags Koichi along for some research to, like, research some new material. And while researching, they find an alleyway in Morio that takes them into the afterlife. There they meet the ghost of a young girl, Reme, uh, Remy Sugimoto, the victim of an unknown serial killer that like ravaged Morio about 10 years earlier. And so uh, she begs Koichi and Remy and, and uh, Rohan to like sort of like get to the bottom of her case because it went cold. Get to the bottom of her case and like give her soul some sort of like closure and shit like find whoever did this to her, that sort of thing. Because she reveals that the serial killer is still at large and is still killing people in Morio. So it's like, oh shit, ooh. So uh, she lets them, she takes them back to the entrance of the alleyway and like tells them like, walk straight, don't turn around or you get dragged into hell. So they're like, sheesh, all right. And they go, <laughs> sheesh. So like, sheesh. So yeah. Uh, cut later, we see, uh, this weird-looking businessman. He's, like, eating food in the park. He's hanging out with his GF. He's, like, caressing her hand and shit. He's like, ooh, baby, you're so, you're so naughty, ooh. So he gets up, packs up his things. He packs up the hand, the severed hand, because it's actually, he's the serial killer. Uh, and, and, uh, he has a thing for woman's hand. 
He has a hand fetish. Yeah. What is his name? I'll reveal that later on. Okay. I don't know if it's a, it's not a spoiler. Oh, he has a Mona Lisa thing. So, meanwhile, uh, Josuke... So, meanwhile, Josuke and Okiyasu are just, like, chilling out, being dumb kids, when they meet this weird, this really weird kid named uh, Shigeki. Shigechi? Shigechi. 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 They meet this weird-ass kid named Shigechi. He has, like, he does, he's bald, but he has, like, spikes. Spike head? Spike head? He's, the, as, as, as <laughs> this, this manga continues, people just become more goblin-esque. Yeah. So, Shigechi just has, like, Bart Simpson spike hair. Yeah. <laughs> spike head hair. Yeah. Uh, they meet Shigechi, and Shigechi's like, Oh, whoa, I've seen you guys running around town. You you have those little ghost guys, too. Look at mine. And he reveals his stand, Harvest, which is a colony-like stand, and it's like a group of these little like bug dudes that run around and do his bidding. Like So, yeah, Harvest. So, uh, Josuke gets a plan, and he strikes up a deal with Shigechi and Okuyasu. Shigechi uses Harvest to run around town and find pieces of, like, random lottery tickets, bring them to Josuke. Josuke will use Crazy Diamond to restore the full lottery tickets, and then they're going to try and cash those in and strike it big. Uh, the plan works. And they like turn it in. They turn. They find like one winning ticket for like how much? Like a bunch of yen, like like a good amount of yen. Uh, they kind of cheat a little bit using like Josuke, who like like taps it and like rearranges the numbers on it. Wait, how does he do that? Uh, with like crazy diamond. How does repair let you change the numbers on a lottery ticket? I mean, it's, is it Josuke that does it, or is it like it is Josuke that does it? Okiyasu and like the, both of them, whatever. It's it's Josuke. No, Josuke. like yeah, I think it's just like he repairs the the chart that the the graphite on it so it f formed differently. I don't know. It doesn't matter. That's what he does. So yeah. They, they go to turn in the thing, and they're like, oh, wow, can't believe it, we struck it big. They're, like, forgetting Shigechi. Shigechi throws a temper tantrum because he's just a little kid, and he's being left out of all this money. So he sticks harvest on them. A fight breaks out, but they, they, they patch things up. They're cool again. They're, they're fun. They're bros. Just some guys. They're just guys being guys. Meanwhile, uh... <laughs> So, meanwhile, uh, uh, the, the weird guy with the hand fetish, he's back, and he's having a lovely little picnic at the park, uh, him and his severed uh, hand that he has, a new severed hand that he has from, like, a new girl he killed, and he's chilling, he's packing up his things in, like, a little lunch bag, and he, like, leaves to go to the store, pick up some stuff. He sets it down on the counter. Meanwhile, Shigechi also walks in, sets his lunch bag down on the counter, and, like, he buys his stuff, there's a little switcheroo that happens, and Shigechi ends up taking, ta ends up taking the killer's bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's not a spoiler I, right I, now. I, I, I want to get to the, I want to do the thing. Okay, fine. So, yeah, the killer's bag. And uh, so the killer realizes that he's like switched bags somehow. And so there's this little kid walking around with a severed hand in this lunchbox. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, shit, shit, shit. So meanwhile, Shigechi, Shigechi meanwhile goes to like eat his lunch and he pulls out a severed hand and he starts freaking the fuck out. This causes the killer to find him, locate him and like finally corner him outside the school. So this is where we get the big reveal. The killer's name is Yoshikage Kira. Whoa. And he plans to kill Shigechi and keep the piece, he keep his own little piece going. Wait, what? who is he? Yoshikage Kira. Who do we know that from? Uh, he, he, he tells us. Oh, okay. Uh, he, he, he tells us. <laughs> he, tell, he tells Shigechi everything about him because he knows that he's immediately about to kill Shigechi. So it doesn't even matter. So his name is Yoshikage Kira, he's 31 years old, and he lives alone. He, he, he wants to live like a nice, quiet life while also murdering women. And he does, he does this through the use of his stand, Killer Queen. Woo! Ooh. So what Killer Queen, so Killer Queen is a humanoid stand, it's like pink, big pink stand, and it looks like a cat man, essentially. And what it does, 
Uh, anything Killer Queen touches, it can turn into a bomb and detonate it at will. So yeah, he does this by like like pretending to like drop a coin and Shigechi's like, wait, what's that? Harvest, grab that coin and bring it to me. So he's Harvest runs up, grabs the coin, and then he's like, ooh, Killer Queen has already touched that coin. He detonates it and blows up Shigechi. But Shigechi didn't, Shigechi's not dead. He's holding on for dear life and he flees into the school. He's running through the hallway, just like some mean girls that leave, that leave him to die. It's pretty fucked up. They're like, oh, what is that? It what was, is that kid doing? Like, is that a middle schooler? He looks so gross. You know, he's like <laughs> bleeding profusely, like charred and burned. And they just leave him alone. So Shigechi manages to track down Josuke and Okiyasu. They're like chilling in one of the rooms in the school. And he goes to touch the doorknob. But then we see uh, Kira climb up through the window. He's like, Killer Queen has already touched that doorknob. And he detonates it, permanently killing Shigechi. Like, killing Shigechi for good this time. It's, it's pretty sad. It's pretty fucked up. But yeah, now Shigechi's dead. Uh... Random thing, but the other day I was talking to someone about JoJo, and they straight up told me that they were happy that Shigechi died. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Fuck me, okay." Fuck that. <laughs> Yo, Shigechi did nothing wrong. Right, Shigechi was a dick fuck, but I mean, he didn't deserve to die. <laughs> He's just a little guy. Yeah, poor dude. Okay, so the gang uh, soon find out that Shigechi is dead, as Remy Remy tells them, "Like, hey, I just saw some little kid fly up in the heaven. What the fuck's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So the gang resolves to track down this killer and put an end to it. Meanwhile, Yukako and Koichi, uh, they're, they're just doing a thing. Uh, basically, it's, it's like a fairy, like deliberately played out like a fairy tale. The stand name and the stand is like named Cinderella. You know, shit happens. Yukako learns like a fairy tale lesson. Koichi falls in love with her for real. And now they're dating. That's that's that. Uh, so, after Shigechi's murder, Koichi and Jotaro, are, they're doing some investigating on their own, and they managed to find, like, a button that got popped off of, like, uh, Kira's vest, and they plan to, like, have Josuke, no, wait, what, fuck, what, 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 no, they plan to, shit, roll it. Oh, they they go to the tailor and they take yeah, the this, button there to see if they he can figure out. Yeah, what, because okay, Kira shop like goes to the tailor, sort of planning to, like match and see like which one is his and shit like that. So at the tailor, uh, Kira realizes that they're on to him, so he sends out his stand secondary ability, his second bomb, sheer heart attack. So what sheer heart attack, it's like a deployable stand, like a little mini stand on his stand that comes off his arm and it's like a little tank with a skull on the front. And it like what it does, it like tracks down like like body signature and shit, like body heat. Body heat, yeah. Body heat, it jumps on like the hottest thing and then it blows it up. <laughs> okay. So uh Kiro sends that out to kill them, to keep them from like discovering who he is. So uh, while so they're cornered in the tailor, the the tailor, the dude who owns the place, already got blown up, like collateral damage and shit. So now they're trying to figure a way out of this. So uh, thinking, realizing like the pattern of attack, Koichi puts the word sizzle on like a nearby wall, and like the wall begins to heat up, becoming the hottest thing in the room. And sheer heart attack like veers off course and attacks the wall letting Koichi and Jotaro, like, make their quick escape out of the tailor. So now they're out on the street. And, like, Jotaro, uh... What? Yeah, Jotaro gets caught in the explosion from the... Oh, what's it? Oh, got okay. no juice. Jotaro gets caught up in the explosion. He's a little beaten up. And Joyski calls Josuke for help. And like Koichi, he grows as a person a little bit more. And he finally gets Echo's Act 3. What makes him grow as a person? Uh, like quick thinking and standing up to a literal serial killer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he gets Echo's Act 3. So what Echo's Act 3? So Act 1 was the sound of words. Act 2 was the effect of words. So Echo's Act 3 is the weight of words. <laughs> and he uses that 
uh, Echo's Act 3 freeze on sheer heart attack, which pins it down, keeping it from moving and letting them, like, think for a bit, giving them time. Meanwhile, Kira is also, like, being weighed down, like, pinned to this one spot, and he's, like, struggling because, like, oh, God, they're going to find him like this. He's, he's not looking very normal. He's sticking out. He's not living a quiet life. Yeah. Uh, shoot. So, uh... So, Kira eventually makes his way back to where Koichi is to, like, get him off his stand so he can, like, make a quick getaway. But in the process, like, he does beat the shit out of Koichi. It's pretty brutal. Like, he picks him up, slams him to the ground, picks up his head and, like, beats his face into the floor repeatedly. It's pretty kind of wrong, kind of wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sigma male grind set beat the grind up children. Set. <laughs> the grind set, assault children. <laughs> and dogs. And then, like, like, there's a great scene where Koichi, like, has his ID in his mouth, in, like, in his mouth, and he's like, even I could figure out your identity. Yeah, you're yeah, he starts idiot. reading out his ID. He's like, oh, so your name is Yoshikage Kira. <laughs> your <laughs> IP address dumbass. is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. If even a dumbass kid like me can figure out your identity, you ain't shit, and I can die knowing that I, I bested you. So this causes uh, Kira to fly in a rage. He's not paying attention, and in comes Star Platinum with the fucking haymaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yo! <laughs> Star yeah, I was told while watching this, the serial killer is a genuinely creepy character. Yeah, he, he is a genuinely creepy person. They, like, break into his house and look around, and it's like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, Star Platinum jumps in, and now he's... Jotaro's like beating the shit out of Joe's out of Kira. They're like trading blows. Like heroes get like blowing a few holes in Jotaro. Jotaro's like stopping time and hitting him like 99 times all at once. It's, it's pretty fucked up. So eventually they're both unconscious. Not unconscious, but they're both like badly beaten. He can't really move much. And like, so this is when Josuke finally arrives on the scene and he has to play catch up for a bit. So he's wondering, like, oh shit, Jotaro, Koichi, random guy, what happened here? So Kira realizes that Josuke doesn't know who he is yet, and Koichi and Jotaro are kind of, like, out of the picture for a bit. So he's like, oh, oh, young man, I'm so hurt, please, you have to help me. And it was like, yo, okay, sure, man, whatever, what do you need? It was like, uh, I need you to use your stand to heal me. So Josuke is like, okay, cool, how do you know I have a stand, <laughs> So the jig is up, and he goes to beat up uh, Kira some more, but but Kira, who's still being weighed down by Koichi, by the way, decides to like quite literally cut his losses, and he has his stand, Killer Queen, chop off his arm, the one that's being weighed down, and he like starts making like he starts booking it. So Josie is like, okay, he's not getting away that easy, and uses crazy diamond on his hand, which like starts floating up and starts tracking down Kira to like reattach itself so they're all chasing the hand down <laughs> this is a great season this is so good bro so they're all chasing like this disembodied hand down the street it goes into like a beauty parlor with a character I skip you, you remember that stand Cinderella That's the irony of this by the way that they're chasing his hand yeah <laughs> like, I never you, thought about that you remember that stand I mentioned Cinderella, Cinderella. right like, I briefly skipped over it because I forgot it was actually important for this one. <laughs> I forgot about it. Yeah, my, so basically, my... Cinderella has the Cinderella ability... Cinderella has the ability to sort of, like, swap make swap faces with people. So Kira plans to... You, he breaks into, like, the user, Cinderella's user's, like, beauty salon she has running and forces her... He, like, grabs a random dude off the street and forces her to, like, switch their faces... Like, switch their faces and, like, hair color and all that shit. And, like, basically take over this guy's identity to, like, start blending in again. So he does that as the hand flies in. And all they see is, like, Cinderella, like, bad, the Cinderella's user, like, badly beaten in the corner. And she's like, I'm sorry, he made me do it. And then she blows up. Oof. Cut. Keep going. He made me do it. She blows up. Oof, and the last they see is like Kira's shoe like leaving out the back door and they run outside and it's just like a crowd of people but they can't pick out Kira because they changed his face again and they're like shit no oh no so yeah that's that's the end of that arc and they're like oh man
I think this is like the halfway point, right? Uh, this is about like two thirds in, I think. Yeah. So the anime intro changes. Yeah, this is when it changes to chase. chase. Yeah. yeah. That that one word. It's either chase or great days. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's. Chase. Whatever. Continue the lecture. <clears throat> So yeah, now they know they have a name now, and they had they had a face, Yoshikai Akira. They decided to like do some snooping around his house because he's not living there anymore. He's like assuming some other dude's identity right now. So they snoop around, and inside they encounter the ghost of Kira's father, who this is this is a really weird situation because he lives on apparently through like his stand Adam Hart father, which is like. Let's um. What the fuck does he even do? It's a camera, and when it takes a photo, everything that's in the photograph is stuck inside of it. Yeah, everything that's in the photo is stuck inside of it. So he like flies by, takes a picture of like Jotaro and Josuke while they're like investigating Kira's bedroom, and they find that they can't leave the bedroom as it's like not in the photograph. And exit. also, just to note, he lives in the photograph. That's how he lives. He in he also lives in like a little photograph of himself, and he like flies around. Yeah, but is he limited to the space that's in the photograph he took? Uh, no. Well, he's well him himself, but he can move the photograph around. Yeah. It. You, you gotta weird. see it. Motion. You, you gotta yeah. see it in action. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, so not only is Kira's ghost father now in play, but <coughs> uh, he also has like uh, his own bow and arrow, and he goes about creating more stand users in Morio, but now for the purpose of protecting his son from these people that want to ruin his quiet people. Where did he life. get a bow and arrow? Is it the same bow and arrow? or I don't know. I don't Where think does the bow and arrow come from to begin with? We'll, we'll, get, to we'll get to that. That Way is later. explained later. Like, not in this season. <laughs> Next season. Yeah. But yeah, so his dad's going around making more boo-boos, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a thing. Uh, so they, they managed to break out of Kira's house and they get some leads and they're like, okay, we're going to investigate. But first, uh, Rohan Kishibe has to play rock, paper, scissors against some random kid who got shot by Kira's father who challenges and uses his stand boy to men to <laughs> boys to men as a means to like steal his stand for himself through rock, paper, scissors. Uh, it, things happen. Uh, he gets beaten, and then, just to be safe, Rohan opens up the boy like a book and, like, writes in him, can no longer interact with Rohan Kishibe. <laughs> and, yeah, that's the end of that arc. Uh, he has, like, the kid also has, like, a hole in his face. It's really weird. I'm pretty sure that's where he got struck with the arrow. Yeah, and he's like, sticks his tongue out of it sometimes yeah. and starts licking the edges. It's weird. Yeah, very weird. Uh, so, uh... Now, another, so later on, a different day, Josuke and Okuyasu Oki encounter this really weird dude named Mikitaka Hazikura, and this guy claims to be an alien sent from another planet to infiltrate Earth society and deem whether or not his people can integrate. Not out of expectation. <laughs> <laughs> So they're like, yeah, you're bullshitting, bro. Come on, you're you're a stand user. Look at this. And he like has like crazy diamond wave his hands in front of his face, but Mikitaka doesn't see anything. <laughs> oh god. So while Mikitaka doesn't have a stand per se, being I guess an alien, he does have this shape shifting ability he refers to as Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> what what a stretch of a band name is this? Uh, so we, it was, uh, so we, uh, it is fucking, I don't know how to say it. And like, it's really weird, because he's like, he's like, yo, Josuke, look at my shape-shifting powers. He turns into like a pair of Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he turns into like... Does he just start walking around as Yeah, shapes? yeah, yeah. He's like, come on, Josuke, put me on. <laughs> So Josuke puts on the alien shoes and he starts walking around. He realizes he can like walk up walls and shit. Like, Whoa! 
road. <laughs> so they're like, wait a second, Miki Taka. He listen, listen. We can scam Rohan. <laughs> so he takes God. This is crazy. There's a serial killer on the. Loose. There's a serial killer on the loose, by the way. But you're just doing this. And this we're gonna, we're gonna play fucking Yahtzee with this. Yeah. yeah. This so is. so they go over to Rohan's house, and the plan is Miki Taka shapes sifts into some dice, so Josuke can use them in a game of Yahtzee against Rohan and cheat. Yahtzee? Yahtzee. <laughs> I, know, I, I was just joking, is it actually Yahtzee? I'm pretty sure it's a dice game. It's a dice game. So what are more game. dice games in Yahtzee? Oh, it's craps. It's, they play craps. It That's is right. craps. Okay, yeah. Got it. So you're like... <laughs> so so Josuke uh, starts playing craps against Rohan, and he's winning because his dice are fucking alive. <laughs> but each time he like shakes the dice and throws them, like Miki Taka throws up a little bit. <laughs> And then oh, it, yeah. And it gets to the point like Rohan's like, okay, Josuke, fuck this. I know you're cheating, and I'm gonna figure this out. Meanwhile, uh, Wait, shit. Miki Tasha? Miki, Miki Taka, Taka is no. the alien. Miki Taki? No, no, Rohan. It's Miki Taka. Rohan's like, okay, Josuke, yeah. I know you're cheating, and I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. You're full of shit, Josuke. I hate you. So, <laughs> while all this is going on. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> well, all this is going on, something happens, I don't know how, but somehow, Rohan manages to start a house fire, but he's unfazed because his whole house can burn down, but he won't move an inch until he figures out how, Dro how Josuke is cheating at craps. So, I mean, they're sitting there, Josuke's like, Rohan, we gotta go, <laughs> the house is burning down. Miki Taka's like, it would be most wise if we get out of this burning house. <laughs> and Rohan's like, you're cheating, I'm gonna figure you out. And I imagine they're screaming all of this dialogue. Yes. yes. So anyway, long story short, Josuke and Miki Taka are undiscovered and they get away while Rohan's house burns down. Rohan no longer has a house. Rohan is now homeless. Houseless. Without home. Uh. So, Rohan, so a little bit later, Rohan's still pissed about his house burning down because of Josuke cheating at <laughs> dice somehow. And they encounter each other on the bus, like inside, like, and while the bus is like driving like someplace, uh, it passes through a tunnel. Inside the tunnel, there's like a room with like a woman and a man like looming over there about to like do something. So Rohan is like, holy shit. He jumps out the bus, goes to this room, and the room is actually a trap created by the stand Highway Star. So <laughs> Highway Star traps Rohan in this room and begins to suck his life force to heal the user. So it's revealed that the user of Highway Star is like this biker dude who recently got into a car accident after I'm assuming Kira's father shot him while he was on his bike. And now he's using his stand to heal himself faster while he stays at the local hospital. So so uh, Josuke notices something's up in the room. He steps in the room, sees like Rohan getting sucked and shit. And he's like, uh-oh, I, I gotta find the user. Don't worry, I'll be back. But little does Josuke know, by stepping in the room, he's been, like, marked with, like, the scent of the room. So the stand begins to pursue him. And this won't be, this wouldn't be a big issue, but the stand speed tops at, like, what, 60 miles per hour? Yeah. So Josuke has to, like, find a way to, like, stay above 60 miles per hour while, like, navigating traffic and, like, figuring out what the fuck is going on. And then finding the stand user. Why finding the stand user. So, uh... <laughs> so, uh, Josuke manages to grab a hold of a motorcycle and proceeds... Why me? And proceeds to, like, ride this motorcycle through town, like, desperate. He's, like, he snatches a phone from, like, a random businessman. He, he drives past, and he dials up Koichi. And he's like, Koichi, no time to explain uh, who's, who's at the fucking hospital right now. <laughs> so Koichi's like, oh, there's, like, some guy who got in a biker accident. Is what's, what's wrong? I was like, okay, that's the stand user. Koichi, you think you can help me out? And it was like, uh, shh, I'll try. So meanwhile, Koichi heads down to the hospital while Josuke is like hauling ass. Well, <laughs> Highway Star, uh, it's this humanoid stand. It's like purple 
And when it's chasing Josuke, it splits in the feet. <laughs> so there's like a swarm of feet chasing Josuke while he's like going like over 60 miles per hour through town. Toast, like, you're hurting me. It's, 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 it's wild. Toast, your elbows are digging deep into my thighs. Uh, you can push them off. There, better. Uh, so yeah, while, there's, there's like, this really cool shot, there. like Josuke's like speeding towards this intersection. There's like a lady pushing a stroller through it. So he doesn't have time to stop because if he slows down just a little bit, Highway Star is going to catch up to him and drain him dry. So what he does, he has Crazy Diamond break down the bike and he has the pieces of the bike with himself included fly over this lady on the crosswalk. <laughs> then he has Crazy Diamond repair the bike and he just tops back on and like keeps going. There's like a slow sick. motion part too. It's it's Oh, yeah. It's fucking yeah. sick. This is the best part of the part. <laughs> So Josuke eventually finds out Highway Star's users at the local hospital. So he makes a beeline towards it. And like, it's like, so it comes to Koichi. He's like trying to convince like the hospital receptionist to like let him upstairs. So oh he can my like God. See the room. And she's like, whatever. I don't have time to be messing with shitty little brats like you. Get out of here, kid. So Koichi's like, cool. And uses Echo's Act 3 to like start knocking medicine everywhere. <laughs> like, like. Like, he starts, like, slowly pushing, like, this jar of medicine off the ledge. And, like, the nurse is like, oh, no. She goes to catch it. And then, like, she catches it, but Koichi makes it purposely, like, heavier. <laughs> Shit. Echo's so Act Echo's three. Act 3 comes out. It's like, okay, master, let's kill the oh. <laughs> bee. The funniest fucking thing <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Why are we all... Okay. So no, this is when Echo's Act 3 comes out and says, Okay, Master, let's kill the ho beach. And it starts weighing down the medicine. The lady's desperately trying to, like, hold it up. Meanwhile, Koichi's, like, watching it nonchalant. He's like, damn, it's too bad you don't, uh, don't want to mess with shitty little kids like me. I could help you, but... Ugh. So the lady finally relents and tells him the room number of the stand user they're looking for. Meanwhile, just then, Josuke finally crashes through the front doors of the hospital, still on his motorcycle, still going 60 off like Highway Star right behind him. And he's like, Koichi, room number. And Koichi yells him the room number. He's like, cool, thanks. So he drives straight, crashes into the elevator, and like just has, start, has a crazy diamond hit the button. So it goes up. Koichi. So then we finally make it into the the hospital room of Highway Star's stand user. And it's like this dude, he's like posted up with all his like lady friends around him. They're like, oh man, you're so hurt, Yuya. Ooh, ooh. Uh, what's his name? Yeah, his name is uh, Yuya. Yeah. Ooh, Yuya, you're so sexy. Ooh. Yeah, you look like literally <laughs> that. <laughs> literally that. So uh, Yuya is like... So Josuke busts into the room with like Highway Star finally like digging into his back and starting to like drain his life force. So he's like, you call off your stand right now. And he's like, or what, man? I'm just I'm just trying to live over here. You, you're killing my vibe. So he's like, you know what? Fuck this. And so he like raises like crazy diamond and like just smacks the fuck out of like his leg, which is like already in a cast. So the guy starts like screaming in pain. He's like, ah, oh, ooh, ooh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so it's like, come on, man, you wouldn't beat me up. I'm still injured. He's like, yeah, that's why I use Crazy Diamond. They heal you up just now. So he's like, oh, hey, I'm, ah! <laughs> so, so Josuke proceeds to beat the shit out of him with Crazy Diamond. And it goes so far as to grab him, pick him up out of the hospital bed, and throw him out the window. <laughs> of the three, throw him out like the third story window of the hospital. <laughs> and he's retired. He's retired for a bit. But he's also a surprise master tool that we'll use for later. Yeah. Maybe. 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 Also, this bit, uh... Is where I think one of Josuke's supers and like all star battles yeah. come from. It's literally like his ultimate is that he heals up the opponent and then beats the shit out of him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's fun. It's a fair fight if uh, it's okay to kick your ass now, right? I yeah. love the hyper machismo of that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that goes down and that's the highway star. So Movie. meanwhile. Okay, so meanwhile, uh, at the Kawajiri residence, 
Uh, so, uh, sh- wait, where, 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 Okay. We're talking about Kosaku Kawajiri. So yeah, Ko- so yeah, so the man Yoshikage Kira snatched off the street was named Kosaku Kawajiri, and now Ko- Yoshikage Kira, with his face and hair and everything, is doing his best to like integrate himself into Kasawajiri's life and like continue on like nothing's happened. But uh, his wife is like a little suspicious but she's fine with it because she likes this new dark brooding edge her husband developed all of a sudden <laughs> but his son is not having any of that and he's like getting he's like hey dad you're acting kind of sus <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of imposter Ooh. Excuse me. Uh, can i just say i my favorite uh character archetype is just little kid who's like Spying on people, I yeah, guess. yeah, just yeah. like little kid who's doing shit. Oh yeah, the kid's name is Hayato, by the way. Yeah, so I, lo- I love Hayato. that shit. Like Hayato, I love Ness, I love Gregory, all my faves. So yeah, uh, Hayato, he's snooping around now. He like witnesses Kira like break into a motel room and like kill everyone in there for some hands. <laughs> it's, it's pretty fucked up. He's like, yo, dad, you're kind of sus. I don't know. Uh, meanwhile, uh, his wife sort of like kills the cat, and then Kira finds the cat, and like and now the cat is a stand. The stand is called Stray Cat. Ooh. <laughs> and like Stray Cat, it's like a little plant cat hybrid thing that shoots out air bubbles. That's a mystery mouse tool that'll help us out later. Uh, so meanwhile, uh, Josuke, Okusa, Okiasu, and Mikitaka are hanging out one day. And they meet uh, this man, Toyohiro Kanadachi, and this dude is living on one of like the transmission towers. Like you know what I'm talking about. Like those like, like radio giant, towers. Yeah, yeah, radio towers, those pylons just outside of town. Uh long story short, uh one of the radio towers is his stand that he's living on, and the way it works is that he can't leave its uh boundaries without turning into metal unless someone else takes his place. So that's a whole fight that ensues. Yeah, okay. And Mickey Taki comes back, and that's cool. Mickey Taki's there, like I said before. And oh, yeah. I'm, I'm an idiot. I, I skipped that. And yeah, so that's the fight. Uh, oh, the stand's name, the radio tower, is called Superfly. So yeah, think of that what you will. Uh, yeah, so that's that fight. Meanwhile. Uh, literally immediately after, there's a new stand user that comes after them from Kira's father, revealed as Tiruno Suke Miyamoto. His stand is Enigma, and it like what it does, it looks. He like looks for like people's nervous tells and stuff, and once he confirms it, he's able to like trap that person in a piece of paper and hold on to it for later. <laughs> so this is a pretty wild stand battle because like. Like, one of my favorite bits is, like, a piece of paper, like, flies by Josuke, and he's, like, picks it up, and he's like, oh, what's this? He, like, flips it around, there's nothing on it. He flips it back, there's a gun pointing at him. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, uh, they eventually, uh, Josuke actually manages to, like, undo his ability and turn it on him as he realizes uh, Tarunosuke's, like, nervous tell, and then proceeds to beat the shit out of him. In conjunction with Crazy Diamond's restorative abilities, this turns the dude into a book. And this is another one of those, uh, whatever they're called, landmarks. Yeah, it's like a book that you're not allowed to rent out from the local Morio library. (laughs) <laughs> like, people say that if you read it too long, it starts talking to you, kind of creepy. <laughs> so, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Isn't JoJo great? Do they revisit these in later seasons? No. It's oh. just for Mario. It's they just they, they do Mario. show up in the games, though. They, sh- Kate, boy, boy, they show Kate up in the games where it's like, who the fuck cares? I get, yeah, true. Oh man, let's play Eyes of Heaven. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I'd, I'd love it's to so much that. fun. It's such a good game. No, so, it doesn't have local multiplayer. That's, that's the, the joke. joke. I know. I know that's the joke. <laughs> okay, so ba- so 
Meanwhile, the hunt for Kira slowly begins to reach its end as Kira gets sloppy and Hayato starts putting two to two together. He's like, you're not my father, you're an imposter. And <laughs> this causes Kira to freak out and kill Hayato by accident. So he, this causes Kira to freak out even more because now with his like fake son dead, his cover's as good as blown. And his father is like, cool, be cool, man, check this out. He gives him the arrow and the arrow flies out of his father's hand and pierces Kira. Again, a second time. The arrow did this on its own, by the way. The, the, the arrow's just going through Kira's So fight. meanwhile, the next day, it cuts to Hayato, he's alive again somehow, and Kira's like, yo, oh, yeah, I'm the shit. Yeah, this is this is happening, this is oh, all no, coming Hayato together. Again? Hayato's uh, his fake Kira's son. fake son. Like, the guy Got it, was. Kawajiri's son, yeah. that Kira took over. Yeah. So that happens, uh, and me and, oh jeez. So that happens, and Kira now has like, yeah. Well, what does he have? He has a streak. Kira has there some. Now. There's something new. There's something new about Kira now. But also, Hayato's alive. Hayato's alive, even weird? though he killed him the night before. What's that about? We'll find out. So meanwhile, Rohan calls like a contractor it's because he wants his house repaired, and the contractor's this really weird guy who doesn't like anyone looking at his back because he too was shot with the stand arrow manifested a stand, but he doesn't really have the proper willpower to use it properly. And his stand is an active threat to him as when Kira, not Kira, as when Rohan finally manages to like, like this guy goes to like insane lengths to keep anyone from looking at his back. Like he walks down the street back against the sidewalk and he's like back against like the fence and he's like shuffling along. He walks the fence. up the stairs by like kicking upwards like crab walking. Yeah, he crab walks backwards up the stairs to keep people from looking at his back. It's crazy, but Rohan eventually finds out. Uh, he looks at his back. The guy's back is like torn open as the stand jumps from his back to Rohan. And this is a little mini stand battle, Cheap Trick. That's the name of the stand. Uh, long story short, Cheap Trick goes to hell, and that's it. What? <laughs> How? They take Okay, so you remember that alleyway I, to I told you about? That alleyway I brought up when they met Remy, who and told them like, about if Kira? If you turn around, you go to hell? Yeah, he took him to that alleyway and tricked Cheap Trick into turning around. And then that's when, like, a bunch of ghost hands come from one end of the alleyway and grab on the Cheap Trick and start dragging him away somewhere. And Rohan's like, you know, I'm not much of a religious person, but just in case. And he uses Heaven's Door to open up Cheap Trick and writes, go straight to hell. Inside. <laughs> I hope Cheap Trick goes to hell no matter what. <laughs> This is fucked up, because he can just do this to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't Why? Rohan just send people to I hell? I hope Josuke goes to hell <laughs> no, no matter, matter what. what. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that. And we get like, that's a mystery mouse tool that'll help us later. So, uh, yeah. Kira's acting strange. Or, sorry, Ko Kosaku. So yeah, strange. back to Kira. He's, he's feeling really cocky as he just sort of like undid an entire death. And and the eye, I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Ooh. So, uh, Hayato is a little confused because he also notices Kira's acting a little strangely. But he decides to go about his day. So meanwhile, on his way to school, he runs into Rohan. And Rohan decides to like, uh, why does Rohan stop him again? Why does Rohan stop Hayato? Yeah. Because he knows Hayato is uh, Kosaku's son. And he wants, uh, he, he saw Hayato stalking Kosaku and wants to figure out what that was about. Yeah, he's like, hey little boy, let me ask you some questions real quick. So Hayato was like, oh man. <laughs> so Rohan's like, whatever, fuck it, Heaven's Door. He uses Heaven's Door and starts reading up like this kid's info about like Yoshikage Kira and stuff but he noticed something really weird that on the exact time and date it currently is like exactly 30 like one minute from now it says that Rohan Kishibe dies so he's like what <laughs> so so like Rohan's like what the fuck's going on and then he blows up meanwhile Kayato is like Groundhog's Day 
he's caught up in the explosion and Groundhog's Day back to the beginning of the day before he left out. So then this is where we see from Hayato's perspective that this isn't the first time this happened and he's actually trapped in like this hellish time loop by Kira to protect his identity with Kira's new ability he got from being re-pierced by the arrow called Bites, Bites the, the dust. dust. So basically how, oh yeah, this is also a cool example of a Rocky tying in ability with the song name as like another one Bites the Dust is like a really repetitive song by nature and that's reflected in like the ability rewinding the day over and over and over again. That so, is cool. Yeah. Uh, so and how does it work exactly? So okay, so how bites the dust work is it's implanted inside Hayato, and it activates whenever someone mentions Yoshikage Kira around them, or like tries to find out about Kira. It activates and puts the bomb inside of that person, and then they blow up then and there, rewinding Hayato back to the beginning of the day. But now, since that person's blown up, even if Hayato never encounters them for the beginning of like the new like repeat they'll still blow up the same time they did before and that'll keep happening over and over until anyone who's interested in Kira is dead man somebody just sat down one day and thought of this <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we found out that Rohan is also trapped in this death loop already and it's so Hayato figures this out and he's trying to like be cool and like get help without giving like setting it all but it doesn't matter because Jotaro, Josuke, and Okuyasu and Koichi are like, hey kid, we're looking for Yoshikage Kira. And then, yeah, that activates it. So now he, Kaito has like a strict time limit. He has to beat Kira before everyone dies in this next time loop or else it's fucked. Uh, yeah. So Hayato eventually manages to like trick Kira into revealing his own name publicly. And like uh, Kira is forced to like take back Bites the Dust so he can properly defend himself. Because while Bites the Dust is in Hayato, he can't use Killer Queen. I'm pretty sure that's how Yes, it. he yeah. can only use one of them at a well, no, He can only use Bites the Dust or Killer Queen. He only used one time. bomb at a time. And because, yeah, he can't use Killer Queen. So after he publicly says that he is Yoshikage Kira, within earshot of everyone, he has to undo the ability and like start throwing hands and shit. So yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, also in the opening, that's why everything started rewinding. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a fight breaks out in the middle of the street. They're fighting Kira. It's, it's pretty wild shit. Okuyasu dies, but then he decides not to because he... Yeah. <laughs> uh, wild shit happens. Uh, so Kira finds himself... So eventually Kira finds himself like cornered in the middle of town. And he like pulls over a lady and he's like, oh man, like, you know, I had a, I have a thing for hands, you know, your hands are so fucking nice. Like I have a picture of the Mona Lisa when I was a kid and I used to like jack off to it. <laughs> Wait, does he say that he... Yeah, he got a boner. It like specifically says he got an erection because of the hands of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> he like cut them out and pasted them on his wall. <laughs> yeah, he's like just, he's just, he's just molding right now. <laughs> So eventually he's cornered, he's like, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna use Bites to Dust again, you guys can't stop me, and everyone's like making a mad dash to him, but it's too late, he detonates Bites to Dust, goes back in time, and he ends up in that alleyway. Yo. And that's weird. Yo. So Kira's backed up in a corner, not backed up in a corner, but he's surrounded by the whole gang, everyone's... Everyone knows it's him. It, it's him. It's him. He's sus. So he's like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm using Bites the Dust again, and you idiots can't stop me. So everyone makes a mad dash for Kira, but it's too late, and he activates Bites the Dust, and he ends up in that alleyway. So we rewind to see what really fucking happened, and what happened was right before his like hand went down on the detonator for Bites the Dust, it turns out Jotaro managed to stop time rush in, beat the shit out of him, and sent him flying. And then, like, Kira flew directly into the line, into the path of, like, an ambulance that was backing up, and lands behind the ambulance as it's backing up and has his head ran over, and he dies. So that's why he ends up in the afterlife alleyway. And then afterwards, uh, he ends up, like, 
hearing a voice behind him and he turns around, looks down the alleyway, the one that takes you straight to hell, and he gets dragged straight to hell. Or hell adjacent. We find out what happens to him later in a spinoff. Like, oh. Dead man questions. We're, We're not, not going to talk about that. dead man questions, though. And that's the end of Yoshikage Kira. So... Remy finds peace and she ascends to heaven. Everyone... It sounds like they kind of deus ex machina him. I mean, they've been bringing up this alleyway since like the beginning of the part, though. So. Yeah, and also he's just already dead, so it doesn't matter what happens to him. Yeah, yeah, because he died dead. like back like when Jotaro beat the shit out of him, and he was like kind of hallucinating. Yeah. So yeah, now everything's done. Uh, Josuke, Jotaro. Uh, he writes like a thesis paper on a starfish he found because he's a marine biologist. He gets a bunch of money for it and he leaves town. <laughs> and everyone goes their separate ways. Josuke sees off Jotaro and Joseph and he steals Joseph's wallet before he leaves using his ability and he goes buy shit with it. And that's the end. Part four, everyone. Part four. All right, now it's time for Vento Ario. What does that mean, Ed? Uh, Vento Ario is Italian for golden wind. Golden wind? Why does he like Italian so much? Well, you see, this specific part of JoJo takes place entirely in Italy. Ah. Ooh, mamma mia. Mamma mia! <laughs> Are there any airplanes? Yes. Yes! Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Watch the Italian airplane lecture. So, here we go, uh, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Part 5, Vento Oreo, or Golden Wind, if you're mid. And when did, mid. did the manga come out, and when did the anime come out? The anime for Golden Wind came out in, like, 2017? 2018, 2018, 2018 when, the, yeah, yeah. when the anime started. Yeah, the and anime then the manga started, started in, like, the 90s, right? Yeah. The, yeah, so, yeah, this is funny because I mentioned Part... Four start, took place in 1999, but it was actually being written in like the late 80s, early yeah. 90s, and then part uh, five, this part takes place in 2001, but it's being written in like the like mid 90s. Oh okay. yeah, kind of crazy, but yeah, kind of crazy. Explain to the near future weirdness. So yeah, Italy, 2001. Uh, we see Koichi Heroes at the request of Jotaro Kujo. Uh, he flew. He was flown out to Italy to do some investigating on another important Joestar bloodline issue. Which Jojo is this? We'll get to that. Got it. So, uh, he's in, sent there to investigate a weird little kid named Haruno Giovanno, otherwise known as Giorno Giovanna. See, so the weird thing about Giorno Giovanna who? So, remember. <laughs> so, you remember when Dio took Jonathan's body and then disappeared for five years? How could I not? So, in those five years, Dio got busy and he had a son. <laughs> <laughs> and that son's name is Giorno Giovanna, the JoJo for this part. Wait, so this is 2001 and he was. Born in that five years that Dio was in the body, he must be pretty old at this point. Yeah, he's like fifteen. Wait, that happened in like the eight the eighties though, is what the confusion is. I'm pretty sure it's his grandfather. Yeah, it is his No, no, it no, is his father. Uh I I don't I think he, he his mom was pregnant and then born later. I don't know the exact details. It's it's it. it's weird, don't worry about it. Don't okay. worry about it, it's just son Dio, of Dio. Dio, Dio Giorno is the son of both Jonathan and Dio. Gay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> so yeah, Koichi is sent to Italy by Jotaro to investigate this because Jotaro recently found out that Dio has kids running around. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, are all these kids weird as shit? Hey, Koichi, check out this one. I'll, I'll look at the rest. So Koichi uh, in Italy, and he finds Giorno Giovanna. And what Giorno's kind of running a racket with the local police. He's like, he's like stealing luggage and like pretending he's paying off the cops so they don't like take him in and arrest him. 
and shit like that. And Giorno, uh, so Koichi, after having like his luggage stolen by Giorno, gives chase. He use, tries to use Echo's Act 3 to pin him down, but Giorno manages to like hit him with that no you because he used his stand, Gold Experience, to create a tree which then reflected Echo's three freeze ability back at Koichi. Ouchie. So yeah, that, that's a thing. And Koichi's like, man, fuck this. I'm just gonna go enjoy Italy. <laughs> so wait, that's kind of weird. How come he could create a tree and the tree hit the Koichi? So, go, so Giorno Stan Gold Experience, named after the Prince album, The Gold Experience, is a humanoid stand with the ability to imbue life in objects, meaning it can like take this camera, like give it like imbue life inside of it and like turn it into like whatever animal he wants or whatever living thing. Like you could turn it into like an apple or a some rabbit, shit. You could turn it into a rabbit, a snake, or it's pretty busted. It's a pretty busted ability. Like think Cars' ultimate life form thing, but a lot more thought out. Got it. <laughs> Do you, do you do you got it? Oh, I understand. Okay. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. You can just make life. Don't worry. Yeah, you can just like, create life. That's a stand ability. Do we ever get to find out where the fuck stands come from? Yes. 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 This part is where we learn that. Okay. So. So. Uh, meanwhile, I uh, Koichi fucks off because he's like not. He doesn't get a paid enough to do <laughs> shit. He's not getting paid at all. He's just doing a favor for Jotaro, and he's like, it's, it's, it's whatever. Meanwhile, uh, Giorno is like then accosted by a member of a local Italian gang named Leaky Eye Luca, who's, who's like, hey man, you're running this racket on my turf. I should beat the shit out of you with my shovel. <laughs> So, so the fight breaks out between the two of them, and we get to see Giorno stand up. Le Luca doesn't have a stand, so this is like horribly one-sided already. So, uh, uh, Giorno creates a frog and has it jump around a bit, and it distracts Luca. It's like, man, fuck you, Giorno. I'm gonna beat up this frog. <laughs> <laughs> no, the frog jumps on Giorno. Remember? Yeah, the that. frog jumps on Giorno or something. And Luca's like, man, fuck this. And he's like, sit, takes his shovel and swings it, but it hits the frog. And because it hits the frog, Giorno's, uh, everything that Giorno creates, it has the ability to like redirect the attack back to the attacker. <laughs> So Giorno, so the dude hits the frog, and, and suddenly there's like a tentative. cartoony, like, shovel-shaped dent in the back of his head, and he dies instantly. <laughs> Wait, no, what was, well, how did he make the frog? Like, what did the frog? He just, he just, like, took a piece of paper or a pebble or something, turned it into a frog. Oh, okay. So I don't even remember all that shit. Yeah. So yeah, but that shit happens, and Giorno's like, man, I told you, it's useless. I hate repeating myself. Muda, muda. Ooh, ooh. That's what muda means. Dio's catchphrase. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, but Dio's catchphrase back when he was still alive was like, muda, 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 muda. Like, whenever he did, like, the punch barrage with his stand, his stand would yell out, muda, muda, muda. <laughs> so now Giorno, being his son, does the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 I forgot to bring that up, but yeah. It's sick as fuck. It's sick as fuck. They each have like their own stand cries. He says Muda. Yeah, yeah. Black Platinum, Platinum said like Aura, 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 Aura. Fucking yeah, Josuke says, says Dora, 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 Dora. Yeah. Got it. It's sexy. Yeah. It's very cool. Stand cry is very cool. We're about to get to a cool fight, by the way. Okay, so yeah, anyway, uh, after killing Leaky Eye Luka, he gains the attention of a high up in this, in this gang called Passione. Uh, the, the top gang in Italy right now, ruling over everything, and they send their, uh, one of their captains to go investigate the death of Luca. So, uh, this man, so Giorno, he's like on this train or whatever, and he's approached by a man named Bruno Bucciarati. I love this man! <laughs> I, love this man. <laughs> I love this man! Bruno Bucciarati is like, hey, uh, are you responsible for a leaky eye Luca's death? And Giorno's like, cool, uh, uh, no, I'm not. So Bruno's like, okay. So he sits down next to Giorno, leans in close, and licks him. <laughs> well, no, he puts some, he like, like, he like, hey, Giorno, you got something in your hands. And he opens it, and it's Luca's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. What? 
Yes, with his eyes <laughs> in his hand. He was like, was like oh, see, you're sweating. Hmm, that's odd. So he leans in and licks the sweat <laughs> off a of Giorno. It's like, yeah, this is the taste of a liar, all right? Yeah, that was much needed contact. <laughs> Oh, you seen it before? <laughs> no, but you, you just said he, said he just, just licked okay, it. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, you're like, yeah, this is the taste of a liar, all right. And the stand fight breaks out. So Bruno reveals his stand, Sticky Fingers. And what Sticky Fingers is, uh, anything he touches or punches, he places. He can place a sticker on it. A, a zipper? Sticker, a zipper on it. And what he does, he can, like, unzip unzip shit and stuff. It's, it's cool. So he like, can unzip shit. Listen, listen, listen. So, cool. so like, he uses it in different ways. Like, the two main ways he uses it is like, for example, he can place like a zipper on that door and unzip it down and walk through it. Okay. Or he can like place a zipper on someone's like arm, unzip it and their arm falls off. He can place it on his own arm and extend his punch. Yeah, like he throws a punch and the he zipper like unwinds to extend can, his reach. He can place it on the ground and then unzip it and just slide across the yeah, ground. Yeah, hold on to the zipper as it zips up to like travel places. It's wild. Wild as ability. But yeah, it's so fucking cool. Uh, after a quick fight, uh, so after a quick fight, the fight leaves the train and it goes into, they're fighting in the streets now, and like, uh, Bruno uses like some kids nearby, and like Bruno, and then Giorno's like, oh, I see what's happening, look at that kid's arm, he's doing drugs, but where did those drugs come from? Your own gang, hmm. And Bruno is revealed that he really feels bad about the drug issue in this neighborhood. <laughs> and he desperately wants to do something about it, but he's in no position in Passione, and he just has to take it and do what he's told. But Giorno's like, you know, I, Giorno Giovanna, have a dream. I'm gonna take over Passione and become a gang star. Yo! <laughs> Or some shit like that. No, oh, he yeah. says that. That's gang says. star. Yeah, yeah. Gang, gang star. <laughs> Not to be confused with a B star. <laughs> but, and, <laughs> but so inspired by Giorno's resolve, Bruno decides to lend him a hand in infiltrating Passione and rising up through the ranks to do something about the neighborhood's drug issue. So they team up, and Bruno is this part's main Joe bro. Let's go. Bruno is like one of my favorite characters. Bruno's I'm really so excited. fucking goaded, though. He's Jesus fucking Christ. goaded as fuck. So, uh, so after the big fight, after their fight, and they like patch each other up or whatever, uh, Bruno informs Giorno that to get into the gang, he first has to talk to Polpo, one of the like. What was Popo's? Capo. Popo. Popo's a capo. Yeah. Yeah, one of the capos of the gang, Popo. Yeah. So just like, okay, cool. Where is he? And Popo's in prison. <laughs> but because the Passion has so much influence and stuff, they get into the prison and like Popo's like prison cell is like decked out with like TVs, like carpets, rugs. He has like a fancy couch. He's just kind of posted. he has a ball. He has a he looks like, like fucking Modoc. He looks like also he looks like fucking yeah. Modoc. Look it up, please. <laughs> He goes, he looks like fucking Modoc. Just this giant creature just chilling in the gym. Remember when I said they, that he, he that Iraqi slowly draws more and more goblins as the Yeah, 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 literally. Yeah, so, okay, so basically, Giorno talks to Popo, and Popo says, like, all right, if you want to join the gang, you got to pass the test. Here, keep this lighter lit. So he hands Giorno, like, a lighter and instructs him to keep it lit no matter what. And if the lighter goes out, he'll know, and if it goes out, he'll fail the test so it's like okay cool how do i keep it lit so no he's like okay cool do the guards in the prison know about this or so first step giorno has to sneak the lighter out of the prison because the guards are going to pat him down and take it away from him if they find it so uh, Giorno does some big brain shit. He's so fucking smart, you guys. <laughs> he's, he's really fucking smart. He's so Koichi's fucking... still after him, isn't he? Uh, Koichi's yeah. like just fucking around Italy. He's like, fuck this. No, but he sees Giorno again. He's like, hey, what the fuck well, is Yeah, let me get to that. Uh, Jesus. You're right at that. Okay, so anyway, Giorno decides. Uh, since he has to keep the lighter lit for 24 hours, the best way to do that is like at his own dorm at school. So he's like, oh yeah, Giorno's 15. I don't think I mentioned it. You did mention that, yeah. 
But wait, doesn't he have to get out of the prison first? Yeah, he gets it out of the prison because he's just so fucking smart. But yeah, he like, he like turns the, the lighter into a flower and they just think, oh, you have a flower. And then he hides like the fire inside of the bud or something like that. Yeah, he grows, yeah, 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 at the center of like the flower bud or whatever. Yeah, got it. But he's doing a bunch of stuff like this to try and keep this lighter lit. Yeah, so basically... uh Back at his dorm, he decides, he, he's like, all right, this is easy. He, like, sticks it in a piece of bread and, like, goes about his day. <laughs> Meanwhile, Koichi tracks him down. He's like, all right, I think this kid went to this dorm. I'll get my luggage back. So he comes in. Why? Why are you like this, toast? <laughs> All right, that's enough. So he breaks into Giorno's room, looking, to, he needs his passport. That's why it's really still after Giorno at this point. So he breaks into Giorno's room. <laughs> Breaks into Jorner's room, hijinks ensue, the lighter is no longer there, and it's actually put out by a passing janitor. The janitor is like, oh, cool, what's this? He lights the lighter, and he's immediately attacked by a stand named Black Sabbath. So, uh, Black Sabbath... You can't Sa take three steps in this universe without <laughs> being attacked stand by a stand. Stand users are drawn to each other. Remember That's just fate. fate. So, Black Sabbath, humanoid stand, it has the ability to move through shadows. And when it finds someone, so the way it's triggered, it's an automatic stand. I forgot to mention that. Meaning that it does its own thing while Popo just vibes. It's Popo stand. It does its own thing, and it's triggered by someone relighting the lighter after it goes out once. And once that happens, it sneaks up on the person, grabs them, and then it produces an arrow from inside of its mouth and stabs that person. This is ridiculously elaborate, but okay. So the point of this <clears throat> is that uh, to really truly join Passion, you would need to like... The, the lighter test is designed to be impossible. So no matter what you do, you'll always end up like in this, con in this like conflict. And if you get pierced with the arrow and survive it, you'll be granted a stand as well as being let into Passion. So everyone knows, so Popo knows that no one can just like keep the lighter lit and yeah. Except for Luca, that guy is just Jesus except Christ. Except the problem is Giorno already has a stand. Yeah, except the problem, Giorno already has a stand. Well, we know what happens when you get an arrow. Does Giorno that. know what happens? That was just a hyper specific event with Kira. I got the joke. Yeah, yeah, because I brought the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time is TMNT tit. Yeah. I got the Jojo socks. Look at that. Aura, aura, aura. Wait, wait, I can't see. Aura, aura, aura. Oh my god. Wow. Aura. Aura Barris. Aura Barris. You're so funny. It's Aura Barris, said. <laughs> oh my fucking god. Aura <laughs> Barris. What was that from? Why did we get into that argument? Uh, really? Red Dwarf lecture. Because Roland's been oh, listening yeah. to French people too. Oh yeah, Ouroboros. I started saying Ouroboros again because Oro of uh, because of inscription. Oh my god. What the fuck even is that? Hang on. The see. Lego Ninjago lecture will set you straight. I oh my god. <laughs> god, wait, Tyler, we gotta get back on that. Holy shit. I forgot about that. Right, did you ask me what inscription is? No, man. I'm trying to learn what the fucking Ouroboros is. It's a snake, snake eating its own tail. The Ouroboros, or Ouroboros, is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. You see the meme where it's like, damn shoddy, okay? It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah! <Lord." it's> <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. I've seen the damn shoddy, okay meme. I actually haven't seen it. It's like one of my favorite fucking things ever. <laughs> Are we recording? <laughs> my eyes! Damn shoddy, okay. Hit him with the Ouroboros. Damn, shoddy. Ow. It's my favorite one where it's like a picture of, of like the girl and she's like on the dude and biting his fucking neck. <laughs> it's like, damn, shoddy. Ow. Jackson, <laughs> send me the image so we can put it up. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, hang on. I have Instagram. There are some people watching that want to hear the JoJo lecture though, so we should get back to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, what the fuck? So, am I good to go? Yep. Like, no? Yeah. Alright, oh shit. Okay. We've been recording for two minutes. What the fuck, Tyler? Tyler, why didn't you tell us? I did. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. We've been having this conversation because we didn't know you were recording. Silly we're recording. Boy. Okay. We're recording. Continue. Okay, so, uh, where did I leave off? Okay, so, uh, the janitor, it finds the lighter, puts it out, and then he's like, oh, what's this? He activates the lighter again, and this triggers Popo Stan, Black Sabbath, to attack the janitor. It does this by, like, 
reap like ripping out his soul, producing his arrow, producing an arrow. It looks at him as like you are not worthy, and then it stabs him with the arrow anyway. And then he, he stabs his soul with the arrow, kills his soul, I guess, puts the soul back in the janitor's body, and the janitor's dead. The janitor looks like Mario, by the way. <laughs> oh, like yeah. A little detail. Mario is dead. Because he, he was dies not worthy. JoJo. Mario fucking dies. This is the second Mario to die in JoJo. By Mario true. was not built to survive in the world of JoJo. It's true. So, basically, uh, Black Sabbath, uh, very powerful... It, and then, uh, because I think Jorno also picks up the lighter after the janitor drops it, Black Sabbath turns its attention on him. And then, like, it grabs him, and it's about to stab him again. And he's wondering, like, wait, I already have a stand. What, what'll happen to me? But before he can answer that question, Koichi intervenes with, like, Act 3 Freeze, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And, like, weighs down Black Sabbath so they can get away. But it's too late, because Black Sabbath is now locked onto Jorno, and he has to deal with this thing without getting pierced, hopefully. So, the fight breaks out. They're fighting. Uh, in the shadows, uh, Jorno does a thing to draw it out of the shadows. He, like, makes a tree, lures Black Shadow into the shadow of that tree, and then Jorno kills that tree, causing it to disintegrate, wither, and die, destroying its shadow, and forcing Black Sabbath out into the sunlight, where he then proceeds to beat the shit out of it. Muda, 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 and it disappears for a bit. But this stand being an automatic stand, the damage is not transferred back to Polpo. In fact, Polpo has no idea any of this is even transpiring. And yeah. So Giorno explains himself to Koichi, meaning that he stole his, his uh, luggage and his passport and his social security number because he has a dream to become a gang star and change passion. I need better. your IP address, <laughs> I Koichi. I need, I, need, I need to become a gang star. I need to become a gang star, Koichi, please. So Koichi's like, you know, he's just like the other Joe stars I met. He seems pretty cool, and he writes all this down in a letter to Jotaro. And Jotaro was like, "All right, I understand." Jotaro but is a season four guy, season three guy. This guy from season three, he Who stuck around, up in supporting four. character in season Got four, it. and this is his only appearance in season five. But so Koichi like like calls Jotaro on the phone, explaining the Jorno situation to him. And Jotaro's like, "All right, well, he seems normal, but get out of there because I think shit's about to pop off in Italy." So Koji's like, okay, cool, I'm going on vacation. And that's the last we see of the part four game. <clears throat> so uh, Giorno returns back Does that to... exist for anything other than fan appeal? I mean, yeah, it's set up too. this part. It's well, it's a way of connecting part four to five. Yeah, like like how uh, part two ended with Giorno heading to... Not jo jo Joseph heading to Japan. Got it. And shit like that. Because otherwise it, there would be no connection. <laughs> We're all with a completely different group of like people now. But also, it's really fucking cool if you're. Yeah, it's it's, it's yeah, nice it's awesome. yeah. Passing on the torch and shit. So yeah, now Giorno, uh, he so Giorno, twenty four hours pass and he, tap the lighter lit. So he returns. He sneaks it back into the prison with Popo. Popo was like, "Oh, Giorno, my boy, you did it. You're a member of Passion. I'm proud of you." And Giorno's like, "Cool." But but jo Popo is the guy responsible for peddling drugs in the neighborhood, so he's gotta go. So, uh, Giorno does. Oh, wait, is my thing someone? Yeah, okay. I I don't actually know if you have it someone. You know what happens here, right? Yeah yeah yeah. So Giorno, uh, as a revenge for the innocent janitor who lost his life, Rip Mario, and then just for like being in his way in his quest to climb up to the top of the ranks, he kills Popo by having gold experience take a gun and he turns that gun into a banana, right? So then <laughs> Popo grabs the banana gun thinking it's a normal banana and he goes to take a bite. But as he takes a bite of the banana, he accidentally pulls the trigger of the gun and shoots himself in the head. Damn. <laughs> Part one was a fucking dope for real. Part five is just the goat part. Part five is kind of is just the base part, base yeah. the gold pill. <laughs> so 
Uh, after officially being indoctrinated into Passione, uh, Bruno meets up with Giorno again, and he wants to introduce him to the rest of his team that he's been, like, patrolling the neighborhood with. So here he gets taken to a restaurant, and we meet the gang. We meet Narancia Girga, Guido Mista, Leon Abaccio, and Panacata Fugo. As you may or may not have noticed, uh, another naming trend Araki brings in is this part. In this part, is that he likes to name all the Italian characters after food. Yeah. <laughs> well, this part it's food, right? Yeah. Just this. This is the only part where he has like a specific naming. Thing well, this is the him. first part because he does that in part six. Does he? With fashion brands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Part five, it's food. Part six, they're named after fashion brands. Is it all the Italian characters in part six are named after fashion? No, no just, all of just, them. Just everybody, all these like random Florida people are <laughs> named after like guests and shit. But anyway, yeah, like Gap Man. Gap. <laughs> but anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> you figured it out. Holy yeah. <laughs> oh my god, we'll get into that. We'll Anyways. Get into that. So yeah, uh, Nirancia, orange, you know, Guido Mista, that's a food, I think. I think it's fish, right? Guido? I'm pretty sure that's fish. I, I don't know Italian. I'm not Italian. Mamma mia. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, they're introduced to the team. And Abakio, he's like the oldest, most uh, grizzled member on the team. And he's like, who's this fucking twink? I'll show him. <laughs> they're all twinks, though. I <laughs> I'll show him. So he seeks out, so he wants to like play a little prank on Giorno. So he like takes like the pot of tea they're all drinking while they're waiting for Bruno. And he like turns it around, takes it, he unzips his pants and starts pissing in the teapot, right? So then <laughs> afterward, he takes the teapot, puts it back on the table, he's like, hey, new guy, how about a drink on me? <laughs> So he pours the cup of piss tea, and he's like, come on, it'd be rude, pretty rude of you to not accept this most generous gift. So Giorno, he picks it up, lifts up, and he smells that it's very clearly piss. So he's like, bet. And he <laughs> draws that shit out. Piss drinker Giorno. Why? Why? So, so everyone's like, what the fuck? Did he just drink piss? Bro, you're crazy, new guy. You're crazy. How'd you do it? Whoa. So Giorno's like, well, I just used my stand ability, and I'll be happy to tell you mine if you guys tell me yours. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So how did Giorno drink piss? I know. <laughs> Tyler, can you figure this one out? If you could imbue life into anything, how would you drink piss? <laughs> I would turn it into a bunch of little beta fishes that I would swallow. <laughs> All right, how does he do it? Okay, so the re so Giorno drinks piss, but he uses his life imbue ability to turn one of his molars, I think, into a jellyfish. Now, jo jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> now, seeing how jellyfish are like mostly composed of water, the jellyfish molar instantly sucks up all the piss before Giorno can even taste it. So now he just has like a tooth full of piss. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what, what Giorno was thinking, but it impressed everyone else. And they're like, all right, new guy, you're legit. See, I thought he just drank the piss and used this as an excuse to get everybody's stands out of the way. No. <laughs> so yeah, the gang is impressed. And now we move on to pressing matters. Popo has recently committed suicide. <gasps> <laughs> Whoa, how did that happen? Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> Popo didn't kill himself. <laughs> okay, but anyway. Uh, Popo committed suicide, and it's apparently rumored that he has a secret fortune hidden. So, Bruno is assigned as, as the, this is like a test for Bruno, to go out, secure Popo's hidden fortune, and like properly return it to the gang, and if he does that, he'll be promoted to Capo in Popo's place. So that's the plan right now, help Bruno move up, so Giorno can move up. If he shines, they shine. Anyway. So they decide to head up. So Bruno, being one of Popo's trusted, uh, already knows where the treasure is, and they gotta get a boat from the docks. So, and the treasure's hidden on like a uh, fucking Capri or whatever. 
So they hop on the boat, they're sailing to Capri, Italy. Is it well, literally a pirate treasure hunting show now? For like a gangster, while. gangster treasure hunting. Gangster treasure hunting for a while. So me so they're on the they're on the it's a yacht. They rent a fucking yacht, because they're just rich gangsters, I guess. They rent a fucking yacht, they're sailing to Capri, but me little do they know there is someone on the boat. So, uh, so another member of Pascio overheard the rumors, and he decided to like hitch a ride to, to take the treasure for himself. And that man is none other than fucking where's his name? Ma oh wow, Jesus Christ! There's an yet another Mario Zucker. <laughs> <laughs> This Mario is not gonna make it out very well. Uh, and his see. stand, Soft Machine. Now, what Soft Machine does? It's like a little green man, right? But it has <laughs> like a giant needle where its middle finger should be. And what it does, if it scratches anything with that needle, the object like sort of deflates like a balloon. So he does this. He uses this on. So yeah, he does this. He takes like everyone, like most of the people are like Guido, Mista, Narancia, and who else? Fugo. Those three out the way, and and they're hidden somewhere. But like big brains it because Bru no Bruno big brains it because it turns out he's like accounted for some weird shit like this happening. So it's so it turns out Bruno reveals that he like had he unzipped before they set off. He unzipped the yacht they're on and stored another yacht inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> so he unzips this yacht and jumps onto the other yacht, exposing Mario. They beat him up. He cuts his head off using like Zipper Man's power. So he's like deca decapitated but still alive. And they start to interrogate him. We get the torture dance. Yo! And then they just do that until he like burns to death. We get the torture dance. They like. We should uh, add that to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> we get the torture dance. And like, hey, who else is working with you and all that shit? Whatever. Blah blah blah. <clears throat> oh, this is the first time we see uh, a Baccio stand. Moody Blues. Moody Blues. <gasps> oh, a, I love that band. Yeah, Moody Blues is a humanoid stand with the ability to replay people. So what it does is like he picks a random person, he picks a person, picks like a time and date, and it shows up on the stand like a dot, like like a display on the stand or whatever. And then like the stand morphs into that person and reenacts what that person was doing then and there at that specific time and date. And uh, yeah. So yeah. The creative stand abilities really keep all these fights interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but this is how they find find out about like the whole two ships thing, and Bruno's like, "Oh, cats out the bag and shit." But yeah. Uh, so anyway, they make it to Capri. Uh, Mario Zakiro has been properly dealt with. Uh, mm. Did they just leave him on the boat there, or did they? I'm pretty sure they just left him on the. Yeah, boat. they just left his this like after torturing him. Yeah, they torture for him a bit to get info, then they leave his head on the boat, and yeah. Uh, so, uh, now they're on the island of Capri, and they gotta split up and search for the treasure. Mista uses this as a chance to reveal his stand, Sex Pistols. Now, Sex Pistols is like, kind of a... I count it as a colony stand. It, yeah, it is a colony stand, you're right. I didn't think about that. Yeah, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's a colony it's stand. It's a colony and stand. And it's how it works, is that uh, uh, Mista is like the group's like marksman. He has, like, he's the gunman. And so he has like that classic like revolver with like the six bullets and shit in it. And sex pistols, uh, it like loads, it helps him like reload the gun faster. And when he fires the bullets, they go out and like they kick the bullet around, like redirect it so he can do like crazy trick shots and all that shit. Oh, I feel like I've seen this somewhere. They also like ride the bullet as well. They, like, it's like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Oh yeah, also another fun little detail about Sex Pistols is that Mista, uh, he has a phobia of the number four. He's absolutely terrified of it. And this manifests in his stand as there are six sex in six individual instances of Sex Pistols. And they're all numbered with like a number on their forehead, but they're numbered one, two, three, five, six, seven. Nice. <laughs> 
But and and uh, because of this weird numbering, uh, the other Sex Pistols they have like some kind of sentience, and they always bully number five <laughs> because number five is actually the fourth one. So yeah, that's a fun. It's one. also there's also a thing where whenever Mista has four bullets left, he's really paranoid about it, and he thinks like he's gonna lose the fight. Yeah. He'll, I think this sometimes you I think sometimes he'll even shoot an extra shot just so he doesn't yeah. score. Also, this is really funny because you look at his character design and he's covered in like diamonds and squares and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's fun, fun little Me detail. Don't uh, trigger. Um, because my the temper side. Uh, yeah. So anyway, oh, the camera. Mista reveals you, his iPhone, and sex pistol. Yeah, hand over. Uh, Misa reveals to Stan Sex Pistol and he teams up with Giorno to go out, scour the island. And uh, while they're out running around, they actually find Mario's partner in crime. Whoa. Uh, what was his name? What Luigi. Was his name? Uh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Luigi. Luigi, is it? I was just joking. It is not Luigi. It's his partner, Sale. Sa or Sale. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, it's Sale. It's Sale. I think it's Sale. Sa Sale! It's like food, though. Like, right? I don't know. I just called him Sale. Say Whatever, no it doesn't matter. You this know how man, he's there on the island also looking for Popo's treasure. And he's getting in the way, he's getting in Mista's way using his stand, Craftwork. Now, Craftwork is a humanoid stand with the ability to sort of like lock objects in place, sort of. And then another cool thing he's able... Oh, oh, what? Is everything all right? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay. Okay, so he's able to like use his stand ability to lock objects in place, and he does this by like there's like the island of Capri has lots of like cliffs and dips and stuff. So he simply like takes like a pocket full of rocks, throws it out, and uses his stand to like freeze them in place, and he just walks across the walk the rocks in midair and shit. Kinda raw for real. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing he can do with his stand is that he can build up potential energy by like tapping an object he's already locked in place them releasing it and having it like fly or fly off in like whatever opposite direction he's been tapping it in, you know? So yeah, he uses that and it's like him and they like he and Mista get to a fight get into a fight. He like locks Mista's hand to a side of a truck and it just starts driving around. It's it's crazy. It's a crazy fight. Shit happens. But uh uh yeah he beats uh Mista beats him by like shooting him in the head. But it doesn't work because Kraftwerk Kraft stops, the, stops bullet. the bullet before it really pierces his head. And All then right. Misa just says, like, fuck it. And then just shoots the bullet some more until it fully, like, buries itself in his skull, killing him. Oh, yeah. In this part, we're killing people now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We just, we just kill people, yeah. Never thought about that. We haven't been killing people. Enough. Yeah, for, like, a while. <laughs> So yeah, the team finds the hidden treasure. Uh, no, we've just been imprisoning them in rocks and letting them float in space. Yeah, now we're just straight up killing people. We're done, <laughs> we're done playing around. It's the Godfather. <laughs> okay, so uh, they eventually find Bruno. Eventually regroups and they leads them to where he hid the treasure in a public restroom. He unzips the urinal and out falls the what. The 600 million, like, prize treasure liar. or whatever. Liar. Is that what it's called? Yeah, liar. liar. That's Italian currency. Yeah. Damn, you're weird. Okay. So <laughs> falls the 600 million liar. And they're like, sick. With this, uh, Bruno can move up in the ranks, and it's cool. So Bruno returns the treasure to the gang, proving his worth, and he becomes capo in Popo's place. And he's assigned a new mission. It's to protect the boss's daughter. Ooh. Uh, this mission is presented to him by a man named Piracolo, and Piracolo is there with the boss's daughter already, a young girl by the name of Trish Una. Now, Trish Una is the boss's daughter, of course, I said this many times, and, like, she's the target of many rogue assassins that splintered off from Passione for their own various reason, and he explains that, uh, the reason she's such, like, a hot commodity right now is that, uh, the, they're trying to use her to, like, find out who the boss is, because the thing about Passione is that no one knows who the boss Wait. is. <clears throat> How do they know she's the boss's daughter if nobody knows who the boss is? Uh, I don't know. Piracolo is, like, one of the boss's most trusted. Like, yeah, so I guess he's like, hey, this is my daughter. I'm going to bed. Good night. Good night. Good night, Yeah, what the fuck is this? 
What the what? There's like shit on my screen. Take <laughs> <laughs> it off for you. You gotta stop shitting your screen. Okay, we're good. So now they have a new mission: protect Trish, no matter what. Uh, so they they soon get, they go about their their mission is to protect Trish and deliver her to the boss and await further instructions. So meanwhile, they head out and they immediately and Narancia immediately runs until one of the traitors Piracola was talking about, like one of the people that splintered off from Passion and like a group. What was the group? The, the Squadra. Squadra. Jinx. Like a, that was really hot, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like a narcotics group in Pastion. They splintered off from Pastion because they were being paid less than they thought they deserved. And they were like, pay us more or we quit. The boss obviously didn't pay <laughs> him more. So they called it quit, splintered off, and now they're trying to get to the boss directly. I hate fucking unions. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the first member of La Squadra appears, a man by the name of Farmaggio, and he, and he, cheese. Uh, he the cheese man, and he attacks Naracha <laughs> with his stand, Little Feet. Now, Little Feet, it's a tiny little guy. It has like this another spike thing, middle finger, but when it stabs you, you start to shrink. Nice. Ooh. And so it's like you gotta fight a shrinky boy, and you're shrunken as well. Yeah, so he shrinks Narancia and like makes Narancia fight like a bunch of fucking rats and spiders and shit. Before. Why not just step on him? Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> that's the idea, like shrink someone enough and then just like. But, but like, but Narancia, Narancia, cause yeah, but Narancia like face. caught on and like got away. But now he has to like fend for himself got as like it. a little tiny guy. So it's not like he's in a cage and the guy's like throwing rats. And no, him. no. Okay. Well, like, there, there is the scene where like he, he puts Narancia in the bottle with the tarantula, right? Yeah, but Narancia manages to break out with his stand. Narancia's stand is revealed to be Aerosmith, and Aerosmith <laughs> is an RC plane that shoots actual bullets. In a, it, Italian. Is it an Italian plane? It's an Italian plane. <laughs> it's a bomber plane. Part yeah. of the, it's a bomber? It's yeah. a bomber in the Italian Air Force? Yes. yes. Oh, that'll be relevant. <laughs> so, uh, Aerosmith. It's like a little RC plane he has. It shoots real bullets, has real bombs. It's pretty cool. That kind of sucks as a stand, though, given what you can end up getting. Yeah. I, it's it's I, a pretty good stand. It also has the ability of, like, uh, CO2 detection that he uses when he's like not directly there so he can fly around pick up on like people's breathing and shit and like hone in on them okay. like uh he he like does this by like dogging the shit out of uh formaggio first and formaggio tries to like hide in a group of rats he like un he like hangs hangs on to like one rat and like it's just hanging on while it like runs away but uh narancia uses like co2 radar and notices like one rat is breathing heavier than the others because it's carrying something. So then he targets that rat, blows it the fuck up. It's, it's cool, it's cool. So basically, uh, shit happens, the entire street's on fire, and but Narancia manages to pull through and he defeats Formaggio. Woo! He, he pumps in full of holes like the Swiss cheese he is. Yeah. So now the gang has to get to Venice because. Uh, <laughs> Boss, they're trying to get the daughter boss. Oh no no no! They gotta get the key, right? Yeah, they have. Okay, wait. Okay. What happened with the daughter and the boss? They're trying to get the boss. They're protecting the boss's daughter, and right now they're trying to bring her back to the boss. Yeah. Why do they need the key? Uh, the boss has like a bunch of like sick like safe thingies in place to like make it difficult to get to him. So if they actually want to get to the boss, they gotta like do all this extra shit too. Because the boss is like a very paranoid man, and he wants to keep his identity secret. You know. Got it. So they get an email from the boss, and then he says like he left the key somewhere, and that key is important to getting in their ship. So uh, Brujarati Narenta needs to stay behind and protect Trish while Giorno, Baggio, and Fudo head to the ruins of Pompeii to obtain this key. There they there they encounter uh, the next member of La Squadra, uh, Elusio. Elusio and his stand, a man in the mirror. Now, man in the mirror is a humanoid stand. 
kind of similar to Hanged Man, but it's not bound strictly to uh, reflections and shit. <clears throat> Rather, it's able to like access the mirror world and drag other people into it. So uh, he does this. He does this. He drags like Giorno and everyone in there, and it's pretty fucked up. But he also drags Fugo in there. While well, Fugo summons his stand, Purple Haze. Now, Purple Haze is a humanoid stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's like three stands we're explaining at the same time. I mean, I mean you, you get how Man in the Mirror works, right? Keep going. Reaches out the mirror, drags you into it. Okay. You're in the mirror world. Oh, there was a horrifying Goosebumps novella about that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Purple Haze, Fugo stand. Uh, it's... It's uh, this humanoid stand, purple, white patterning on it, diamond shape, whatever. Uh, what it does, it has like these virus capsules on it. And when it punches stuff, it breaks the virus capsules on its knuckles, causing a virus to spread. They rapidly like consume whatever's nearby indiscriminately and like just melt it and liquefy it essentially. Uh, yeah, it's pretty dangerous stand. Uh, so dangerous, in fact, that Bruno, I mean, not Bruno, but Fugo himself is barely able to control it. And this ties into, like, Bru Fugo's whole thing where he has, like, anger issues and shit. And, like, his anger issues kind of, like, flare up and become a hassle for the rest of the team. And it's manifested through his stand also being a danger to the rest of his team. Ooh. I like it when they use his the stands as a means of psychologically examining the characters. Yeah. And not, like overt stuff like oh i'm scared of the number four so my stand can't do it but, like, <laughs> deeper personal issues there's a museum of strawberries in belgium <laughs> so yeah fugo stand uh shit and happens uh Bru uh giorno makes a little brick snake brick snake chilling uh, they trick Illusio into dragging them out of the mirror world because while inside the mirror world they can't use their stand So he tricks them dragging them out, but he does this in range of uh, Purple haze which just goes <coughs> ape shit on him and like liquefies him with the virus capsules And then yeah, it's pretty cool. They beat purple haze everyone's poisoned though with the virus But it's cool because we got the brick snake now it's created within the virus cloud So Giorno uses its blood to create a vaccine and then Abaccio is like I don't believe in the vaccine It's all fake news. They're gonna put a chip in me. So Abaccio dies Next Cut. Up. Okay, we're recording. Okay, we're ready. Yeah, okay. Uh, where did I last leave off? Uh, brick snake uh, Abaccio didn't want to take the vaccine. So he dies. Wait, is that what happened? No, no, no. <laughs> they do make a vaccine for a purple hazes virus using the blood of the brick snake that was created within the virus cloud and then like they give it to everyone and it's all good. But one guy doesn't take it? No, that's that's a joke. Okay. That was, joke. <laughs> that was weird. You have to ask with this <laughs> Okay. So the group find the so amongst the ruins of Pompeii, the group manages to find the key that the boss left there and it's like a literal fucking key. And he says that they have to take it to a train station so they could get to Venice, blah, blah, blah. Shit happens. They find a turtle, right? So they put the key <laughs> in the turtle shell and it activates the turtle stand, Mr. President. <laughs> and Mr. President. You remember the, the turtle's name? Oh, yeah. The Coco turtle. Jumbo. The Monroe song? Uh, no. Okay. But, it's... The co but the name of the turtle is Coco Jumbo. Yeah. The turtle stand. The turtle stand. So what Mr. President is, it's like, I guess you can call it a bound stand. Yeah, it's bound to the key. It's a bound stand, which has like a room inside of like the little gemstone on the key. And the gang from this point on used that room as like the little restroom. Like, like, the break room. So while, like, they have, like, one person walking around carrying the turtle, while everyone else is, like, relaxing in the room until, like, shit happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's the convenient way to not have to animate characters. <laughs> yeah. Or draw characters, yeah. Okay, so the gang, they got the turtle, they board the train, they head to Venice. On the train, they run into two more members of La Squadra, Prosciutto and Pesci. So, Prosciutto and Pesci, they decide to team up and use their stands together to kill the rest of the gang. So, Prosciutto uses his stand, Grateful Dead. What Grateful Dead does, it emits, like, an aging fog that ages people uh, based on, like, temperature and shit. So, basically, the, the higher a person's temperature or the surrounding temperature, the faster the aging effect and vice what versa. What the fuck? 
<laughs> you gotta stay cold, bro. Yeah. So everyone on the train rapidly starts aging, and the gang has to figure out what the fuck is going on before they're too senile to do anything about it. Meanwhile, Pesci uses Pesci knows about this ability, so he counteracts this by having like a glass of ice, and he's like just like sipping on like cold water. Not Pesci. Pe oh, right, because you're talking about the two that. Yeah. Doing. And Pesci uses his stand. Beach Boy. Now, Beach Boy is a bound stand, uh, object stand, takes the form of a fishing rod. It's a pretty good fishing rod, I'll leave it at that. But he's able to like fish pe fish for people through walls and shit, it's, it's wild. It makes him a fisherman of men. Yeah. A, f a man fisher. A man fisher. He's a Beach the, Boy. He's the man fisher. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, fight ensues. Uh, Bruno is raw as hell, uh, Prosciutto is raw as hell, he gets thrown off the train, but he uses his resolve, and shit happens, blah blah blah, Pesci learns how to kill people, blah blah blah, <laughs> Bruno kills Pesci, right? and, <laughs> and uh, at the end of the fight, uh, everyone's like recuperating, it's like, wow, that was crazy, and uh, we see Trish, She's like, hey, what the fuck is that? As she sees, like, Grateful Dead sort of crumble away as Prosciutto finally dies. So it's revealed that Trish is able to see stands, meaning she herself is a stand user, but we don't find out what her stand is until later on. Ooh. So, meanwhile, uh... Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, meanwhile... The gang leaves the train and they're trying to like hotwire a car so they can drive the rest of the way to like Venice or whatever. And they're stopped by another member of La Squadra, Malone, in his stand, Babyface. So Babyface is like a really weird, fucked up stand that I, is a humanoid. It's yeah. a computer, no. Yeah, it's humanoid a computer. stand that looks like one of those superhero squad computer laptop. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Like those, those, those fake, like, play laptops you go buy yep. roses. Got like, it. Like that. And he, like, types in, like, ooh, make baby. And the stand is like, okay, make baby. And it, like, impreg impregnates a random woman nearby. That, and it, 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 like, creates a stand baby homunculus off her, like, emotions. What weird fetish porn is this? <laughs> JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's probably the weirdest stand so far. And then it creates a little stand homunculus baby thing that goes after the gang and tries to kill them by like eating them. And it's able to like, re <laughs> it's able to like freely uh, alter the like, the, the the molecules or whatever of shit. I think because it like breaks, it breaks into the it breaks into the little private break room they have, and it like traps some of the gang by turning them into like furniture. So it goes out and like. It's, it's, yeah, what weird I don't remember half of this, this shit. I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, Giorno easily manages to beat it though, and that's the end of that fight. The, 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 they kill Melon because Melon is like, what the, what the fuck, bro? <laughs> You're fucked. Melon definitely has a foot fetish. Anyway, the, we finally make it to Venice. Woo! And while the gang is driving their stolen car to Venice, they run into yet another member of La Squadra. This time, it's Gaccio, and he's coming at them with his stand, White Album. What is White Album? White Album is the first ever wearable stand that we see in the series. Oh, wearable. wearable meaning that the stand manifests as a suit around the user's body. So that's pretty cool. Very Italian. Very Italian. And what White Album does, it has the power, it has like cryokinesis, and it uses this to freeze the ground in front of it and like skate along it. So you, you so you have like the gang booking it across this bridge, and then you see Gacho behind him like I skating behind him, like, <laughs> keeping up with the fucking car, keeping up with the fucking car. It's a really sick fight. Oh, that eventually ends with them going off road. They fly off the bridge. Abaji Gaccio tries to like freeze them in the water underneath, but big brinking, big big brain, big thinking. Uh, Mista makes like a surfboard out of seaweed. It's crazy. <laughs> Give him. And Mista and Giorno team up 
to uh, pierce the back of his neck, his only weak weak spot on his suit. And that's the end of Gaccio. Ooh, fuck that guy. Gaccio. Gaccio. The, he has this ability called... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. But before he goes, like, final stretch of the fight, he activates his ability, gently weeps. Where he gets, he freezes, he gets so cold, he freezes the air around him. And he uses those ice crystals to, like, deflect Mista's bullets and shit. But Mista keeps firing anyway as a sign of his determination. And it gets to, he's just stalling for time so Jorno can jump in and deliver the killing blow. But it's, it's a pretty sick fight overall. Goated. And then what happens after the fight? Because Mista's pretty fucked up after this. Oh yeah, Mista is very fucked up. He's dying. So Jorno luckily uses his life-giving ability to like... So Jorno can also use this ability to heal people, but it's less healing like Crazy Diamond or more like just replacing shit, I guess. Yeah, like he replaces your Because Mista, with Mista new ends up like full of like his own bullets that got redirected back at him. So Jorno just like turns those bullets and like makes them a part of like the blood vessels and arteries that they pierced and punctured to like sort of like fix everything, make them good as new. But this process is really painful. And then also on top of that, it unfortunately looks like Jorno's giving him like a blowjob from yeah. a distance to which Naranchel walks over, sees this. He sees like Mista cry like, oh Jorno, sp- go easy on me, be gentle for it. Oh. And, and, and Naranchel's like, oh shit. Like, holy cow, hey, these yo. bitches gay. Good for yeah. them. Good for yeah. them. Does he say that? No. No, he just watches in <laughs> silent horror and then backs off. As these two people have oral sex in front of park because they're not. But kidding. not. But not yet. Yeah, but that's what it looked like, unfortunately. So yeah. And Wait, but the creator like acknowledges this. Yeah, it's like a funny moment. Like it's a funny moment, like, oh go easy on me and the rest is like, bro, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> like, oh don't look bro, don't look, it's just ah, oh, whoa. That's a beautiful sight. Yeah, this is really adding to my theory that the writer of JoJo is gay. Oh, you think? <laughs> and, and has to explore these themes sub-ironically. <laughs> Is he married? Yeah, he's married. He has like a whole daughter. <laughs> a whole daughter? <laughs> <laughs> I only have half of one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the gang, uh, why are they going? They're going to Venice to retrieve the final disc that will lead them to where the boss is. So, they obtain the disc after dispatching Gaccio. Gaccio's dead, by the way, re-killing people. And takes them to the island of San Giorgio Maggiore Island in Italy. So, uh, the instructions is... Uh, uh, one member of the team is assigned to take Trish into the tower, up the elevator, and hand her over to the boss where they will receive further instructions. So Bruno volunteers and leaves the rest of the gang sitting outside waiting and shit. So, Bru- so Bruno's in the elevator and he has like, uh, the first time in the series, like act someone has like, <clears throat> takes the time to check in on Trish and see how she's doing in all of this. Cause from, tr- cause all we know about Trish is that she's dragged away from like her normal life into like this wild shit going on. And we find out that Trish is actually pretty terrified and doesn't honestly want to meet her father because she's never known him and why does she have to meet him now? This whole thing doesn't Wait, really make sense. Wait, why hasn't right? she mentioned this earlier on this fucking Because, okay, so, ev- okay, also in the time frame of this, this whole part, the entirety of part five takes place in a week. These past two fights happen back to back in the span of like a day. Still, why hasn't she said anything? Like, shit was popping. <laughs> like, but we haven't exactly had a moment to talk yeah, about Yeah, we ourselves. haven't really had a... This is, like, the only moment... The first quiet moment the gang gets to, like... Just They've been hanging out in that fucking magic room. I know, but it's, like, only for, like, a day. <laughs> you, you, you think in a day you can... Well, it, the... it, it comes up now. It doesn't matter. It comes up now. And so Bruno is like, oh, don't worry, Trish. No matter what, I'll be with you every step of the way. So Trish vanishes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, most of her vanishes. Most of Trish vanishes because uh, while they're going up, Bruno is holding her hand. And he's still holding her hand, but the rest of her is gone. <laughs> So this is when Bruno finally realizes why the boss was so adamant on bringing Trish to him, and it's so that he 
knows that they can use Trish to find out his true identity, but because he's so paranoid, he doesn't want anyone else to get rid of her but him. So they brought her all this way to the boss so he can kill her himself and further seal and secure his own identity. Realizing this, Bruno's like, fuck Passione, I hate this shit, and he turns traitor and starts to track down the boss to save Trish. So we're gonna have a little bit of a fight. So we have a little bit of the fight, and we finally encounter the boss for the first time. Does the boss have a stand? The boss has a stand? Holy and shit. And you won't believe this what the Do we know what the stand's name is yet, or do we learn that later? Uh... I don't think it's much of a spoiler to say what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, we find out what it is. Okay, so anyway. So anyway, oh, oh, we get a little uh, Bruno's backstory here. <laughs> so, Italian guy. Uh, <laughs> was he involved in the Italian Air Force? Uh, no, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, Bruno was a young boy. Uh, living a happy little life when his parents Bobby. suddenly got divorced and he decided to stay with his dad because he knew his dad uh, Had like no one else essentially and he wanted to be there for him. So he's with his dad. Everything's fine He's like helping his dad fish and shit making money when suddenly one day his boss uh, I mean not his boss his dad like witnesses a drug trade and the drug traders notice this and try to like assassinate Bruno's dad, but they fail and Bruno's dad ends up like in the hospital and shit so uh, they eventually track down his father and try to kill him while he's in the hospital. But Bruno is there waiting for them, and he kills them, protecting his father. Bruno is like 10 years old, by the way, when this is happening. So at the young age of 10, Bruno takes his first life. And first three lives, right? First three lives, and it's pretty sick. And he finds out these drug traders were actually a part of Passione. So he goes out and joins Passione to gain some sort of immunity so they leave his father alone. But it's a double-edged sword as his father eventually dies from his wounds. And he's left, like, becoming the very thing he wanted to, he wanted to stop. It's, it's pretty fucked up. Pretty sad. So sad for Bruno. Bro, rest in peace, Bruno. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> so cut back to the present. Bruno confronts the boss, and the boss reveals his stand, King Crimson. Oh boy. Bro, that's a stand. So, King Crimson has the power to erase time. Okay. This, this is super this is super simple, okay? So basically, uh, imagine time as like a strip of film, right? Each event happening in order along the strip of film. The specific event here is you're reaching down, picking up an apple, taking a bite of said apple, and putting it back down. Does he just erase the time for you, or does he erase that? It's global. Bit? Okay. Mm. But basically how King Crimson works, he's able to erase time 10 seconds at a time. And when that happens, he's more or less cutting out the in-between. So it lets, so the, the apple, you pick it up, take a bite, and put it back down. He erases the action of you lifting up the apple and taking a bite. So it just cuts to the apple having no, the apple being whole, and then it cuts to the apple having a bite taken out of it. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Are, are you sure? Yeah, I follow. Well, okay. So that's how his ability works. He erases the actions and leaves the results. So he does so he uses this ability to brutally murder Bruno for daring to defy him. Well, I mean So he's just cutting the time out, right? So if he's cutting out the slash in between, he still would have to slash him, so he'd win without the power. What? Okay, so this is a little... We're going to learn more about how it works later, but basically it's a it's a bit more complicated than that, and it's really hard to fight. Got it. It's, it's really hard to fight, yeah. But, like, you... If you're not aware... Like, you'd have to be aware of when, like, time is skipping you have to, to like, be aware of what is happening yeah. during the fight. And so right now you're just confused as to what just happened. Oh, it's ridiculously disorienting. Yeah. yeah. Like, you, you go to punch him, and then all of a sudden you have a hole in your stomach, and you're, like, in a lake. Got it. It's kind of like the world, but just explained differently. A little bit, yeah. The world? The uh, stop the time. time. Yeah. Oh. A so little bit like time, that. You're erasing time. He's skipping time. Yeah, or, yeah, sure, that. Yeah. Time erases, time skip, whatever. Anyway, 
So yeah, he uses this ability to like sort of give Bruno a glimpse. He gives Bruno a glimpse of this by as Bruno runs up to punch him, it's actually Bruno running up and then he reveals that Bruno's actually punching himself 10 years, like from 10, like not 10, 10 years, years, from 10, 10 seconds, seconds in the future. And he's confused, so he's like, what? And he turns around and then he turns around and he sees himself running up on himself about to punch him and he's like, what? <laughs> It's, it's it's very it's a very fucked up ability. Anyway, Bruno dies. He gets donut. You know he, the boss oh, sneaks no, up behind Bruno. him, turns him into a donut. Rip Bruno, the homie. Yeah. But before this, uh, I'm pretty sure Bruno is able to get Trish away from the boss and like puts her arm back on with a little zipper, a cute little zipper, and sends her out to regroup with Giorno. Uh, so eventually, Giorno. God, what, what was this exact order of events, Roland? Uh, I can't remember, but I think, like, uh, Giorno realizes that something's up because time keeps on Yeah, 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 yeah. Giorno and... notices, like, time is, like, sort of jumping when they're outside. Because, like, uh, he sees, like, uh, like Narancia and Mista fighting over, like, a box of chocolates. And now, suddenly, Narancia has all the chocolate in his mouth. So he, like, notices something's up. So he goes in to check it out, and he sees, like, Bruno's, like corpse with like a giant hole in the center of him and he's like oh god bruno no so he uses his life imbue ability to like try and save bruno and he succeeds he brings bruno back to life by by putting some pumping his life energy into him Ooh, let's Man, go it's better than crazy dumb. whoa so that means that bruno That's is not bruno dead is right thinking. bruno is not dead bruno is now alive again he's once again yeah he's living he's roaring he's roaring, roaring like a lion and he, fit, he patches up that nasty hole he's got. Bruno's good as new. It's like Prince Philip walking around. He's roaring. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Bruno, uh, having recovered from, like, fucking dying and shit, uh, announces to the team his plan to go rogue and essentially turn against the boss and take down the boss. And he knows it's crazy and stupid, and if they don't want to join him, they're free to leave and do whatever. So he, he jumps on the boat and he's about to set off, but everyone makes like a big speech like, actually, Bruno, you're cool. We're sticking with you 100% of the way. And this goes on and everyone jumps on the boat to join him except Fugo because Fugo is like, are you fucking insane? I'm leaving and he leaves. <laughs> yeah. I'm going home and he goes home and Fugo's out for the rest of the story. I, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not, but Fugo was originally going to come back later on and they retconned it. Yeah, so so, so basically what happened, uh, uh, there's like a lot of like debate about what really happened here, but what we know is that Brun is that a, a Rocky while writing this part was like this specific moment wasn't really in like the best headspace. He was kind of depressed from like external factors, and like his original working in a fucking sweatshop. Yeah. yeah, and like his original plan for Fugo was to have Fugo like go and then come back and reveal to be like a traitor working for the boss. But he was so bummed out of the idea of like a longtime friend turning out to be like a backstabbing traitor and shit that he just had Fugo disappear from the story entirely. And then so we, we got the spinoff Purple Haze feedback. But then Fugo, they, he fixes that later on in like a light novel yeah. starring Fugo. Wasn't it also because he thought that Fugo's ability was too like fucking busted? I feel like it was that, but it was yeah. mostly because like he was just, didn't want to bug himself his out. What ability even. again? He was uh, to create Purple like Haze. the virus that just instantly right. melts people. Yeah. It, yeah. So yeah, everyone stands Fugo, jumps on the boat, and heads off to betray the boss. Ooh, let's go. So while they're sailing off, uh, Bruno uh, sort of like sticks his hand on a nail, but he doesn't really react. And on top of that, he doesn't bleed either. Hmm. Giorno, only Giorno notices though, hmm. and it's kind of weird. Ooh. Hmm. Are you sure Bruno's alive? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's alive. All right, all right. So. Oh, is he a fucking zombie? <laughs> no, he's alive. Duh. <laughs> so, Narancia. Oh, okay, so the gang start, heads out to Sardinia. 
to start looking for the boss's origins and shit, like where he came from, all that stuff. Along the way, they run into, okay, all the members of the squad are dead, and now they're facing off against the boss's elite guard, because everyone knows that they're turning traitor and coming for the boss directly, so yep. now they gotta fight all of his personal bodyguards. Do they so, make sense? Yes. <laughs> so first off, we see Tiziano and Squalo. Tiziano with his stand talking head, and Squalo with his stand clash. So talking head, it's like a parasite type stand. He places it on someone's tongue, and it keeps them from telling the truth. They say like the opposite of what they mean, and he uses this in conjunction with Squalo stand. Uh, Squalo stands clash to like sow chaos and like have the person be unable to properly like explain what's going on so clash can just rip people to shreds clash is a it's not a humanoid stand it's like it's like a shark it's a, like a robot shark and its ability is that it's able to like freely jump from liquid to liquid so so it's able to so they first use it on they both gang up on narancia where like narancia's sitting at a restaurant and he like picks up like he lifts up like a spoonful of soup and like all of a sudden a clash jumps out of the spoon of soup, rips off Narancia's tongue, and then that lets uh Tiziano come in with talking head and put it his like his stand in place of uh his tongue. So now uh Narancia's trying to explain everyone explain to everyone what's going on, but he keeps saying like nothing's wrong, everything's a okay. What he means to say is there's a fucking shark in my stand. <laughs> Also, Tiziano and Squallow are a Tiziano couple. and Squallow are they are very much canonically much gay and it's canonically gay. gay together. That's pretty fucking gay. In the nineties, yeah, that was crazy. Pretty wild, yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. The anime really plays this up. <laughs> like it's cool. Because like they know their audience by this point. <laughs> well, like in the in the manga, like because it's the nineties and you have they're like, oh, Tiziano, my dearest friend. Yeah, and then in the anime, they're like, they're like, each they're other's like chest. caressing each other's chest and shit. I fucking love <laughs> like, that. <it's> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so yeah, this fight goes on, and uh, this proves that Narancia is in fact homophobic, as he does <laughs> kill both of them brutally. <laughs> He quickly became homophobic. He was for the greater good. Wait, what's up, Tyler? You can mass murder gay people without being homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, upon realizing this, Narancia quickly became homophobic. <laughs> and he killed the two of them, unfortunately. Rest in peace, Tiziano and Squalo. So the gang escaped from uh, whatever fucking random ass restaurant they're at. And, oh, they're still in Venice. So they leave Venice in search of an airplane, and they find like a little abandoned little airport. And with a plane, ooh, it's Tyler. There's a plane at there's the Italian plane. airport. Whoa! Oh, how are they, what are they gonna do with this plane? They're gonna get on the plane, but before they get on the plane, they run into another one of Diavolo's elite guards, a man by the name of Carne. Who is getting in between me and my plane? <laughs> Carne. Carne begins to manifest his stand, but right before he can do anything, Mista shoots him dead. Fuck yeah! He's like, fuck that shit. And they all board the plane and they fly fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a bomber? Uh, it's not a bomber. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pilot. What are they called? Private like? jet. It's a plane. Oh, private jet, yeah. It's a private jet. It'll a little do. mini private jet. It'll do. <laughs> so. Uh, so everything's nice and fine on the plane, but then they realize, oh. Abakio uses Moody Blues to play back what the pilot did, to, so they can follow where the boss Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is a plane the boss previously took. Got it. So he uses Moody Blues, and Moody Blues transforms into the pilot and reenacts what the pilot was doing when he was flying the boss. So that's how they get to where the boss is going. What a ridiculously specific and good usage of that pilot. I love yeah, right? it's shit. It's so good, it's so good. Uh, so they're on the plane, and they notice something's weird. Uh, there's a stand on the plane. Not just any stand, but the stand of the guy they just killed? Hmm, wait, how is he? Well, you can't, if you die, your stand dies. I know, but this is one of those, like, special occasions. Araki likes to do that to, like, really shake shit up, you know? And shake shit up, he does, because this stand is none other than the notorious B.I.G., 
a now rogue automatic and invincible stand because there's no user to kill. You can't kill this thing. I want to add this as well because this is what, like, I know I'm talking a lot, but this is one of my favorite parts is that it's named after B.I.P. Oh, yeah, please tell okay. me. Okay, so this is another, this is like a really dope instance of Iraqi once again drawing in, like, music into the, like, the design and function of the stand. The stand is named after the, uh, rapper, Notorious B.I.G., Biggie Smalls, you probably heard of him. And, like, the thing about Biggie Smalls is that he was tragically gunned down in a drive-by accident, but, like, around a month or a week later... I think it's six months after he died. Six months after he died, uh, his final album was released post-mortem, post-mortem, called Life After Death. And this stand reflects that as the stand ability activates after the user dies. Woo! That's so fucking cool. That's I love so this shit. Cool. Fucking weeb. That's a fuck you. <laughs> Italian <laughs> Air Force <laughs> fan. Undertale Did you say Italian hater. Air Force? Italian Air Force fan. Look at you. Undertale loser. hater. <laughs> All right, go on. Man. How do we beat a guy that can't be beaten? Uh, By beating him. You see, basically, Notorious B.I.G. Uh, since it's now an automatic stand acting on pure instinct and instinct alone, it latches out at anything that moves, and it eats that object. After it eats that object, it grows bigger. So you essentially have like this invincible blob growing inside of a plane that's like. 1300 feet up in the air no way out these are pretty fucked this is where trish finally does something super cool and her stand finally manifests as she's cornered by notorious big she's freaking out she's panicking this thing's about to eat her and she hears a voice that tells her to shut up and calm down cut she looks around and that voice is none other than trish's stand talking to her her stand, Spice Girl. <laughs> Her, st this is Spice is Girl. Is past where you've watched Jackson? Oh no, I've watched this. Well, part six comes after this, and that's like half animated right now, so. Got it. Okay, so Spice Girl is one of my favorite stands, just because of like how much personality it has, independent of the user. It's so fucking sick. Like, halfway through parts, but that's it. Like, uh, so, so basically, uh, Spice Girl's ability is that it has the ability to make things soft. And what? it's so... <laughs> <laughs> like my Grinch skin. <laughs> no, like soft as in, like, malleable. Got as it. in, like, a trampoline. No, or just, like, malleable. Like, uh, yeah, whatever, you get what I mean. And Spice Girl tells Trish, this is because anything anything that is soft is more unbreakable than any diamond. Slow. Rafflecopter. So Spice Girl, like, so it's, it's really funny because Spice Girl being Trish's stand is just Trish talking to herself. And she's like, her stand is telling her to like, keep cool, we got this, we're, we're not in any real danger. So Spice Girl proceeds to like, beat the shit out of uh, Notorious B.I.G., lets out its own stand cry, wanna be, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> beat this shit out of B.I.G., it's so good. So, they just beat B.I.G. by being better? Uh, no, no, no. Spice Girl, like, gives Trish, like, the headspace, like, calms Trish down so she could think properly and come up with a plan. That plan is to, uh, unzip, get everyone in the front of the plane, unzip the rest, and drop it in the ocean with Notorious B.I.G. inside. Got it. So they do that. They drop Notorious B.I.G. inside the ocean, where it remains for the rest of the story. Forever. Forever. It, it actually becomes like a natural phenomena. It's like this roaming like creature now that roams the ocean attacking and eating random ships and no one can really do anything about it. So yeah, fun fact. <laughs> Imagine sailing across that <laughs> shit. I'll... Imagine being the real Biggie Smalls and running. <laughs> and Matt, if I'm, if, if I come across B.I.G. while I'm sailing, I'm mad. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> Bro, what the fuck? All right, continue. So yeah, the gang skydives, see with free falling, but everything's cool because I think uh, Trish uses Spice Girl. She softens something, and it like turns it into a parachute for them to use to like slam down. They're they're good. They're good. Okay, 
Yeah, scared it. Alright, where did I last leave off? The gang managed to defeat Notorious B.I.G. by dumping it into the ocean. And uh, with this, they finally reach Sardinia. Now, Sardinia is important because it's the boss's hometown. And they hope to find out some clues about who the boss really is so they can finally take the fight to him. So, uh, quick aside, so also, meanwhile, somewhere else on Sardinia, as the crew is landing after the big fight, there is a young man, and he's chilling. He's walking down an alley. This young man's name is Vinegar Dapio. So, Dapio, he's like, oh, he's like a polite little pink boy, you know. He's like, oh, I'm Italian. Follow <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> me. His name's Vinegar. And he's... <laughs> He's going about his way, chilling, walking down this alley, when he's confronted by a fortune teller who divines his past, and, uh, and like, he's pretty spot on with these readings, like, scarily so. He's like, oh, man, why do you want to know about my past, man? Ugh, cut that out. But the fortune teller is like, no, bro, your your aura is crazy. I gotta read this shit. Please, please let me read your fortune. I'll pay you to let me read your fortune, bro. So Dapio starts changing a bit, and he's like, hey, bro, cut that out. There's no reason to look into my past. Why do you want to know who I am so bad? And then this is when uh, Dapio begins sort of like transforming and stuff. He gets taller muscular and shit, he like picks up the fortune teller and like spins him against the wall. Uh, and uh, Yeah. Uh, he, he picks up the fortune teller, pins him against the wall and like demands he stops trying to look into him but the fortune teller insists. So Dapio manifests his stand, King of Crimson, and kills the fortune teller. Ooh, poor dude. Tyler, do you remember her King Crimson? Uh, yeah. I remember he was a stand that introduced earlier and he had a scary power, but I don't remember what it was. So <laughs> the guy's gonna race time. He's it's the oh, boss. Yeah, he's the, the, the boss, boss is boss. Yeah. The boss But he's yeah. also now. Hey, 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 you should shut up. That, that is that Dopio the boss? So, yeah. Dopio. Uh, so right before killing the fortune teller, the fortune teller gives him a fortune of, of the one of the remaining, the last member of La Squadra is still alive and he's coming straight for him. Another man by the name of Risotto Nero. Ooh. Ooh. What is his stand? Uh, we'll get to that. Alright. So later, uh, Dapio, he's out walking by like La Costa Smeralda. And he's, 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 uh, he gets a phone call. From what? Uh, not, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Not a traditional phone call because he's walking and then he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like Dopio's doing that. Like he himself is stopping to make like the phone call ringing noises. So he's like, oh God, my phone, where did I put it? So he, he crouches down, he's crawling around and he picks up a frog, right? Okay. He picks up a frog. He is like, "Hey, hello." And like, <laughs> he's like, "Hey, hello." And it turns out he's getting a special phone call straight from the boss. <laughs> That's pretty Ow. fucking sick. So the boss is like, "Dapio, Dapio, you gotta listen to me. Risotto Nero, he's nearby. I'll lend you just a fraction of my power, King Crimson, and I want you to deal with him. You can do this, Dapio. I believe in you." So, uh, so Dapio, <laughs> so Dapio uh, manifests a portion of King Crimson's power, that being uh, the secondary ability, Epitaph, which is like an angry little face on his forehead. Roll. I always thought Do Epitaph was Dopio's ability, not King Crimson's. I mean, like he says, I want you a piece of my power, and an right. Epitaph appears. Okay, maybe I'm just stupid. So I, I just, I, I just assume it's like the whole set. So, after uh, gaining access to Epitaph and just like the arms of King Crimson, uh, the fight between them begins. Risotto reveals himself and his stand, uh, Metallica. So, his stand. I wonder if that's a reference, too. <laughs> so, I think it's a Metallica. 
Go ahead. <laughs> so Metallica is yet another colony stand, but this one's weird because it doesn't have any, it doesn't manifest itself. It manifests itself within Risotto's body. It shows up as like these little like silver thumb dudes. And what Metallica does, it like uh, controls uh, magnetism. So it uses that to like create iron from like the sand, create iron objects out of sand and shit, like knives, and then he like flings them at Dapio and stuff. But not only that, he's able to manipulate the iron from a from anything, including inside of Dapio's own blood. So what he does, he forms like razor blades and scissors and knives inside of Dapio and for and like drags them out of him. <laughs> and there's and it, it, it's like he's just coughing up like razor blades. Yeah. And like, like Dapio and like, like keels over and starts coughing up you, like blood and Have you talked blood. about what Epitaph does yet? Oh yeah, Epitaph, by the way. Epitaph uh gives Dapio the ability to see ten seconds into the future. And so he's like he's looking into the future. So Dapio's like looking into the future to find out what he does and he sees like blood splatter. Do you know if there's a connection to the song? Because I know Epitaph from Kring Simpson, which is really Yeah, because, nice. like, Confusion will be my Epitaph. And it, like, ties into, like, King Crimson just being a disorienting stand. Right? Boo. I, yeah. What do you mean, boo? There's, there's a lot more. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm sorry, Tyler. I'll link uh, some videos. I know there's a lot between Risotto Nero and Metallica, but we don't need to go into that. Yeah. Uh, so, the fight continues... Uh, Dapio's like coughing up blood and stuff. So, uh, another thing about Metalli Metallica, in this fight in particular, you kind of, like, it's a common fact you kind of need iron in your blood to function as a person, is that's what's carrying, like, oxygen around. But all of this iron is, like, being, like, turned into razors and expelled out of Dapio's body, meaning that he eventually he starts, like, keeling over because he's starting to suffocate because there's not enough iron to like carry oxygen through his body anymore. His blood turns all gross and yellow. It's fucked up. Uh, and he he's breathing. He's not breathing well. But this is okay because this is all according to plan. Meanwhile, the gang just arrives in Sardinia, and and Naranjia sends out Aerosmith to go searching for anything weird that might lead them to the boss. And what does he see? He sees one guy breathing really hard and something that's not breathing not that much. He was like, oh, what's over here? He goes, fires, and he shoots, he uses Aerosmith, he guns down Risotto Nero, saving Dapio. Ooh. No, wait, there's like one specific scene where like, where like uh, Risotto Nero figures this, figures out that this is happening and tries to use Dopio as a Oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah, Risotto realizes that Naracha is nearby and is about to gun him down. So he picks up the boss, he, he picks up Dapio, who, who is the boss? He picks up Dapio. Wait, but Dapio is the one who got the power lent to him from the boss. But where's yes. the boss? We don't know who the boss is yet, but like Dapio is very tied to the very, boss. Very Dapio is like intrinsically linked to the boss. Got it. Okay, so but anyway, uh, so so uh, <laughs> Risotto picks up Dapio and uses him as a meat shield to stop Aerosmith's bullet. This is when uh, Dapio uses the full extent of King Crimson's ability and erases as as, <laughs> as Aerosmith fires the bullets. Dapio simply erases the moments the bullets hit him and they pass through him, hitting Risotto behind him. Awesome. Yeah. Very awesome. Risotto dies because of this, and, and Dapio is like, all right, we did it, boss. <laughs> he still needs oxygen, so he like tracks down a frog, he eats the frog, he tracks down the kid, he ties down the kid, he drinks the kid's blood to get his eye <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty On. All right, uh, where was I? Uh, Diavo... Tiavolo, right? Dapio uh, straps down a kid and drains his blood to replenish his own iron reserves after losing all of his iron in the fight against Risotto. And so Dapio is running around dressed as a kid. He joins the other kids. They're all playing a ball game down at the beach. Who else is at the beach? Abaggio is at the beach. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> So uh, the kids, so one of the kids knocks a ball up onto like a little branch. Dapio, I mean, not oh, Dapio. Abaccio climbs up. He's like, hey, kids, here's a ball. I'm like, wow, thanks, mister. <laughs> 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 and 
as one of the kids runs by, one of the kids is actually Dapio in disguise, and he like uses King Crimson to donut Abaccio. <laughs> Fuck. And Abaccio uh, slowly dies while no one else is around to see it. Ooh. Well, he's at like a bus stop, isn't he? No. Can you um, stop talking? They're, they're oh my god, you guys just talking and talking. I... They're at the beach, bro. You were wrong. I'm sorry, I'm getting my scenes mixed up. <laughs> there are a lot of them. Ironically, I've watched it and I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Alright. So there are a lot of them. <laughs> so, meanwhile, so mm -hmm. quick rewind. What Avachi was doing down at the beach, they tracked down a statue that the boss most definitely, like, hung out at back in his youth, back when he was still like somewhat young and stuff. So Abaccio has Moody Blue standing there, rewinding back to that specific point, the boss was standing there, so they could see his face. So, but while that happens, the whole thing with the kids happens, and Abaccio unfortunately ends up dying. But before he ends up like fully passing away and his stand crumbles away, uh, he, man he manages to reach the exact date and time the boss was standing in that one spot, and he has Moody Blues take his face and slam it into, into the base of the statue, leaving behind a negative imprint of the boss's face. All right. Oh yeah. So yeah, pretty based, pretty based. Meanwhile, Abaccio suddenly finds himself at this bus stop, which is weird because he was just at the beach. What's that about? Oh man. Uh, he, he sees the, so this is where we get some of Abaccio's backstory. Ooh. So Abaccio was once a young, inspired, uh, young aspiring uh, police officer who joined the police force because he wanted to make a difference in the world and create a better Italy for everyone. Like all police officers. <laughs> that quickly fell apart when he accepted dirty, mem dirty money from a criminal and decided to let him go once. He's like, whatever, it's just one time. But he runs to that same criminal again later on while he's with one of his partners. And the criminal's like, oh, come on, man, you remember me. And then he pulls out a gun and he shoots, but his partner pushes a Baccio out the way and dies because of it. So now Abaccio is constantly haunted by this fact that because of a moment of weakness, his partner was killed and he's constantly replaying that moment over and over in his head and that manifests as Moody Blue's ability to replay events that happened before and yeah. Comment. Yeah, so back to Abaccio, he's at the bus stop. There's a police officer doing an investigation nearby, and he notices the police officer is his partner. Oh no, what's happening? Oh no, his partner is like, don't worry, Abaccio, you did a great job. I'm proud of you. Abaccio starts crying. He's dead. He's in the afterlife. Oh no. But you didn't mention the scene where it's like, hey, I'm waiting for my bus, and the other guy's like, there is no bus. This is the last stop. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Oh, is there man. any particular reason we're following this character into the afterlife? Uh, just to, like, kick you while you're down. Yeah. Because we see him, like, actually die, but then this really just nails him. Like, he's dead! He's dead! Like, like if, when you're reading it, you learn about all of these characters. And like, you grow it's kicking you while you're down. So yeah. as they die, there's supposed to be, like, this emotional recoil that happens yeah. from it. And that's going to be a continuing theme for the rest of these parts. Gotcha, so it gives you a little hope, and then it's like, oh no, it's Yeah, it's, it's like, psych, yeah. bitch. So yeah, Abaccio unfortunately passes, and everyone takes it pretty hard. Oh man, oh, it's so fucking sad. I can't, pretty even, hard. I can't even do this scene justice. Tyler, you gotta watch this shit when you No, watch for real, it's literally like one of the most emotional fucking scenes like, in the entire, like, right. series. Like, it's, it's so fucked. fucked. But anyway, they mourn Abaccio, but they realize that he was able to make a negative imprint of the boss's face. So they're like, all right, come on, guys, we got a job to finish. And they're like, all right, cool, let's head out. So meanwhile, uh, their gang is contacted with by a third party who's been watching them this whole time. And he's like, hey, I know what you guys are after. Come to Rome and I'll give you an arrow. That will that'll give you the power you need to stop the boss once and for all. Hmm. Oh, we finally remember where the arrows came from? Alright. 
Oh, we're good? <laughs> Important. I'm just ready for some fucking answers. <laughs> the, is, does this happen, doesn't this happen now, or does this happen after the next fight? Uh... It happens now. Alright, let's go over it. Let's fuck, go, come on. Fuck the ripple, by the way. Fuck the ripple, by the way. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, what? What's wrong, Ed? Do you not know the... Do you not have this in your notes? It's not in my notes, but I know it. Okay, okay. so basically, uh, Green... Greenland... Sometime pre-antiquity, like ancient, ancient Greenland, prehistoric times. Wasn't expecting this. A meteor crashes, and this meteor is made out of like this crazy, like metallic ore that, upon piercing someone, uh, it like infects them with this virus. And if the person survives like this virus in its full power, they're granted a gift. That gift of being a stand. Stands come from aliens. Stands yeah. are caused by alien viruses. Oh, that reminds me. Did we ever figure out what was up with that one person claiming to be an alien? Mickey Taki? No. No, we don't. it's literally it's not left even, like, ambiguous on purpose. Yeah, it's there's a fan, there's a theory that he is an alien and he's he just is a an species alien. that has stands. Yeah. That's why he doesn't know what a stand is, because that's just what their aliens are. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, long story short, stands are caused by alien viruses carried over by this meteor that landed in, in Greenland and shit, and yeah. And if you're too weak to overcome the virus, you die. You die. Yeah. That's why some people would like survive the stand arrow in part mm. four, other people wouldn't, that's, you, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So yeah, cut back to the present. Uh, the gang is on their way to Rome to meet up with this mysterious man, right? And um, and as they arrive, they it's like a quick trip. There's no nothing in between. They arrive in Rome. Uh, Ed, they arrive. What, what's up? Ed's not prepared for this. You're story. not prepared. Be quiet. Ed's they arrive in Rome, and as they arrive in Rome, the boss. AKA Diavolo. I think I think we get his name now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do we know anything about Diavolo? Uh Diavolo is like a split we find out that Diavolo is like a split personality manifested by Dapio sometime Got in his it. youth that sort of hijacked his life. Also, who was Dapio again? Dapio was the guy that killed uh, Risotto Nero and ate a frog. Yeah, but when did we get introduced to him? Um, he was hanging out in the alleyway and he killed the fortune teller. Got it. The fortune teller was prying into his past and he yep. turned into Diavolo and killed him. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, the boss's name is Diavolo and he oh, noticed... that explains the power transfer. Yeah. Yeah. The boss's name, Diavolo, and he finds out the gang finally arrived in Rome to meet somebody he doesn't know who, but he doesn't care because he calls him the worst of the fucking worst. The absolute scum of the fucking earth. His two main men, Sicolata uh, and Seco. Ooh. And the two of them team up with their stands. Sicolata uh, comes through with Green Day, and Seco pulls up with Oasis. And it's a fucking bloodbath. Holy shit. <laughs> So, uh, basically, Sicolata Stan, Green Day, Humanoid Stan, green, green, gross little mushroom man that shoots out these mold spores, right? And the thing about these mold spores is that they, like, it is the, oh, God, Jesus Christ. They're, like, instant, they're, like, they go based off of elevation. Yeah, they attack they based off so of elevation. So the lower you so go, the stronger these molds get. The higher you go, the, the weaker, weaker they get. get. But the higher you go, like if you like, so if you're at like the bottom of a like a bottom set of stairs, and you like the mold activates, you're fine. If you walk up, you're fine. But if you take a step back down, then the mold attacks. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So ground zero is just where it gets you at initially. Yeah. yeah. So it sucked to get it like top of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, so, but this is crazy, right? Because uh, Sicolata is like a madman and he doesn't give a shit. He's like flying around in a helicopter, dumping this mold spore all over Rome. So this shit is attacking everybody. There's like the two drunk guys hanging out on the steps. One of them like boosts balances and falls backwards and he's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> Does the world in general still not know about stands at this point? 
The world like, in general does not know about. The world sneakers. in general does not know, but like people are noticing, like, 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 like a dude like trips and falls and dies. Like, it's <laughs> like that's up. weird. People are driving downhill. They die in the car. The car crashes. Fires, explosions everywhere. It's so fucked up, bro. Oh my god. Meanwhile, Sikolata is like reveling in this. He's flying around in this helicopter with a little camcorder and he's recording everything. He's like, this is it. This is it. This is it, Chief. World star. <laughs> World star. Oh my <laughs> god. So this fight's going on. The gang splits up. Uh, everybody goes after Sikolata, leaving Bruno to fight Seko. Now, Seko stand Oasis is another uh, wearable stand. It like manifests around him as a suit, and what it does, it lets him like die. It lets him like dive into solid objects, turn solid objects liquid. You know, so he does. He uses this to like swim through the streets and shit. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Like at one point, he attacks Bruno by like gathering up a bunch of like dirt and shit in his mouth and like spraying it up out of his mouth and as it leaves his radius it solidifies and like spires and starts raining back down like like wow shit very cool. and like they work together too so oasis buries people oh yeah like, yeah also oasis dead. is running around like dragging people down to like trigger <laughs> it's so fucked up which would be terrifying if you couldn't see it yeah yeah this is insane <laughs> the rome incident the Romans. 2001, the Romans. Romans. Is this mentioned later on the series? No. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, so Jor okay, I wanna I really wanna talk about this fight. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so Jorno, uh Jorno teams up with Mista to take down Seko, so he ends up scaling a building and shit, and like like they do, they do a little cool team up combo move. Like, like Jorno is like, "Don't worry, Mista, we got this." So they like, <laughs> like, like lovers pose together. Like Jorno like caresses Mista and he helps Mista steady his gun. Mista fires the gun and then Jorno uses his power on the bullet to turn it into a vine that grows out from the building it hits, giving them a means to climb up and like get in range of Seko to start fighting him proper. The gri the the vine also grabs the helicopter and pulls it down. No, that's something else, right? No, that's what that's how they get the okay, helicopter okay, down because okay. they're trying to stop it. Yeah, so they do this, they get to the top of the building, they're fighting a bit. So so they corner uh Sikolata in the helicopter a bit. He's cornered, he's trapped, and like uh fucking Mista sends the sex pistols in to like go investigate while Jorno like preps his big boy move. So he finds out that Sikolata is like so determined to beat him. Oh, Sikolata was like a surgeon previously. Okay. So he has like surgical expertise and he used that to like torture people on the table. Like he like cuts them open and keeps them alive as long as he can before they eventually die. And he's like recording the whole thing. Like, oh man, this is so fucked up. <laughs> but yeah, so he eventually uses that expertise on himself and like starts dissecting himself while inside the helicopter and he plugs himself up using his mold that doesn't have any effect on him because it's, it's his mold and he's like sending around like bits and pieces of himself scurrying around the helicopter <laughs> to beat the shit out of Brute to beat the shit out of Mista it's wild it's so fucking crazy but long story short uh, five out of six Mista sex pistols end up incapacitated so Mista's kind of out of it right now what are, what's Mista's motives again? Uh, he's just part of the Passio. He's he just wants to see them to their end. Yeah, he wants, he to, wants to help them stop the boss. He wants to see it through. So this leaves Jordo, who's like, just like runs up. I think uh, something happens. Uh, long story short, a uh, bullet ends up lodged inside of Seiko's head. But he's like in Seiko mode, so he doesn't care. He's going crazy. Chocolata, right? you mean? Or he's in Chocolata mode. He doesn't care. He's going crazy. And so, uh, he, so eventually, uh, Giorno's like, whoa, hold on, man. And he, like, goes on this long-winded monologue about just how fucked up he is. He has, like, a broken femur. Six of his ribs are broken. Like, that shit. He's going on and on. And then Sikolata's like, ooh, I'm gonna kill you, ooh. But he's actually stalling for time because the bullet that got lodged in his head was actually imbued with gold experience and life-giving properties, turning it into a beetle larva. And, <laughs> and Jorno was simply doing that monologue to buy time for the larva to grow and mature before eventually 
burrowing out of Sikolada's head. And then this is when Giorno runs in with gold experience and he starts beating the shit out of him in like the longest beatdown in the series to date. In the manga, this goes on for seven pages. Seven pages. Like, you, I see the page, he starts beating him up on the first page. Like, yeah, I get him. And I look over, he's still beating him up. I flip the page, it's still going. I flip the page, it's still going. I'm like, stop, stop, he's already dead. <laughs> Oh god, it was so crazy. Like, forever, like, like 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, and then he gets launched into a garbage truck. And then, yeah, and then he gets launched into a garbage truck for being a garbage person. Hell yeah. And that's that fight. I just, I just really love that. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so anyway, uh, Bruno's dealing with Seko. He beats Seko by blowing out his eardrums because he, while he's diving around, he uses sound to like find shit underneath the fake water ground or whatever. Yeah. So he blows out his eardrums, then proceeds to beat the shit out of him and tosses him in the same uh, garbage truck along with Sikolata. So they're gone, out of the picture. And now all that's left is to get into the Coliseum and meet up that weird meet up with that weird stranger they find, they, they, they're talking about, right? So- What's the point of doing that again? Uh, because this man claims to have a means, like claims to have an arrow powerful enough to give them the power to stop Diavolo and right. his time skip ability, King Crimson. <clears throat> so the gang gets into the Coliseum. They're looking around. Where is he? They see a glimmer of light. They look. They see, they see a man in a wheelchair, but there's something familiar about this guy because he has like the hair, but it's super tall. And they look closer. It's none other than Jean-Pierre Polnareff. All the way for part three. Can we say him again? He was, he was Silver Chariot. Sword guy. Sword guy. Keep going. Uh his sister was murdered and he joined the group. Yeah. To stop to find his sister's murderer. French guy. French. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what got you. So yeah, Jean-Pierre Pony is back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's looking worse for rare as he's now like wheelchair bound. And it turns out oh, we get a little flashback sequence. So a little bit after the events of part three, uh, Jean-Pierre Polnareff does like some archaeology shit. And that's where he first encounters uh, Diavolo, or Dapio as he is. And that's where Dapio uncovers, like he unearths another arrow and uses it on himself and develops King Crimson in that moment. Polnareff just calls up Jotaro and decide, and like he wants to wait for him so they can both go at him together. But he's like, no, I got this. So he goes to take on Dapio on his own and gets his shit fucked up. And now he's in a wheelchair. Uh, <laughs> he like gets like his... I forgot exactly how like messed up he is. Isn't his legs metal? Aren't most of his limbs metal now? Yeah. Because like they were just blown off? Yeah. The, and the important thing is... Like, like Diavolo thinks he's dead. dead. Yeah, Diavolo thinks he's yeah, dead. Yeah. Yeah, so also... Uh, we find out that... Uh, ap uh, t along with the normal stand arrow that Dapio used, he also uncovered something called the Requiem Arrow. Now, the Requiem Arrow, now, as you can assume, the stand arrows are made from, like, the same meteorite that yeah. fell in Greenland. But the Requiem Arrow is special because it's made of, like, a higher concentration of that meteorite ore. And then, it, like, as a result, it gives, like, more powerful stands and, like, upgrade stands abilities and shit like that, you know. So he has one of those in his possession, and he plans to give it to the gang. Oh. Nice moves, Tyler. <laughs> nice moves, Tyler. Ah, that's pretty sick. He has the Requiem Arrow in his possession, and he plans to give that to the gang so they can use it to achieve a power greater than King Crimson and finally defeat the boss. But it's useless because the boss already arrives and he reveals his true form in a really dope sequence where he's like marching up a set of stairs and we like, he does the time erase thing. 
but we see it from his perspective as like the world falls away and he like transforms into Diavolo before everything comes back and like, like he's walking sick. up the stairs behind a pillar and he just sort of transforms from Dafio. Yeah, 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 yeah. As he walks, as he walks up, he like rips off his shirt, it's showing so like a fishnet top. Yeah, he's wearing like a beat. fishnet top and like clown pants. <laughs> <laughs> the gayer you look, the more powerful you are. Yeah, that's the that's the rule of thumb. So, so Diavolo's here. This is not a part of the plan. As a last-ditch effort to keep him away from the Requiem Arrow, Ponair pierces his own stand with the Requiem Arrow. This causes it to transform into Silver Chariot Requiem, which, uh, with ha which has like the express purpose of keeping the arrow safe. And it does this by putting everybody to sleep. Like, like it really, in Rome. It, everybody in Rome, it knocks everyone out. So, and not only that, it swaps their souls around. Okay. And now remember, because uh, Diavolo and Dapio were split personalities, they're considered having two souls. So two people are like separated from Diavolo, or I forget how it works, but Diavolo and Dapio are two souls, they get split, so it's weird. Yeah. So Dapio hey, ends up in one bar. Why all of Rome? Um, because he's trying just, to keep the what, arrow safe, and the yeah, arrow was like, just, okay then. Yeah, when he the used the arrow soul on Silver Cherry, it like gave his a mind of its own. Yeah. yeah. So now it's acting on its own to protect the is, arrow. I actually don't know, is that a rule of thumb that Requiem stands act on their own? No, it's just with that stand, because Ponyard didn't have the proper willpower to wield it. Yeah. So that happens, body swap, shenanigans ensue, and that just when they finally figure out who the boss is, they lose him again because now the boss is one of them? So... <laughs> someone's sus here. Someone's sus. Who's imposter? I want to know that this was the episode where my mom walked in and like it was just, like, uh, it was Mista and Trisha's body, and he's like, wow, I feel really itchy right now. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it was like... Thank goodness my mom did not say a thing. Uh, I was like, oh man. God. How old were you? Uh, 18. <laughs> so, uh, so everyone comes down to the streets and now they're like chasing after Silver Chariot Requiem, but they find out no matter how close they get to Silver Chariot Requiem, it always appears directly op opposite of them. Like, like it's like a shadow being cast off of some kind of light source. So Diavolo realizes that the light source is his own soul, and it's right behind his head. So he reaches behind him. Uh -oh. Who is Bruno? Bruno? Bruno. Bruno. Right. Me? What? About you the... pointed at me, right? Yeah. Why? Uh, the you were talking about the how they beat Requiem. Oh right. So how how it works is that Bruno figures out that the way Sol Silver Chariot Requiem works is it's literally the shadow of your soul, and once you destroy that little light source that it's making, then all the full souls go back into their bodies. Yes. So Bruno unzips it and goes back into his body, and blah blah blah, blah and that's how it works. Yeah. And I think you need to start talking about what happened to Bruno during this. So, uh, when, uh, when Tyler gets back downstairs, because I don't know why he went upstairs. Dang. Is it still recording? It is still recording. I don't know why he went upstairs. Okay. All right, continue, Ed. All right. So, uh, as Roland explained, because of Bruno's quick thinking, he managed to undo the soul swap effect of Silver Chariot Requiem, putting everyone back into their proper bodies. But unfortunately, uh, Bruno's proper body died because I think it's. Re I skipped over this, but it's revealed uh, after the. After the sequel auto fight, no, right before the sequel auto fight, that Bruno, while he is walking around and shit, when he died, he did in fact die, and uh, all Jordo did was sort of reanimate his corpse, giving him just a little extra time to get the job done and beat the boss. So, so yeah. when their souls swap, Bruno just becomes a corpse. Yeah, Bruno Bruno's, just becomes. Whose soul inhabits Bruno? Well, Bruno's body becomes a corpse. It properly dies, but Dapio was swapped into that dying body, meaning uh, Dapio died in Bruno's place. 
And like what in the body swap. And then in the anime, at least, there's just like this monologue of Dopio asking for Dio Bolo to come save him. Yeah. While he's in a corpse. While he's in it's a corpse. Fucking it's fucking fucked. It's tragic. Uh, and then, uh, because of his original body being gone, when everyone swaps back to the original body, uh, Bruno instead uh, becomes a spirit and ascends to heaven as he's no longer alive with no body. So Bruno dies, finally dies properly. <clears throat> but because of like Bruno's sacrifice and all that shit, Giorno eventually manages to grab a hold of the Requiem arrow. Yo. And so uh, Giorno uh, goes to pierce himself with the Requiem arrow, and Diavolo uses the epitaph to see the arrow rejecting him in the future. So he goes and just lets him kill himself. So Giorno stabs himself with the Requiem arrow, big burst of light, his stand explodes, right? But it doesn't really explode as, a, as rather like the outer layer, like the outer shell of his stand pops off, revealing the super sexy, sleek, gold experience Requiem right underneath it. So gold experience Requiem, it's what its ability is to return shit to zero, meaning that Diavolo can like time erase and like rearrange a bunch of shit, but then gold experience Requiem would activate and undo all of that because uh, it sees Diavolo's time erase and time skipping as like uh, dishonest and not born of truth. So yeah, this is basically like stop cheating, don't skip parts. <laughs> and get fucking shit on. And as a result, uh, Diavolo is left wide open, and like Giorno channels his inner Dio, strikes the big Dio pose, and then just pummels the shit out of Diavolo so hard. <laughs> uh, so hard that he actually finds himself in a death loop because of the return to zero. Because uh, he dies, and then Gold Experience act. Gold Experience Requiem activates and undoes his death, letting him die again, which undoes his death and die again. So, so Diavolo is trapped in his own personal hell. Forever. 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 In He's infinity. still dying. He is still <laughs> dying. We're on, we're about to go into part nine, and this man is still dying. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Also, fun fact, Araki, this is the only villain that Araki said that he felt the villain truly deserved the death that he got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, I forgot to mention, during the whole body swap, Fandango, Narancho was unfortunately killed by oh, yeah. Bolo. So fort. yeah, rip to the homie. He, got, he, got, he took that little orange boy and just stuck him on the floor. <laughs> Tragic, truly. So yeah, uh, so everyone's standing now. Uh, Diavolo is trapped in time loop hell, and they're wondering like, oh man, what now? So we get a little epilogue, a little flashback to like the events, mere like a mere what day before the actual beginning of the part, I think. Yeah. In which we see the gang, uh, Sans Giorno. It's like uh, Bruno. Abaccio, Narancia, Mista, Fugo, they're on a mission. They're trying to like inter investigating like mysterious murders involving a stand named Rolling Stone. And Rolling Stone, it's like a stand that like it's like intertwined with fate and it like it like finds people who are on the verge of like death and it seeks them out so they can offer them like a peaceful way out instead of facing whatever deaths they have. So uh, while they get, get in range of the stand, it turns into Bruno, and Mista sees this, so he like fights the stand, and like eventually he manages to like shatter it, because it's like just a rock that rolls around. But in shattering it, <coughs> uh, instead of Bruno just dying, it's revealed that Narancia and Abaccio join Bruno as being fated to die later on in the part. And yeah, that's the end of the part, we see we see Giorno, he's sitting in a big throne. He's the boss of Passione now. And there's people kissing his hand and life is good. Uh, the end of part five. They were all tied to fate, but Giorno was the first one to break it with the yeah. power of gold experience right yes. now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. <coughs> Wait, how did he break fate? Because 
I, I was wrong. He didn't break fate. Never mind. <laughs> but he reverted it to zero. And was it like, sounded no. really good. It sounded really good. That's what people say that I hear is like he broke fate. But like everyone who was supposed to die still died. Yeah. Yeah. Just goes to show that you can't break fate in general. Can't can't really, you can't really deviate what you can't break happen. That's a better takeaway yeah. from this. Part six. Uh, part six. Part mm. six. Part six. Stone Ocean. <coughs> Okay, so part six begins, and the part opens with a strange woman alone in a jail cell. This Whoa. woman's freaking out because she was recently caught masturbating by another prison guard. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> Is this still in the genre for like 14 year olds? Yes. Okay. In Japan. I guess they can legally have sex at that point. She's making such a big fuss that the other uh, female inmates are like, Yo, girl, what the fuck are you going on about? It's like, oh my god, he's seen me masturbate. I swear, I'll never masturbate again as long as I live. <laughs> so we find out that this woman is in fact Jolene Cujo, the daughter of Jotaro Cujo. And why is he, she in prison? Well... Jotaro? Jotaro Cujo. Main Why is Jolene Cujo? Jolene Cujo. Jolene Star. Cujo's in prison. Jotaro Cujo's the father, and he's from Stardust Crusaders. Main character from there. Got it. Main Got it. Kill Dio. Yep. <coughs> <coughs> so, why is she in prison? Well, that's that's a cool story. So, we are now in two thousand, the year twenty eleven. And we're in fucking Florida of all places. So you already know shit is about to get weird. <laughs> oh man. So Jolene is in so Jolene Cujo, she's in jail because she's recently been framed for murder. You see, what had happened was she's out riding with her dear boyfriend Romeo when suddenly a man crosses her path and Romeo, distracted by Jolene, hits the man. Instead of like doing the responsible thing and calling the proper medics and shit, uh, Romeo begs Jolene to help him hide the body so he doesn't get in trouble and they can go about their merry way. But like shit backfires. They get caught naturally, but uh, Romeo's rich parents hire a lawyer to sort of like pin everything on Jolene, so Romeo gets off scot free. So yeah, that's why uh, she's in prison. It's pretty fucked up. Oh no! Not the intro I expected. <laughs> Not the intro. So upon me, so uh, fuck, I don't want to do this. Can we just call it quits? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stop, <laughs> dude. Bro, Ed, this is why we rehearse. This is why we rehearse. Don't worry, I'll come back with the next three parts. <laughs> Fully rehearsed. Fully rehearsed. I said I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs>